Dark Ice, a space opera adventure. Book two in the Wild Nine series, written by A.R. Knight. Dedicated to my father. Prologue. The face appeared on the screen and Alyssa kept herself from flinching. Webs of scars played across the visage. Patches of skin colored the false white of cooked meat. That could have been her, or worse. Alyssa forced a smile. It is good to see you happy, the man said. I feared you'd forgotten how. We survived through hope, Baka. I don't think many would follow me if I showed nothing but sorrow. Not that sorrow was hard to find. Their ships were near each other, Baker's frigate and Alyssa's luxury liner, swirling in a dead spot in space where the only distinguishing feature was that there was no distinguishing feature, a far cry from Mars' red hills and domed cities, from those crowded halls where arms raised in defiance against the corporations and their wage slavery. Her sister, Marl, would have been one of those arms. Now she slept forever in Europa's ice. So where will we find hope now? Backer asked. We have no planet, only scattered remnants for forces. No coin left with which to pay the ones who stay with us. They had held a third of Mars, the largest spaceport. The red voice had been respected. Now it was only desperate. Alyssa pressed her eyes shut for a moment. Desperate also meant dangerous. My sister can help us with that last. I'll send along the details. It won't be a short trip, but necessary. And after? With the coin we rebuild, without it. Speaking the words lacerated her. They didn't warrant an end like this, obscured and defeated. The men and women of Mars deserved more than what the corporations deigned to give them. But powerful speeches didn't make fleets, didn't turn the minds of those with their hands on the triggers. Then I will secure the coin. Please, Baka. You saved my life once. I need you again. You have me. At the nod from the burned captain, Alyssa cut the feed, sat back on the soft couch in her cabin, surrounded by the remnants of her luxuries. A pair of pictures still hung on the walls, not the usual projections but actual paintings. Landscapes from Earth, taken when her family first made its leap to the stars with Alyssa barely born. They had been full of hope then, of possibility. She needed that now. Chapter 1 Leaving Ganymede The solar system sprawled out on the glass in front of them. Planets, space stations, and passing comets spiraling around each other. Davin Masters reached out, pressed his finger on the small shape of Ganymede, and traced a line back to Earth. As Davin moved his hand away, the line wavered, shifting as the Whiskey Jumper's computer calculated the time it would take to get there, and the optimal route. You think they'd even let us land? Phyla, her fiery hair pulled into a tight ponytail, said. I know the readings say we're still good for 1G, but I'm not sure. Could get sick too, Davin replied. Bones turn to mush while we're coughing up our lungs. You still want to go? I hear the beaches are incredible. Phyla laughed, shook her head. Davin smiled at himself, but the grin faded as he looked at the line now a solid green tracing an elliptical path from Ganymede to Earth. It would only take a few weeks, doable with the jumper's engines, but everything cost coin, and there wasn't any waiting for them there, especially for people still wanted for murder. It's nice, hearing you laugh. Haven't heard that lately. He hadn't commented on Phyla touching her right side after laughing. A tender acknowledgement of laser burns still painful after Marl shot her on Europa shot trying to clear their own names. And the one left who could do that was holding them hostage. Davin had more than a few choice insults ready the next time he saw Bosser, and the punchline would be the business end of his sidearm. You haven't been funny, Phyla said, the smile dying on her lips. Not that anyone could be. Davin reached back out to the glass, swiped away the path to Earth, and drew another. This time farther away from the sun, out past the large rings of Saturn, past Uranus, to the frozen edge of humanity's expansion, Neptune. The icons showing space stations all but disappeared past Saturn, with only two outposts sitting on Uranus for mining. Neptune itself was beyond the profitable reach of most corporations, a time sink full of risk due to the planet's high winds and isolation. Guessing the beaches won't be quite as inviting out there. You think they're ready? Don't have a choice. It's leave tomorrow, or he'll send more androids after us. 
The captain stood up from the co-pilot's chair. And after this, are we going to do whatever Bosser says forever? If Bosser pays us what he's offering, Davin said, putting a hand on Phyla's shoulder. The rest of you can go. Set yourselves up however you want. And you? He killed Lena, was all Davin said, was all he needed to say. Chapter 2 Viola Returns You realize you nearly die every time you leave, right? Puck spoke as it buzzed around Viola's head, stuffed deep inside her bedroom closet. A suitcase, designed for weeks of travel and covered in Galaxy Forge logos, sat spread on the bed. The luggage vacuum-sealed sections to force out all the air and allow for maximum space. But I die inside every day I'm here doing nothing. A sweater muffled Viola's reply. That's an exaggeration. Your vitals are actually much more stable here than with the Wild Nines. That's not what I meant, Viola said, pulling out of the closet with a clutch of clothes in her arms. A knock came at the door. Three sharp taps, the signature entry Viola's father used ever since a much younger, half-asleep Viola thought he was intruding, and launched a lamp at his face as her dad came through the door. Her father had fought aging to a stalemate, achieving a plastic-like, forty-year-old face through patchwork treatments. Her mother, and most anyone with the coin, looked the same once they were old enough that their lives were at risk. There was no clearer mark of status. Viola turned away from her father's stare, focused on folding her clothes. He wasn't going to like her decision, and she didn't want to see the disappointment on his face. So you're going, her dad said. It wasn't a question. Puck heard the tone and quietly floated to its charging cradle. Some conversations didn't need a sarcastic bot's input. Did you ever really think I'd stay? I hoped. The words carried an edge on them, a tint of self-awareness. I remember what it's like being young, no matter what your mother says. But there's a difference between seeing the solar system and doing it in the company of wanted criminals. Did they even say you could join? I haven't asked them yet. I don't know why Davin would say no. Have you thought about how all of them, and I know, because I've run checks on their names. You did what? They're dangerous. It's one thing when they're dropping you off, another when you're going with them. Her dad said this as though he was explaining simple math to her, that digging into the history of the Wild Nines without Violas, without their consent, was perfectly logical. You know what I found? That they're a bunch of evil, terrible people who will only get me killed. Viola walked over to her suitcase and dropped clothes inside, shuffling them into their proper positions. Easier to hide the anger in her eyes with her back turned. No, that they're trained, Viola, that they have experience. Most of them were military. What are you doing on that ship besides getting in the way? He meant well. Viola knew her dad was just trying to convince her to stay, that he wasn't trying to say she was useless. But all Viola could focus on was the idea that she wasn't good enough, not worth a spot on the jumper. Maybe that's all I'm doing, Viola said slowly, feeling her way through the reply. Maybe I won't last long. I'll get hurt or scared and run. But if I stay here, I'll always wonder. Always regret not even trying. So yeah, I'm going. As she spoke, Viola looked up from the suitcase and stared straight at her father. Not a flinch in her face, not a touch of blush. When she'd run from Ganymede before, Viola had done it facing no one, without having to defend her choice. Saying the reasons gave them new life, and Viola stood straighter, matched her father's look. Her father took the words in and nodded. Then before Viola could react, he stepped forward and wrapped her in a tight hug. We love you, Viola. Just come back to us. Davin and his group are lucky to have you. Sure, now you say it. Viola murmured, but her voice had no edge left. An hour later, the suitcase rolling along under its own power behind her, Viola walked into the bay dominated by the modular bulk of the whiskey jumper. 
The big ship wasn't real aerodynamic, built by attaching different components, like crew bays, the cockpit, and a secondary cargo hold with a medical unit onto the large central cube. In the zero gravity of space, though, that didn't matter. A ramp extended from the central cargo module, and disappearing up it was the thick, metal-laced legs of Mox. The man, a gigantic ball of muscle, wore an exoskeleton at all times. It gave him more strength, speed, and the choice to wear a laser cannon that spat fire too fast for Viola's eyes to see. Next to Mox, what was Viola going to do here? How could she even compare? Hey. Trina's bright voice came from near the back of the ship, her leaf-green hair poking itself out from behind the engines. Look who showed up. Come back here. Viola looked around, but there wasn't anyone else standing there in the bay, so she walked around the ship to the back, where Trina stood on her tiptoes looking into one of the four, two right and two left, large circular nodules that directed the jumper's thrust. You're taller than me. Can you take a look in here? Tell me what you see. Viola nodded, moved to where Trina was standing, and looked into the deep dark of the nodule. The jumper generated its thrust through ionized gas expelled out through the nodules, which meant small pipes pushed the compressed gas to the open nozzle. Allowed to expand, the gas pushed the ship forward. If the jumper needed more power, a mechanic in the engine room could ignite the gas through a small switch capable of igniting extra tanks, burning the fuel quickly for an extra jolt. Viola's eyes went right to that switch, mostly because sparks were popping off of it like the world's tiniest fireworks show. It's the sparker, Viola said. I think you can fix it? I think so, yeah. Then show me. This ship could use a backup mechanic. The next 20 minutes had Trina tossing one tool after another to Viola, while Puck hovered nearby projecting a bright light on the nodule. For the first time that day, Viola could immerse herself in pure problem-solving. A twist here to unlock the access to the circuit. A pull with the pliers to separate the wires that had tangled themselves, thus keeping the circuit complete and sparks triggering away. It wasn't hard, but when the flits of light stopped popping in her face, Viola couldn't stop herself from grinning. You two figure that thing out yet? Davin's voice came from behind. Well, I don't think your ship's going to blow up anymore. I would also add that you will now have some redundancy in keeping the jumper repaired. Great, because it's time to go. Davin said as Viola put the sparker back together. Viola, I had Mox put your stuff in the open cabin. Used to be Cadges, so I'm sorry for anything weird you find in there. Her suitcase was already on board? Not even a discussion? Viola turned to ask why, but Davin was already walking back to the front of the ship, Trina following. Guess you're in. Guess so. Chapter 3 The Doctor Ion burns scarred, black, and jagged spider-webbing slashes hard to coat precisely with ointment. Eric wrapped a bandage around the worker's thigh, the unlucky victim of a misfired engine test. A yellowed synthetic goo seeped out from beneath the wrap, but soaked its way into the worker's skin. Moisturize and numb while nanobots in the mix repaired the worker's nerves. It won't ever go away completely, unless you chop it off and get a new one. The worker looked confused. I mean the leg. Amputate it. Eric tried. Amputate? The worker's voice jumped an octave. I'm losing my leg. No, that's not what I said. Eric sighed and let his hand hover over the spots where the goo leaked out. The air was markedly cooler above, a sign the goo was doing its job. Pull energy, heat, out of the air around it, and use that same energy to repair broken cells, knit skin back together, make scars disappear. But you... You'll be fine. Don't put weight on it for the rest of the day. You'll be back at work tomorrow. Not even a day off, you sure? The worker glanced at the bandage, mouth twisting into a frown. It hurt pretty bad. I'm sure it did. Now off you go. Eric replied, opening the room's door. The worker, limping, left. A look up at the waiting room camera showed plenty more with similar issues. A massive complex full of people playing with dangerous chemicals and machines will do that. Still, it was better than sitting on the jumper, bored and watching the hours crawl. 
A knock, then the door opened. A woman walked in, hair a bright shade of green, grass on a sunny morning. A sunny morning. Where did that come from? It had been decades since he'd seen one of those. A real dawn over a real meadow. Too long. Eric? Trina asked. Hmm. Eric said, still holding on to that perfect morning. What are you doing? Saving the sick and the wounded. Eric blinked himself back to the present. Yourself? Telling you to get back to the ship. Davin says you're not answering the comm. I don't keep it in the room with me. It's distracting. From what? My assessment pegs those patients out there as minor, not a test of skill for you. Consider it courtesy, then. I've seen the logs, Eric. Trina tilted her head and stared at him. Your comm volume on the jumper barely registers. One, maybe two transmissions a day. The rest of us triple that or more. Spying on an old man, Trina. Just looking for irregularities. I can't help it. I have my reasons. Guess I prefer face-to-face -face instead of those pings. Because those pings carried waves of happiness, guilt, and lost moments all rolled into one. Beamed out from Earth, warm and friendly reminders of the lives he was missing. Daughter, son, grandchildren spinning through birthdays and weddings and births while Eric was out here, gelling workers back together. It's hard to explain, Eric continued. People say that, but it's inaccurate. What they really mean is that they don't want to talk about it. It's more polite. See, you take a machine, like this one here. Trina moved over to a vitals, called such because if you stood near one and turned it on, it focused its sensors on you for a few seconds and gave a full readout on your breathing, blood pressure, and heartbeat. If it's acting funny, I can take it apart. Find out what's broken inside or where the code is going wrong. You do the same with people, right? More or less. Isn't the brain just another collection of parts? Trina looked at Eric. Parts that act contrary to their design, in my experience. I'm saying that if you look for the problem rather than ignoring it, you might find the answer. Trina flashed a grin then and nodded towards the screen showing the waiting workers. Also, I stand by what I said before. These are easy patients. Your presence here is unnecessary. Eric opened his mouth to reply. Trina was right. Decent pay, but these weren't real patients. Following their protocol for every minor accident, a medical review and clearance to head back to work. I'm curious because these injuries are well within the range of most common medical bots. Trina continued. It's broken. That's why they asked if I could moonlight while they waited for parts. Ah. Trina nodded. It's not anymore. I fixed it. You fixed it. Yes. Do you want the short version? I do. Eric kneaded his temples. They shipped parts from Minor Prime, parts they could make right here instead of waiting. Easy to reconfigure the power coupling from a light transport shuttle to work in a bot. Trina struggled with the words, resisting diving into the specifics. It took 20 minutes. It seems you've rescued me, Trina. You can thank me later. Trina glanced at her calm. This took longer than I expected. We're late. Then I suppose we'd better be going. Did Davin say where this time? Neptune. Fascinating. Eric turned over Trina's comments. Look at the problem. Fix the problem. Everything with her a series of logic chains leading inevitably to the correct solution. What would that be for him? To go back to Earth? Sit in the shade on a bright day and watch younger generations of himself laugh and jump and play? The tube train that took the pair of them back towards the jumper's assigned docking bay shot along Ganymede's surface. Looking up through the transparent ceiling, Eric could see the angry tan and red swirls of Jupiter's storms, twisting and churning. Spacecraft cut lines in the view, coming and going from the moon with parts and people from throughout the solar system. It was a wondrous view. Amazing. It wasn't enough. Chapter 4. Precise Shot. I feel like we deserve a going-away drink, don't you? Merck said, sitting across from Opal, in one of the many happy hour bars neighboring the Galaxy Forge facilities on Ganymede. Clogged with the variety of engineers, mechanics, and test pilots Galaxy Forge employed, the bar buzzed with acronyms and industry slang that made for a nice, unintelligible backdrop. It reminded Opal of the barracks, of the camaraderie and shared adventure. 
Merck leaned back in his chair, arms spread over the rests, and gave Opal a toothy grin. His eyes crinkled at the edges. Opal's pulse quickened. Hated that look. Loved that look. Ever since Minor Prime, the stick jockey had been throwing her slick smiles paired with soft asides. Constant risk of death catalyzed their close conversation to something else entirely. Before she knew it, Opal cared about the guy. And here he was, joking about going back into the same fire that had nearly killed him last time. It's still a game to you, isn't it? Opal replied, leaning forward, elbows on the table. Merck's smile broke. You see this? Merck pulled up his shirt, showing off the circular scar on his chest from getting shot on Europa. That's my reminder that it's very real. The visual brought back that day, carrying Merck back to the ship. It had been his breathing that was the worst. The ragged inhales, the coughing exhales, eyes closed, fighting for his life through instinct. I've never been hit. Snipers, we stay out of it. Don't change now. Telling you, it isn't worth it. I know I've seen. Opal looked at her hands. Her fingers twisted through each other. I don't want to see it again, especially not you. Hey, I took that hit coming to save you, so you know, stay out of trouble and I'll be good. Opal felt blood rushing to her face, heat rising from her throat. He was treating this whole thing like a joke. Merc, who'd flown in what was really just an ornamental military roll around Earth, acting like there wasn't a price to pay in a life like this. He'd never tasted the red grit of Mars as a sandstorm rolled over you in the middle of a firefight. Never watched friends fail to come home, stared at the empty seat on the transport, and known if they'd turned left instead of right, there'd still be a person there. Breathe. Merck noticed. Opal's pressed lips, so tight they were squeezing the blood out of them, were a clue. The fighter pilot reached out, put his hand on Opal's. She looked at it, his calloused hand rough from gripping flight sticks, so were hers only from rifles instead. You really afraid something's gonna happen? Merck asked, the light laughter gone from his voice. Just don't die on me. I'll be careful, promise. Better keep that one. Opal offered a small smile. And I've changed my mind about that drink. Now you're talking. Merck said, keying in the order. Chapter 5. Boxer. The ring changed as the crowd moved, their pumping fists and shouting faces forming the walls around Mox and the three off-duty security guards who'd decided to take him on tonight. The Jupiter's bastard had cured Mox's boredom by accepting the metal man into the bar's routine, sloppy fights. Most nights, Mox could count on a crew of Galaxy Forge workers looking for something that wasn't in their corporate policy manual, a bit of betting, a bit of blood, and a lot of visceral excitement. The bar was a lit firework, bright points of color scattered between vast shadows. Except for the ring, where the DJ kept a floating bot covered in lights hovering over the action while swapping frenetic mixes. The first guard, one, came at Mox straight up, leaning forward and stepping into a big right hook that even the drunks in the audience could see coming. Mox sidestepped to his right, dodging the punch and letting its momentum carry one in between the second guard, two, which left three on Mox's side. Hey, Mox said, catching three's feeble left-handed jab with his own, then whipping the man to the ground where he collapsed. The crowd cheered, a few boos mingled in. The bastard's bookies shouted new odds. Mox waited for, felt the kick hit the back of his knee. The first guard yelped, and Mox turned around to find the man limping backward. They always forgot about the exoskeleton. Shin on, hard, ridged metal wasn't a good move. Two moved up, dropping into a stance Mox didn't recognize. Legs bent, arms at right angles. What are you doing? Mox asked. You're about to find out, Two said. Two moved forward and down simultaneously. Those right angles turned into a series of horizontal jabs, pinging Mox's stomach, kidneys, ribs, strong hits too. Mox backpedaled away, raising his arms to block any follow-up. The crowd cheered again, no idea who they were rooting for now. Two didn't press the attack, but settled into a determined frown. Perhaps this one, unlike the others, knew what he was doing. Not that it would change anything. Mox pumped his legs, jumping into the air. The DJ swerved the light bot away as Mox arced two meters high, 
and came slamming back, fist first at two. The man rolled. Mox's fist met air, but the suit compensated for two's move, stopped Mox's momentum faster than any person should have been able to. So when two tried to capitalize, tried to hit Mox with a high kick to the face, the big man already had his arm up to block. Two's leg bounced off of Mox's left hand, which left the guard open for Mox's right to indent Two's abdomen. He crumpled to the floor, groaning. One, favoring his leg, stared at Mox from the side of the ring and shook his head. Yield? Mox said. You're a cheater, one said. That's what you are. Three on one, more than fair. The crowd was losing interest, since the match was over. Coin changed hands and the ring fell apart. You act all smug just because you got that medal, one continued. Take that away. You're nothing. Mox walked over to one who stood his ground and looked up at Mox, a mix of fear and defiance in his face, a look Mox figured he once wore himself before the surgeries when he was vulnerable. Never again. Yield. One's face softened, the anger defeated by the universal desire not to get crunched to pieces. Mox had seen that look before, too, on this guard and all the others before him. One thing to talk big, another to back it up. Mox! Came a voice from the crowd. Davins! What the hell are you doing? Yield! Mox repeated, ignoring the captain. Fine, you freak. I yield. One sighed, limping over to his downed partner. The remaining crowd immediately dispersed to collect or give up their bets. Davin pushed his way through, looked at the pair of injured men, then at Mox, who nodded. You hurt? Davin said, and at Mox's raised eyebrows, held up his hands. Only asking because we're getting off this rock, and I prefer my crew in one piece. Where? Oh, you're going to love this one. Neptune. Never been? Mox said, as one of the bastard's barmen came over with a coin chit. Davin looked at the value as Mox took it from the barman's hand and whistled. Feel like you'd make more doing this than flying with me. Not as fun, Mox replied as the pair walked out of the bar. And you wouldn't have me around to keep things interesting. Mox laughed. Hey. Mox recognized one's voice and turned. You ever ditch that skeleton, become a real man, you come back and we'll see who wins. Buddy. Davin cut in before Mox could say anything. My man Mox here would toast you even if he were naked, drunk, and missing a leg, trust me. Why's he got the suit, then, if he's so good? Because it's cool. Only, that wasn't it. Mox stayed quiet all the way back to the jumper, stayed quiet as the engines ignited, Trina counting to Phyla when they could lift off. Stayed quiet and watched from the screen in the kitchen as Ganymede fell away and Jupiter, giant of the solar system, shrank to show the stars. Chapter 6 Neptune. Contrasted with space's absolute black, the Neptune's big blue ball looked like an aqua sun. Davin, rubbing his eyes at the odd hour when the jumper's proximity alarm woke him, stared out the cockpit at the distant orb. Distant being relative. Neptune appeared to be within arm's reach, outside the glass. Still thousands, millions of kilometers away. But hey, at least they'd made it to the right neighborhood. Where is it? Davin said, glancing at the blank sensor screen. Neptune's faint rings were appearing on it, motes of dust and ice swirling around. Nothing man-made on the scanners. Just about here, if their flight plan is correct, Phyla said. Based on when they arrived and their targeted orbiting speed, they should come into range in a minute. Bosser had transmitted the details of the operation. An Eden freighter, Amerigo, was out floating around Neptune, while a research and mining vessel, Carrot, plumbed Neptune's depth in search of rare gemstones, an ice diamond. Bosser's info was light on what ice diamonds were, only saying they were valuable, and that Eden had reason to suspect someone might try to take the cargo by force. At least there's nobody else here, Davin said, waiting for the freighter to show. Did you read Bosser's last paragraph? Get the diamonds first, the crew and freighter second. Yeah, I read it. Are you really surprised? For once, I'd like to work for someone that has a heart. Hey, don't you technically work for me? Davin asked, glancing at Phyla, an injured expression on his face. Like I said. The console beeped, and on the edge of it, 
a green rectangle popped up. A second later, as the freighter's identification broadcast came in, Amerigo appeared over the shape. It was orbiting high around Neptune. This far from the sun, solar panels gathered a small fraction of their normal energy, so the freighter would have found a holding pattern that minimized power use until the carrot finished its mission. The Amerigo itself wasn't the largest freighter Davin had seen, but it wasn't a tiny thing either. A kilometer long, with most of that space kept available for cargo, Eden built the freighter for minimal crew and maximum profit. The Amerigo was white, a frigid pallor that made it stand out against Neptune's deep blue backdrop, a spear thrown through the night sky. Big ship for small gemstones. They must think they'll get a huge haul. Bosser said the carrot was full of new tech. Guess they're hoping it pays off. Set course to intercept, and let's start talking. You want to call? The button's right there. Davin flicked his finger on the console, dragging the small icon of a phone, something that nobody still had but everyone still understood, over to the Amerigo rectangle. The signal shot over to the freighter. Someone on the bridge was probably panicking at the call light glowing, seeing as they were on the edge of human space. Saturn and its moons held the farthest real settlements, so this was way out there. And compared with the asteroid belt, Neptune wasn't overflowing with raw materials. Not that atmospheric gases weren't valuable fuel, but why go out here when Jupiter could keep humanity supplied for, well, ever? Jumper, the Amerigo reads you, said a tight-clipped voice cluttered with static. We heard you were coming our way. Took a while, sorry. You didn't exactly choose next door. You're not the only one wishing we were closer to home. Why's that? We'll talk when you dock. Hard to tell who's listening out here. The console beeped as a docking route came in from the freighter, a translucent line arcing away from the jumper towards Neptune. It would intersect in a few hours with the freighter, the jumper slotting into the Amerigo's main bay without Phyla even having to touch the controls. Aren't they a little paranoid? Phyla said after the freighter cut communications a moment later. Who else is going to be listening? How that guy sounded, it's like they already know. Davin sat back in the soft leather chair, looked out at the deep blue planet, and waited for everything to fall apart. Chapter 7. Hot Shot The viper looked spicy. Viola pulled herself away from the wingtip she'd been detailing, with Trina declaring they'd both go insane without work during the long trip to Neptune. It had been one day of dismantling after another. Until they looked up, and realized the jumper was nearly there, and then it was all about putting the jumper's guts back where they belonged. The viper was the last piece. The small fighter a nest of wings, laser cannons, and engines. The solo cockpit occupied at the moment by its pilot, Merck, running pre-flight checks. Davin had called a moment ago, said they were closing on the freighter and wanted the viper ready, insurance in case something turned nasty. So Viola carried in the last few pieces of plating, Opal manned the batteries, and Merck ran system checks to find the greens. Watching those two during the weeks of travel out here, the stick jockey and the sniper never failed to make Viola laugh. Merck ran his mouth, spilling one ridiculous story after another over meals of powdered goo, while Opal sat there shaking her head, ready to jump in with the real events. Viola stayed quiet at those dinners stayed quiet most of the time. What was she going to contribute to the stories, the relived memories of firefights and frantic flights, an anecdote about a frustrating project, an unfair professor, or one of the endless visits to another corner of her father's factories? Docking procedures initiated. Phyla's voice came over the jumper's intercom. Hope you're ready to make some new friends. Come on, Opal said to Viola. He'll tell us if there's anything wrong with the fighter. We have to make sure our new friends aren't the opposite. What? Viola asked as she followed Opal back through to the crew quarters. You used a rifle back on Europa, right? Technically, yes. I don't think I hit anything, though. Doesn't matter. Just look dangerous. Opal ducked into her room, popped open the large floor-to-ceiling two-meter locker that hugged the far wall, and handed a stocky weapon to Viola. It had a bulbous top that ran to a nozzle, with long handles at the back and front, a trigger right near her rear finger. 
picked that one up while we were on Ganymede. Your dad's company makes some weird weapons. They don't make weapons, Viola said. Because Galaxy Forge was a mining company, a materials provider. No way were they in the military business. Sure they don't, Opal said, soaking the words with so much sarcasm that Viola flinched. This one was originally for mining work, to clean off crumbly rock. But you shorten the barrel like this, make the mixing chambers compressed so the reaction is quicker. You've got something deadly that'll go right through energy shields. Viola heard what Opal was saying. Galaxy Forge adapted its technology to whatever profitable ends it could. Viola should have felt angry, frustrated that the noble company her family ran had a stained side. Instead, she gripped the weapon. Reality had been breaking so many of her convictions, one more barely tasted bitter. Whatever you do, don't point that thing at me, Puck said as Viola, back in her room, put on a less dirty set of clothes. Something that wasn't so covered in the vipers' oils and grime. I could use target practice. You might get some. What does that mean? I've been scanning the radio frequencies. Standard Eden protocols for a mission like this suggest the two ships should be in constant communication, updating each other on progress, plans and so on. Since we've been in system, there hasn't been a peep. Radio silence. Maybe it's direct, tight beam. But why? There's nobody else here. Sending a direct communication means hitting the ship directly. Much easier to blast it out on a standard channel. It's what they're for. You and your logic, Viola said. But the bot had a point. Keep listening and let me know if you hear anything. You got it, Viola. In the jumper's main hold, Viola and Opal joined Davin and Mox around the ramp. Trina and Eric were manning the jumper's twin turrets in case the whole thing turned out to be an ambush. Merc in the Viper, ready to flip itself around and blow a path through the Amerigo from the inside out. When the jumper settled into the freighter's docking bay, part of Viola almost hoped for an angry greeting just so she could see what would happen. Davin glanced at her then, as though he could hear her thoughts, and Viola felt herself blush. Just let me do the talking, Davin said to her. Yep, Viola said, lowering her eyes. Damn it, here she was trying to keep cool, be a professional, and she goes with, yep. The ramp lowered quickly, a pop as the plating disengaged and then a steady hiss as gas propelled the ramp downward. Davin was the first one on it, holding his hand for everyone else to stay back. Your captain has a death wish, doesn't he? Puck said, hovering behind Viola. You've got Mock standing right there. Guy could take a dozen shots without getting hurt, and you don't let him go first. Shut it. Then Davin was waving them forward. Viola took third, Opal shifting with her long and thin sniper to aim past them. She needn't have bothered. The only people in the bay were a few haggard crew and one wearing the cream-colored uniform of the ship's captain. None of them armed. The captain, a man whose cratered face told tale after tale of trouble, watched the nines walk the ramp in silence. Davin Masters, Davin said, extending his hand. We're the wild nines. What can we do for you? Captain Gage Marcosi, the older man said, grasping Davin's offered palm. And you can get my ship back. Chapter 8. Picking the Crew The carrot blurred in the middle of a storm of blue static. They gathered in the Amerigo's sole meeting space, a square room dominated by a central table and a wall-conquering screen. Traces of food, the same powdery stuff they had on the jumper, said the room served as the cafeteria in more crowded times. The Nine's crew, their weapons on the table in front or holstered at their sides, and the freighter's captain were sitting, staring at the carrot. We can't get a better picture. The winds are too strong, and she's been sitting in that storm ever since, Gage said. Ever since? Phyla asked. We sent her down, made it to the objective, reports were solid. Ice diamonds were getting captured until she got quiet. Then that storm moved in and the carrot released its tether. The last few days it's just been blowing along with the wind. Sounds like a rough ride, Merck said. How come it hasn't broken up? Opal asked. Design. The carrot's a miracle. It can take those thousand kilometer an hour winds and let them glide right around it. Partly why Eden's going through all the trouble with you. A normal ship that size wouldn't be worth trying to save in this situation, but the carrot's something special. 
What situation is? Davin said. You notice there's nobody else in this room besides your crew and I? Davin hadn't, but looking around, he saw the doors were shut. The only people his own. I can't trust them, the captain continued, because some of them took the carrot, and I don't know who here, if anyone, is still with us. There was a second of silence as this sunk in, followed by a series of rapid weapon checks. Davin understood now why the captain hadn't asked them to leave their guns on the jumper. They could be ambushed at any moment, which meant... Eric, Trina, you read? Davin spoke into his comm. Here. The physician's voice came through clear. Seal the ship. Not everyone around here is a friend. They're not necessarily enemies either. But until we know who is what, I don't want anyone thinking they've got free access to the jumper. Just when I was going for a walk? Not this time. Davin cut the call. Captain. Fiola asked. Are you sure this room is safe? You mean, is someone listening to us? Gage leaned back in his chair and looked towards the ceiling. If the enemy cared enough, perhaps. You're sitting on a cargo freighter, miss. There's little need for surveillance here, so they would have had to install devices on their own. Take no chances, Mock said. But I will ask that you take one. We need the carrot back, and we have to do it fast. If someone here tells that ship you're on your way, the carrot can and will run. What's your plan? So far, all I've heard is that you couldn't keep your own crew from turning traitor, and now we're caught up in it. You're being paid to get Eden out of this mess. Gage gave Merck a level stare. We have a utility shuttle on board, meant to get crew to and from the carrot. You'll use that to go to Neptune, land on the carrot, and take her back. I thought you said those winds were over a thousand kilometers an hour down there. There's no way a standard shuttle can handle that. The winds flow in bands. A good pilot can get around them. I assume one of you is capable enough? We can handle it. How many can we take? Gage pressed a button on his comm, and the feed on the screen changed to a crisp, clear image of the wedge-shaped shuttle. It'll only hold five people, four if any of them are you. The captain turned to Mox as he spoke. So we're splitting up. One team goes on a rescue mission. The rest stay here and play guess the traitor. Gage nodded. He wasn't trying to hide the situation. Davin had to give him that much. Mox, Phyla, Opal, and I will go to Neptune. I can't. Phyla cut in. What? Who's going to pilot the shuttle? Who's going to pilot the jumper? Merc has to stay, too. The carrot's been sitting in that windstorm. Why aren't they running? Because they have to have help coming. We'll have to deal with that. I can fly it. The shuttle, I mean. I've flown my dad's ships before. The kid's got talent. We've tangoed in The Sims. Davin looked at Viola, trying to get a measure. He knew she was barely in her 20s, barely used to space, and now he would trust her to fly them into Neptune's raging storms. You think you're ready for this? Because now's your chance. You can't say no down there when we're depending on you. Could call that cruel, putting the spotlight on Viola but better to test her mettle now, up here, than find out she wasn't ready when things went sideways. I'm ready, Viola said, matching Davin's look with a straight stare of her own. Fine. Davin nodded. Mox, Viola, Opal, and I are going down. The rest of you try to get this freighter as laser-proof as it can be. As they walked back to the jumper to gear up, Davin didn't hear any grumbling. No talk about how scared anyone was, how dangerous it would be. How he'd lucked into a crew like this, Davin didn't know, but he sure as hell was grateful. Chapter 9. Split Back on the jumper, Davin threw on his gear. A pair of holstered sidearms ready to spit stunning or deadly lasers as the situation demanded. A beat-up thick gray jacket to take the sting out of return fire. Pants with loops and pockets to hold the variety of tools and first aid Davin carried whenever he went on a ground mission. And Melody a fireball shotgun, designed to launch orbs of heat to immolate targets. All the weapons on the jumper relied on energy, plasma, fire, the things that could be absorbed by the ship's walls without blowing a hole through to space on a missed shot. Too many stories of idiots with bullets blasting their way to vacuum. Looking loaded, Phyla said as Davin's door opened. Ever knock? Davin said to Phyla who came in and leaned against the wall, watching him. 
With you, never. You think this is a good idea? You talking about my outfit or the mission? Either, really. But Phyla wasn't smiling. No, I don't want to split the team, but I don't see a way around it. Last time we were in this spot, about to invade Europa, I tried to talk you out of running. But that was for us, to clear our names. This is just a job. A good paying one, which we could use. I'm just saying that if you pull us apart and everything goes to hell, then I won't be able to help you. You're saying I'm the one that'll need help? Yes. Davin noticed both of them were standing in the center of the small quarters. Which, wow, did this room ever feel tiny. As though the both of them took up the entire space. Everywhere he looked, Phyla was there. He could hear her breathing and his heart pulsed. Davin blinked. Pull yourself together, man. Look, it won't be long. We'll be back and heading home before you know it. Where is home to you? Phyla said, and when Davin didn't answer right away, continued. Because to me it's here on this ship, with Mox and Trina and Merc, Opal, Eric, Viola, and you. Then don't let anything happen to it while I'm gone. Phyla reached out, grabbed Davin's forearm. I'm not kidding. I don't want to lose this for some stupid coin. Me either. Davin replied, his tongue feeling heavy in his mouth, like forming words in water. Phyla's hand on his arm a light touch, with tenderness lacking from all the times they'd hauled each other out of harm's way. Davin glanced at that hand, tight from weeks in the dry confines of space, but strong. Keep her safe. Keep them safe. Phyla took a breath, nodded, and pulled her hand away. With her touch fading, Davin felt the atmosphere changing, the pressure receding, and suddenly he was looking at Phyla's half-cocked smile. I already told Mox he'd better get you all back alive, and he promised. Well, now I feel better. Don't make it hard for him to keep it, Phyla said, turning and walking out the door. Davin watched the space where she stood, then shook his head. The last thing he needed right now, before he sped into the depths of the blue planet, was emotion cluttering his mind. Turning to the bed, he picked up Melody, threw the strap over his shoulder, and left. The door hid his room with a hiss and click. Davin wondered if he'd ever see it again. Chapter 10. Descent. The shuttle was an oval with wings that could fold out from the top. Viola stopped, bumped by Davin walking behind. She recognized the shuttle's model, an older Galaxy Forge variant. Knocked out of production when liquid fuels were phased out, explosive tendencies not being ideal for space travel. Flying this would be a walk back through time to when she was a kid watching bright pillars of flame roar across the sky as ships blasted off of Ganymede. Now there weren't loud explosions, no plumes of smoke and flame, just the silent, massive thrust of electricity. It sat in a secondary bay so cluttered with supplies, tubes going to and from fuel tanks, and crates with labels like food. Last, indicating when it should be eaten, that Viola watched her feet for fear of tripping. Gage, claiming to passing crew he was seeing the nines off in person, led the group through the mess to the shuttle. As they stepped in front of it, the captain tapped a code into a small panel on the side of the shuttle, and a door opened next to it, shooting up and allowing a set of stairs to flop to the bay floor. I'm guessing Eden's budget doesn't go to their shuttles, Davin said. I've kept her intentionally. She's reliable. Well made, Gage replied. Time the winds and you'll do fine. Easy for you to say up here, Opal chimed in. The sniper had been throwing hard stares at everyone after Davin called the split. Viola kept expecting Opal to talk it out, to argue, but she never did. Viola knew Opal had been military. Maybe she was used to orders she didn't like. As Davin said before, this is only a contract. You don't have to go. But if you don't, any loyal crew members down there will die. And when they come for the Amerigo, we will likely die as well. Not helping? Mox grumbled. It's not our fault you can't trust your crew. But we're going. Viola, get in there and see if you can fly this thing. With Puck buzzing behind her, Viola climbed up the stairs and into the cramped shuttle. The inside was spare, a functional blandness. Every corner marked with a sign showing its purpose and the nearest possible exit, of which there were four. 
Two of those, however, involved popping off sections of the front and rear, ruining the craft. The third was a small portal out of the roof that was likewise unusable, while the shuttle's wings were extended. Arrayed around the interior, hanging behind four fixed chairs and a table that could be a bed for medical procedures, were slim suits for spacewalks or zero-G escapes. Cozy. Puck buzzed. Makes the jumper look like luxury, Viola replied. To the right was the cockpit. The left held a small passage to the engines for maintenance. There were two seats, padded in black and sturdy, filling the cockpit. The screen was a far fling from the jumper's consoles and projection-based cockpit glass. The shuttle had a single monitor in a three-section terminal, otherwise covered in a forest of analog switches and dials. Viola hadn't ever seen a setup this outdated. Everything she'd been in used context-based screens to show the controls that mattered in the moment. On newer ships, only in manual override would the screens slide up and the ugly innards become usable. This looks like it'll be a challenge, Viola muttered. But you can fly it, Davin said from behind her, looking past her at the array. Technically, I think so, Viola said, settling into the pilot's chair and gazing over the controls. So long as we don't try to do anything too fancy. That's the idea, Davin said. Then he stepped out to help Mox and Opal load. Feel like that's never how it goes with this group. Maybe this one time we'll catch a break. Another ten minutes of frantic learning passed, while the other nines fueled the shuttle, loaded their gear, and opened the bay door. A few of the Amerigo's crew made an appearance, moving through the bay and shifting cargo out of the way. Wouldn't be a good thing if the shuttle's engines ignited something on the way out. Viola dialed up the flight computer and zeroed in on the carrot. The Amerigo's more powerful sensors fed data into the shuttle's computer, so it wasn't hard to see where the carrot was and where it would be. Assuming the carrot didn't try to run, they should be able to find an intercept course that would... But those winds. Neptune wasn't resting easy right now. If the Amerigo's weather data was correct, several huge storms were swirling around the carrot. Winds in the hundreds and hundreds of kilometers per hour. Take this flimsy shuttle into any of them and it would spin around and fly apart. Viola looked closer at the directions of the storms. They formed a lopsided triangle, with the carrot stuck on the inner edge of the leading storm. Only that leading one was moving fast, and the storm behind it was drifting. There was a window forming. The console projected the opening would last a few hours. Enough time to dock, take back the carrot, and blast out of there. We have a shot. Viola announced over the shuttle's comm. But we have to leave now. Then let's go, Davin replied, squeezing into the cockpit's second chair. Opal and Mox are ready, and I'd rather not give any lingering traitors a chance to mess with our trip. Okay, hold on, Viola said, punching the ignition sequence. The shuttle jerked as its small landing jets shot to life, lifting the oval craft a meter up. Viola gripped the flight stick, not a sturdy, dual-handed grip, but a single shaft like the ones in fighters. A gentle push to the left, and the shuttle turned in the bay, spinning around until the open doors and the blue vastness of Neptune sat in front. With her left hand, Viola pushed up on the sliding bar that controlled the throttle. The main engines crackled to life, but at such low power that Viola hoped any remaining crew weren't torched. The shuttle eased its way forward, past the junk, under the bay doors, and then out free of the freighter and floating through space. Immediately, as they left the freighter's artificial gravity, Viola's stomach performed flip-flops. The shuttle maintained the smallest amount of stabilization, enough to keep Viola from floating away if she had to walk around. But so light, it still felt like she could flutter away with the slightest breeze. The monitor beeped at her, stating that Viola had to correct her course or she'd miss the intercept. Stay focused, kid. I know it's pretty but we can appreciate the view on the way home. Sorry. No apologies. Let's just get it done. Viola set herself. Davin was right. This wasn't a simulator. Wasn't the landing on Europa when the autopilot and the android 4-9 handled most of the flying. Viola eased back on the stick and the shuttle settled itself into an entry vector that wouldn't skip it off the atmosphere or turn the craft into an exploding fireball. She activated the shields. Time to intercept with the carrot. Thirty minutes. We're about to go blind, 
Viola said as the cockpit's heat shield slid over the glass. For the next few minutes, the shuttle followed the programmed path to the carrot while the re-entry friction burned outside. Been a while since I've been in the oven, Davin said, keeping his eyes on the meters showing external temp, wind resistance, and more signs that could spell destruction for their craft. Don't land the jumper in real atmosphere much. I've never done it, Viola admitted. Europa and Ganymede had such light atmospheres they barely made an impact. They were like falling through air. Neptune would be more like diving into the ocean. Now you know how exciting it is. You two all right back there? Mox is regretting ever getting in this hellbox, and so am I. Opal yelled back. Hey, give our pilot some encouragement. You're great, Viola, but the heat shielding could use work. We're melting back here. Viola glanced at the readouts and noticed the temp inside the shuttle had risen to over 38 degrees Celsius, but was tapering off. She hadn't even felt the sweat forming on her forehead, the little beads dribbling down the sides of her neck, too zoned in. The central console beeped, showing external temps were lowering as their airspeed reduced and they hit the colder sections of Neptune's atmosphere. Viola retracted the heat shielding and felt the shuttle's temp drop. It went from relief to refreshing to making that sweat so, so cold. Viola shivered as the shuttle warmed itself back up, stabilizing at a cool middle. Out in front, Viola had her first real look at Neptune, or really the endless blue-gray fog encompassing the planet. She felt a drag in her legs, and Viola's heart sped up. Her lungs breathed faster. Neptune's about like Earth in gravity, that's why your vitals are swinging. You should be okay, but it's going to be tiring for a while. Just means you have to work out more. You'll want to talk, Captain, Puck said, buzzing over to him and focusing its camera on Davin's face. Her heart rate's lower than yours. I'm just excited at the thought of smashing you into a thousand pieces. Viola nudged the flight stick to shallow out the descent. The wind resistance was bringing their speed to a point where they should be able to glide their way to the carrot. The more fuel saved, the less likely they'd have to rely on the carrot to get them out of here. I can tell when I'm not wanted, Puck said, floating through the door towards Opal and Mox. Does your bot hold a grudge? Puck? Nah, at least I didn't program it to seek revenge, but I suppose that- Hey, focus. What's that dark smear up there? Davin pointed straight ahead, where a big puffy smudge was growing to fill the distance and dominate the cockpit's view. Flashes popped inside, lightning. Still distant, Viola felt the flight stick pull towards the storm. The wind was getting faster, swirling around the weather and trying to drag the shuttle with it. It's the first of the three storms. If we can loop around this one, we should hit the carrot before passing by the next two. Probably want to start looping then. Right. Viola glanced at the console, but the computer wasn't taking the storm into account, plunging them straight through on their rendezvous route with the carrot. Suppose it was wishful thinking to hope the shuttle had any real weather guidance plugged in. I'm going to have to go manual to get around it. Let me know what you need. That confidence helped. Viola located the autopilot and flicked off the route option. The computer would still try to keep the shuttle stabilized, but wouldn't force it along their path anymore. Viola kept an eye on their airspeed while moving the stick to the right, slanting the shuttle away from the storm. The force of Neptune's speeding air pressed hard against the shuttle, causing airspeed to plummet and Davin to issue a stream of curses. Viola swung the flight stick back the other way, and the shuttle caught the wind on its wings like a bird and floated. Only, they were back heading straight into the storm. To go against the wind, we'll have to burn all the fuel. But if we go with it, we'll hit the storm. How about if we swing around it? Aim for the left edge. Ride the current. Use the momentum to swing to the carrot. Viola looked at the approaching mass, like a raging nightclub in the air, the strobe effect a series of million-degree lightning bolts zapping between clouds of gas. What Davin wanted would have been tricky in space, with only the physics to calculate. Here, with swirling winds changing speed and direction from one second to the next, working around the edge would be as likely to send them to the middle of the storm as it would be to get them around. But the alternative was to take the long way, burn up fuel fighting Neptune, 
and potentially leaving them plummeting to the gaseous depths as their tanks wound up empty. If you have a god to pray to, now's the time, Viola said, angling the ship to start Davin's swing. Chapter 11. Newcomers. Captain Gage, Phyla said, standing on the bridge next to the man. Merc, Eric, and Trina were back on the jumper, keeping it safe from any potential saboteurs. I don't understand. If you don't trust your crew, why aren't you doing anything about it? They'd been tracking the shuttle's descent into Neptune's atmosphere. The bridge divided into halves, with a central walkway leading between six consoles, broken into sets of two. Spread out in front of the large forward-facing window was the bulk of the Amerigo, a great white scar in black space. Gage explained that the color choice eased problem identification. A rift in the pearly painted hull would stand out much over one in a darker hue. One other crew member was on the bridge who hadn't said a word. Compared to Gage's Eden uniform, the man wore a strange outfit bearing Eden's corporate branding. A thick shirt, long-sleeved, that bled into gloves that went up to his elbows. It would have been ridiculous on anyone less serious. Put him and Mox together, and Phyla wouldn't know who'd outstone-face the other. Because nobody, outside of yourself and Quinn, knows I'm looking for traitors. There hasn't been an armed mutiny yet, and I have no desire to start one. But it will happen eventually, Phyla countered. Anyone planning on turning this ship will do so for the money in our cargo, Gage said, following the shuttle's blip on the command console. If your man Davin does his job and gets the carrot back, and they see we're no longer defenseless, the plot might end there. So they would stay hidden. You would never know. But we would be alive. Phyla took the statement and chewed on it. Leaving unknown knives to stab you in the back was a poor plan. But was it worth the danger to chase them out now? All of them, Captain. I would risk everyone to find the traitor. Because if they've taken a bribe once, they'll do it again, and next time might be worse. Now it was Gage's turn to chew. Perhaps being older, I treat life with more caution than you. The years give me more memories to lose, more people to care for, though I see your point. There are eight crew members left on board this ship, the minimum to keep it running while the carrot took the rest. If you want to test their loyalties, take Quinn with you and go. And you? The console next to Gage beeped, a middle tone that attracted attention but softer than a danger alert. Do you see that? Gage pointed to a small white arrow in the top right corner of the console. Representing the area around the ship, the small arrow was at the edge of sensor range, far out beyond Neptune. Compared to the Amerigo, the blip was a tiny fraction, smaller than the jumper. That meant limited supplies, fuel, unlikely to be this far out alone. A scout, Phyla murmured. The bleeding edge of a force sent just far enough ahead to make sure the whole group wasn't speeding right into a trap. Once it communicated and all clear, it wouldn't be long before the rest arrived. If there is a traitor still on this ship, he'll be acting soon. Good hunting. Phyla nodded and walked towards the bridge exit. As she approached, Quinn stepped over in front of her. His face was a granite mask, gray eyes looking at her without inflection, as though she was a blank wall, or nothing at all. The bodyguard didn't appear to carry a weapon, but those gauntlets were thick with plenty of padding. Room to hide something. Where to first? Phyla asked him. They'll be scattered. Quinn's voice had the scratchy rasp of someone who didn't talk much. Gage is going to sound the alarm in a second, sending each one to their positions. We'll hit each one, confirm intentions, and then move on to the next. Phyla blinked. She'd expected Quinn to be a mute enforcer, barely more than a smashing post capable of muttering a few words. A second later, as Quinn moved towards the exit, an alarm sounded on the bridge and presumably through the freighter. You sound like you've done this before. Everybody has their price, Quinn replied as they moved. My job is to make the cost too high. Is that the line you give to everyone you meet? Quinn's mouth twitched. A rebellious upturn quickly crushed back into the straight line mask. So Quinn had a personality. If we were meeting under better circumstances, you might even get to see me laugh. Quinn looked back at Gage, who was watching them, and nodded. Now, though, we have other things to do. Forces have arrived in the system, 
Gage's voice came over hidden speakers. I have every reason to believe they are hostile. Please head to your designated stations and report in when you've arrived. Quinn walked out of the bridge and Phyla followed, leaving Captain Gage alone with the consoles, the noise from their alarms filling Phyla's ears until the bridge door shut them into silence. Chapter 12. Go Time. The alarm rang throughout the jumper's bay, a crash of the worst symbols known to man. Merc jumped a meter, nearly smashing his head on the cockpit ceiling. He was playing spy, watching the cameras around the jumper's exterior to keep an eye out for any of the freighter's crew that got a little too close. As the last pilot on the ship, he had to be in the cockpit anyway. Eric and Trina couldn't fly this thing. Merc, prep the Viper. Phyla's voice came over the comm. You're coming back. Can't. Have to see about a traitor. Then who's flying the jumper? Up to you to make sure we don't have to. You realize I've got one fighter, right? Now I'm good, I'm real good, but without any support out there. If you don't, they'll hit us before we're ready, and then we all die. Or you could come to the jumper and we get out of here. Even as Merck said the words, he knew they were pointless. If they left the Amerigo, then Davin and the others would have nowhere to come back to. They'd be easy pickings returning from Neptune's atmosphere. It was this or nothing. Merck? I'll do what I can. The pilot said, getting out of the seat and heading through the jumper towards the Viper's Bay. Along the way, Merck calmed Trina to come ready the fighter, told Eric to hit the cockpit, and swung by his room to grab his flight suit. The suit was a crimson red, the same shade as the decal for Merck's former squad. The fabric tightened by design as Merck put it on, becoming a second skin, meant to help keep warmth in and reduce the possibilities of an accidental snag in the event of an ejection or spacewalk. The attached mask had already saved Merck's life in the space above Europa, capable of slipping on and establishing a vacuum seal in a second if Merck hit the emergency pad below the wrist of either hand. It could buy him a few minutes of life out there. Not that Merck ever wanted to experience that again. Reconciling yourself with death once was enough. Thanks. Trina had the Viper warming up by the time Merck hit the bay, the batteries charged and ready to go. The mechanic was watching the system readouts on her comm as Merck went past her and climbed the short ladder into the Viper's cockpit. What do we have? Merck calmed Eric. Let's see. The physician answered. Looks like you have one long-range scout vessel, a larger ship that looks very familiar, and a pair of escort fighters. Very familiar. If I'm reading this right, it appears to be the same frigate that caught us outside of Europa. What's it doing here? Merck said, settling into the seat. Would you like me to ask it? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, Merck said, as the Viper's systems came back showing greens. How long do I have? Depends. You sit here and wait for them to shoot. Looks like you have an hour. You want to go out and tango? Well, you might catch them facing the wrong way. Any ship speeding to another planet needed to slow itself down as it came near orbit. Sensors wouldn't be able to pick up a target till the ship was close, relatively speaking, which meant these raiding bastards would have to take a few minutes to reorient and settle into an attack pattern. With a good burst from the engines, Merck could get the Viper close before they finished. He'd buy a few precious seconds of surprise. Merck tapped a button on the Viper's sole console, a piece of screen as large as his spread palm. The Viper's three lift jets, one in the nose and a pair back by the engines, bumped the fighter off of the jumper's floor. Merck moved the flight stick to the right and the fighter rotated, tilting with the motion. The freighter used a lot of power to generate 1G the same as Earth's gravity. The fighter turned with resistance, not quite the whipping wildness of weightless flight. Trina opened the jumper's door for him, and Merck boosted the fighter out into the larger freighter bay. While the jumper could hold a magnetic shield up for small windows to launch and land the fighter, the freighter only bothered to close its bay doors in emergencies. As a result, when Merck turned the Viper towards space, the black was haloed by the Amerigo's walls like a square eclipse. Another tap of the console and the batteries shifted their thrust to the main engines, pushing the Viper forward, about to dive into combat against overwhelming forces. Opal, meanwhile, was crashing through thick atmosphere in a rickety old shuttle. Who had the worse luck? Focus on the now, buddy. Merck whispered to himself. 
that's what she'd be telling you anyway. He glanced at the scanner, even though Merck knew Opal and their shuttle wouldn't be on it. Too hidden by Neptune's roiling atmosphere. What was arrayed on the screen, though, in small and large triangles were the targets. The Viper lurched, leaving the Amerigo's gravity, as though ropes tying it down were cast off. Merck took the cue and punched the throttle, angling the Viper away from the freighter and towards what looked to his naked eyes like an empty patch of black. Neptune spread out behind Merck, invisible except in his mind. The sun glowed on Merck's right, a sickly yellow dot so far away. Looks awful lonely out here. Earth was always surrounded by so many lights, so many things going on. You getting homesick on me? Because I have a remedy for that. For real? You want it, you'll have to make it back. Will do. The scanner showed the triangles picking up on his presence. Two fighters, the scout, and the big boy. Merck tightened his fingers around the flight stick, exhaled a deep breath. The odds could be worse. A slide of a dial sent some of the engine power to the Viper's armor plating, allowing it to channel and dissipate heat. It'd suck up enough lasers until it had nowhere to send the heat to, then the Viper would melt away just like anything else. Lasers were cheap, and cheap to defend against. Merck had to hope that's all these guys were packing. If they showed up with solid slugs, then the Viper would be so much confetti. The darkness in front shimmered, as though there was an error in the picture. The bigger ship blocking starlight. Merck's scanner had the fighters a few minutes out, the two small ships coming up first, the scout craft and its frigate partner taking longer to line up their attack. Two on one at the start. Much better. The Viper's cockpit window popped a pair of light blue squares into view against the backdrop, outlining the fighters. Merck, keeping his right hand on the flight stick, tapped another button on the console that shaded both squares a rose red. Classed as enemies, the Viper fitted a gold outline on the closer one, small numbers showing current speed popping up beneath the enemy ship. Merck still couldn't get a visual, had no idea what these fools were packing. But waiting for them to fire a shot was a poor choice. A flick of the stick had the Viper nosing towards the closer fighter. Merck wasn't in range yet, but here's the secret that most flight computers didn't catch. Lasers didn't just wink out after a certain distance. They'd lose potency, sure, but would splash bright flashes across the cockpit window and, in sufficient number, could still cause problems. The enemy fighter was still zipping forward, which meant it would run right into those lasers before it got to Merck. His finger pressed on the trigger and sent a series of beams launching straight off into the dark, right at the center of the red square. A second later, that square took a hard dive, turning away from Merck. And then it was visible the square outlining a small disc-shaped craft, the Omni, that glinted in the sunlight. Designed only for zero-G, Omnis were all guns and thrusters, meant to stop, turn, and swing in any direction the pilot wanted. The other red blip had changed its angle, coming at Merck from the right. But the first one's dive had broken up their attack trajectory, and now the second was playing catch-up. Merck just had to stay far enough ahead. Pushing the stick forward, Merck slid the Viper after the first Omni. It lacked the single-direction speed of the Viper, so Merck closed the gap and fired the second the console chimed that he was in optimal range. The Omni twitched left and right, activating those damn jump jets at random. The quick shifts couldn't dodge all the fire, though. Merck saw four hits suck into the Omni and disappear, but the fifth one blew off a piece of its shell. Then the fighter stopped fired its engines back towards Merck. Angry orange gouts of light sprung out of the fighter as it jetted towards the Viper. Merck, keeping his fire steady, wrenched the stick to the left while twisting his wrist. This sent the Viper launching left and triggered tiny maneuvering jets that spun the Viper like a corkscrew, making it a harder target. As Merck blew by the paused fighter, he saw flashes as the ship's electronics overheated and died. One down. Merck glanced at his scanner to see how far behind him the second fighter was. Only it wasn't far at all. Right on his tail and unleashing hot laser into Merck's aft. The Viper shuddered as a pair of bolts struck home, and Merck yanked the stick up, curling out from under the fire. The second Omni shouldn't have been there. No way it was that fast. 
A glance at the scanner corrected the error. The ship chasing him was the scout, its guns tracking him even as its larger mass made it harder to maneuver. It had corrected faster than Merck thought, which meant Merck had just curled up into... In front of him, boxed in that red square, loomed the other Omni, spewing laser at him. As Merck's stomach dropped into an icy bath, he held his trigger and hoped he had one more miracle left. Chapter 13. The Carrot. All Viola could hear were alarms, one for the wind shear tearing at the wings, another for the shuttle's stability, the changing altitude as the shuttle fell into and out of air pockets. A third one showing Viola was no longer strapped in, which happened when Puck cut her loose after the G-forces tightened the belt and pulled her beyond reach of the flight stick. Nearly crushed by a safety feature not designed to handle Neptune's windstorms. But they were moving. Sliding around the edge of the whirling mass of deep blue and black, lightning crackling to the right of the shuttle. To the left, a serene, hazy teal captured the sinking sunlight of the day. The dichotomy would have been entrancing, except, you know, the alarms. Viola kept the flight stick hard to the right, keeping the shuttle tilted so that the pushing winds propelled it along the border of the storm. Every couple of moments, another air pocket caused Viola's stomach to lurch up to her throat. Davin was yelling something, had been yelling things, but Viola couldn't hear a word. Responding to the chaos, her brain shut things out one by one. Noises fell away. The rapid heartbeat faded, and even the perception of herself drifted away until Viola could only feel the flight stick, the tremors running through the shuttle as it struggled to hold itself together. She felt where the shuttle was being shoved, followed the wind gusts, and fought others, all to stay targeted on the carrot. They neared the back of the storm. Viola could see the rounding of the violence, a ridged line between heaven and hell. In the far distance beyond, Another pair of storms played on the horizon. Between them was the goal. Viola angled for it, catching one more burst of wind that shoved the shuttle towards open space. And then they were in free fall. Viola flying up out of her seat, only a death grip on the flight stick keeping her from hitting the ceiling. Viola could tell she was screaming but couldn't hear it. Davin, still in place with his straps, grabbed her wrist and tried to pull her down. The numbers on their altitude sped towards zero, the alarm blaring louder. Viola tried to tug up on the stick, but there wasn't any air the shuttle could push against. A violent lurch, the shuttle picked out of the sky by an invisible hand. Viola saw the world spin around and turn to dark as the shuttle was flung into the storm. Through the outer edge and into a temporary moment of calm, lightning flashing around the shuttle. The center of the storm. Viola fell back into her seat. Take a breath, take a breath. You all right? Davin's voice rose above the silence. It's going to hurt later. We have to get out of here before the storm cooks us. You've got my permission, if that's what you're waiting for. Viola wasn't, but that was because she wasn't sure what to do. Fly right back out into that tornado? That air pocket? Try cutting through the storm and risk the lightning. This wasn't anything she'd done before. Nothing she'd trained for. Viola moved the stick to the right, aiming deeper into the storm. As if sensing her path, a sheet of lightning turned everything in front of them into white. That looks less than good. Statistically, I've got nothing. Nobody's gathered information on Neptune lightning properties. Quiet. Viola snapped. The flight plan put the struggling shuttle only a few straight-shot seconds from the outer band of the storm, where the winds picked up again for one final assault. Any fuel gains from using the wind to swing around were eliminated by the cut-through they were doing, where Viola had to pump more energy to the engines to fight the pull of the storm's internal flux. If they hit no other catastrophes, the shuttle might make it to the carrot with enough fuel to start its engines again, but not much else. Their only way back to space was the carrot. Lightning flashed outside again. A twanging crack came a moment later from right of the shuttle, metal snapping. Viola recognized the sound from the many stress tests she'd run on small components built during school experiments, and looked away from the storm to the console. It showed a diagram of the shuttle, with the right wing shaded a deep yellow and pulsing. Then she felt the drag, the listing as the shuttle tilted right. 
Lost the right wing. We'll have to... Increase power to the engines to stabilize, I know. Viola said, boosting their speed. We're about to get tossed around. Then we have to hotfoot it to the carrot. Were we taking the slow route before? I'm saying we might not make it. The speed kicked the shuttle forward. Viola waited for the opposite spin, or something to yank the shuttle away, but it stayed straight. The entire wing might not be gone then. A chance still to make it through. The winds picked up again, roaring around the shuttle, rocking them. This time, though, Viola was expecting the pushes, the grabs, and the falls of Neptune's weather. They bounced, they tumbled, and they did a number of half-rolls that had Viola scared the shuttle would drop straight into a nosedive. After what felt like hours, but, according to the computer, was less than a minute they were out. Back in the teal fog, pushed by gentler winds, Viola took a breath. Nice job, kid. Looks like the carrot's straight ahead. Davin was right. Between the twin storms up front, there was a small shape. Keeping pace with those storms would help disguise the carrot's movements, make it harder to intercept. Should we try to talk to it? Viola asked. Not like they won't see us coming. And who knows, maybe we'll find a few friends on there. Viola turned on the comm and tried sending a greeting, but met with silence. Not even an acknowledging click. Flip to the short-range radio. Their comm might be damaged. Viola nodded. Every ship had your standard radio transmitter as a backup comm system. Less complicated, with no real way to choose a specific target. Blasting a radio signal was still a viable way to get help in an emergency. Viola toggled the radio on. A loud static burst shot through the shuttle, pulsing in crackling waves. Turn it off, Davin yelled, hands over his ears. Viola reached for the toggle was about to hit it when the static paused, then pulsed again. Viola gave it a moment, listening, albeit painfully, as the static continued to sound in waves. That wasn't normal. Radio static should be continuous. Davin tried to reach for the switch, but Viola hit his hand away, still listening. I think it's a pattern, Viola said over the noise. Opal's head appeared in the cockpit, sticking in through the entryway. I don't know what you two are doing up here, but someone's trying to talk to us. That static is Morse code, and it's saying, run. Chapter 14, Interrogation Phyla didn't know what was happening. She couldn't see what was going on with Merck, and half the time wasn't able to get info from Eric because Quinn had her talking with one of the Amerigo crew members. They'd already met three of them, and within a few questions to each one, Quinn shook his head and pulled her away. Apparently the man could read people, tell if they were hiding something or if they were even nervous, which made Phyla feel entirely ornamental. Why do you even need me? Phyla said as they walked along a corridor. You seem like you got this. If you're setting a trap, best not let your prey see you doing it. Setting a trap. Okay, buddy. They went around a corner and entered the freighter's main engine room. A pair of dirty-looking scrubs were keeping tabs on the freighter's power systems and the ship's speed which right now was a slow crawl meant to keep the freighter more or less above the carrot. Hi, I'm Phyla. Things all good back here. Hey, Quinn, the taller of the two said. He was sporting a thick corporate worksuit that was both overprotective and impractical. A massive belt hung around his waist, sporting more tools than Phyla had ever seen Trina carry. It also held the man's waist-length hair, tied into a tight tail. Phyla would have considered that a risk for her own mechanic but maybe Eden didn't give a damn. What's she doing back here? Taking a tour, Van. You hear we have enemies in system? You mean, did we hear the alarms? Because they were so deafening we couldn't hear much else. The short one, whose hair was hidden under a stained, deep green hat, leaned back against the wall. The way he stared at Phyla had her doing a double take. It wasn't in the usual sketchbook of stares men tossed her way, but a lazy look of indifference like Phyla might give to a chair she didn't intend to use, or a tissue as it went in the trash. Why'd you come way back here to ask us? Think we're going to run? How would you do that? What do you mean? I'd cut the power to everything that wasn't essential and send it to the engines. Blow us out of here real quick. There's patrolled space around Uranus. Patrolled by corporate-sponsored crews. Phyla had taken the jumper on a wide course around Uranus, not hard to do since it didn't cross paths much with Neptune. Despite not having any true authority, 
the free laws handed the deepest pockets the opportunity to carve out their own empires, wherever the Earth nations didn't bother. So you take us all with you? Easy, Phyla said, putting a hand on Quinn's arm. Van looked at both of them, confused. They think you're going to sell out the ship, the short one muttered. For what slip? Van said, twisting around to look at his co-worker. You think I want coin? Way out here. Nah, I think they're stupid. We didn't know where we were even flying. How would we have planned anything? Wait, his name is Slip? Phyla looked at the short one. Slip? Really? Earned that one, Slip said, standing up straighter. Because I can get in anywhere, fix anything on these boats. What's your name? Phyla. That's a strange name, too. How'd you get that one? Birth? And you think mine's weird. At least I chose it. Slip recrossed his arms. Phyla shrugged. What could she say to that? Okay, well... Van said, coming to the rescue. We're not Eden's normal cargo division. We're special. Or this ship is. Deep space missions with experimental stuff. We almost never know where we're going. The man makes a good point. Few of the crew members knew the final destination, and most of those are on the carrot. Phyla glanced at Quinn. You're saying there might not be another up here? Another what? Sell out. That's who they're looking for. Thanks. Quinn said, turning and walking back down the hallway. Phyla paused a moment, matched Van's bewildered stare with a shrug while ignoring a dour look from the slip, and then took off after the bodyguard. What was that? Phyla said as she caught up to Quinn, who was heading towards the freighter's crew quarters. We didn't even get very far. Slip seemed weird. He's always like that. And he's right. I didn't think about it, but the only ones who could arrange anything would have known we were coming here. I have the list of who knew our destination, but it's in my quarters. Don't you use a comm? Too easy to hack. The other comm's secure. Low tech. And you're not carrying it on you. Do you carry everything you own all the time? I'm just saying. Nobody else on this ship knows about that comm. If I wore it around, there'd be questions. Besides, anyone tries to get in my room, I'll know. Phyla pictured a slew of traps. Alarms, sure, but Quinn probably had something better. A stunning shot sent as soon as the door opened. An exotic animal hell-bent on tearing apart any intruder. So what's the plan? Phyla said, pulling herself back to the present. We get that list, cross-reference with everyone still won the ship, and then we'll know whether we have anyone left to talk to. You think we have that time? Phyla said, glancing at her calm. Eric's latest message said Merck was engaged with the fighters, that he was outnumbered. Because right now, my guy out there could use some help. You're being paid, Quinn's dry reply. Phyla was angry for a hot second, about to lay into the bodyguard for being insensitive, but she caught herself. Quinn was right. They were being paid and given their choice of occupation. Terrible situations often found the wild nines. But that didn't mean she had to accept it. Not to die. You get your list. I'm heading back to my ship and out to help my pilot. Fine. The docking bays were back towards the front of the freighter, near the bridge. She made it three steps before she felt a hand on her shoulder and saw a sidearm being handed to her. You're unarmed. Take this. I've got plenty back at the jumper. Phyla replied, pushing the small weapon away. You might not make it there. Chapter 15 Reflex. In combat, a pilot has to make innumerable decisions every second. How fast to go, which way to turn, whether to fire or not. Merck had made all those calls over and over again, but when he saw the Omni in front of his Viper, waiting to blow him into scattered matter, Merck flinched. Floating in space above Europa, the burning agony of the laser shot, black closing in around his eyes. Not again. Merck snapped the Viper down, away from the Omni, a pair of shots skipping off the Viper's shields. Then the scout ship, screaming after the Viper but not able to match the turn, cut in between the two of them. Merck shifted the shields to cover the Viper's rear and shot towards the frigate, hanging away from the fight. Long and narrow, with a bank of engines at the end and a series of wing-like chutes spreading out from the central shaft. Turrets sprinkled along the ship, bumps crisscrossing the surface. Hope they weren't ready for a fighter to go screaming past. 
or they'd fill the sky with so much fire the viper would just vanish. Merck pushed all the energy from the lasers to the engines, kicking up his velocity. Doing what I can for you, baby, Merck muttered. Then he started to juke, twitching the viper at random as the frigate opened up. The attack was sporadic. They didn't want to risk hitting their own ship still tailing the viper. The scout ship and fighter had the same issue, shoot and miss, and they'd pound the frigate. But one of them would hit Merck eventually. The viper approached the bow of the big ship, slipped over the top. The ridged neck of the craft spread out below him, boxes and bumps for sensors, shields and communications riddling the smooth gray plating. In front of Merck, that big bank of engines loomed like a metal mountain. Across its surface, a dozen large guns rotated, drawing beads on the Viper. Last time, near Europa, this frigate hadn't been armed, used harpoon turrets. Merck glanced at the console, at the readout of weapons on the ship. Almost every gun was different, a model yanked from another ship, or a scrap pile and jury-rigged to fit on this one. Explained why they were missing so much. When the weapons all fired at different times, turned at different speeds, made it hard to line up a shot. And they were too slow. Merck pulled back on the stick, sending the Viper up and over the engines. Cut engines, rear jets, Merck said. The Viper's main engines paused while the fighter's maneuvering jets kicked in, wrenching the back of the ship around while its momentum carried it over the edge of the engine back. Merck looked out at the long block of engines along the bottom of the cockpit's window. The Viper's belly exposed, an easy kill for a second. Go, shield's bottom, Merck said. And the fighter lurched as the engines came back to life, its motion still carrying it out from the frigate, stuck still in space. The scout ship took advantage, loosing a barrage of lasers. They smashed into the Viper's shields, the console flashing red as the last of the energy gave out. Merck ignored the wailing alarms as a pair of bolts dug into the craft's armor. Then the frigate's engines cut off the scout ship's firing line. Glancing at the console, the outline of the Viper still showed all green. No critical damage. Behind him, the scanner showed the scout ship overshooting Merck's angle, forcing it into a long loop past the frigate. Merck swooped to the underside of the frigate, then skated the Viper alongside the hull, kept the Viper close so those guns wouldn't be able to turn fast enough to get off a shot. The shields, given a hot second without getting hit, were coming back, fuzzing into life. The only question was, there. The Omni darted down from the frigate's topside, lasers flashing. Merck nudged the Viper closer to the hull. The console flared yellow, the proximity alert, less than a meter of space, but the Omni overplayed its ambush. It was beneath the Viper now. Any shots up would score against the frigate's hull, against their own shields. Come on, don't shoot, Merck said as the Viper raced towards the frigate's bow. The Omni hesitated and the Viper increased the distance, launching out in front of the frigate. Merck pulled up, still heading back towards the Amerigo, but keeping the frigate in the firing line. Scattered lasers from the frigate's turrets blew past the Viper, but Merck's random twitches kept them guessing. All engines. Merck said, routing all of the Viper's shield power to the jets. A moment later, Merck kicked back into his seat as the Viper jumped forward, speeding back towards the Amerigo. Alive. He was alive. Only he was running. For the first time, Merck was running from a fight. Like a coward. Chapter 16. Boarding Party. We can't run. Literally can't. But we can answer. If they're using static bursts to transmit, maybe they can pick something up. Viola watched Davin reach over to the console and tap his way through a few menus until the schematics of the carrot sat in front of them. The ship's ovoid shape made clear its purpose as a mining vessel, a large hold along the bottom for storing goods, with layers of lab and crew space overhead. The bridge sat towards the pointed front, far away from the bottom rear loading doors. If something went wrong with the cargo, there'd be plenty of seals to keep the pilots alive. The two small bays for landing craft were at the top center. Viola figured it was because the carrot could be in some nasty territory, and being able to keep other ships as far from the extraction source was a good plan. 
Wouldn't be a bad idea to take these schematics and send them to her father. A little corporate espionage on the side. Let's keep quiet. Radio's not secure. Gage is thinking this ship might not be his anymore. So any heads up we give will only warn someone we're coming. Don't we need them to open the bay doors? Nope. Remote override. Gage gave us the codes on our way out. Meant for emergency recovery operations like this one. We'll get close, beam the code over, and the doors should open. Which means they'll know we're there before we land, Opal said. What, scared of a few space pirates? Opal shook her head and went aft. The shuttle was coming up fast on the carrot. Only a few minutes till they'd hit broadcast range. Without the right wing working, landing the shuttle would be less docking and more crashing. Those maneuvering jets stressed getting the shuttle off the ground. They wouldn't help with braking. And any major reverse thrust from the engines relied on the wings keeping the craft stable. Pull hard, and the weaker side curled, a boat with only one paddle. Strap in, Viola said, using the shuttle's intercoms to carry the command to the back. It's not going to be a nice landing. They came up on the carrot, the larger ship spreading out in front of them like a whale in one of Earth's oceans. Neptune's fog blurred the edges, making the carrot look like more a portal to a misty dimension. Only when the shuttle passed through the last cloud bank did Eden's secret ship manifest itself. Whoa. Viola didn't say so much as breathed. The carrot was an emerald at dusk, bands of green hues looping around one another. There were no protrusions, none of the bulky modules that made up most ships, as their owners mixed and matched functionality. Whatever engines keeping the carrot aloft were hidden somewhere in the aft, covered by the body. It makes no sense. It's a mining vessel. What is it even made of? Viola was about to rattle off a few more questions before catching herself. The only people that could answer were on that ship, and if Captain Gage was right, they'd be trying to kill her soon enough. Now I understand. You do? Why bother trying to hijack a mining vessel? Neptune's huge. Just get your own ship and grab some gems. But if the carrot is the real reward... Viola angled the ship towards the twin bays, or at least where they should be. The carrot's top was a smooth dome that flowed into the rest of the ship. No visible space to dock. At least not yet. Ready with the code? Aren't we moving a little fast for a landing? Our momentum's the only thing keeping us straight. We break. This shuttle's going to go all over the place. I'd like to know where I'm aiming before that happens. You crash us into the side of this beautiful ship. You're paying for it. So nice. Viola wondered what it would cost to fix a scratch on the carrot. Probably more than every coin she'd earned in her entire life. Davin flipped the console to the shuttle's short-range comm and plugged in the code. When he tapped the send button, the shuttle would blast the code in all directions. Anything that was listening would get the message. Anyone, too. But the code was only numbers, meaningless unless the carrot hijackers knew it as well. Here we go, Davin said, tapping the send button. Cracks appeared in the top of the carrot, a top they were drawing way too close to. A platform rose out of the top of the ship, twenty meters wide. Beneath the hull was an open space tall enough for the shuttle to fit into, followed by a more standard gray metal floor. Viola could see through the bay and out the other end. Dual side docking. Very cool. At least they didn't paint the inside the same color. It's not a spaceship without gray hallways. The shuttle didn't have air brakes. The intent was to use atmospheric drag and the main engines to slow thrust then switch to the maneuvering jets when you were close enough to land. Problem was, with Neptune's winds blowing along behind them, there wasn't any way the shuttle would slow enough to dock with just the jets alone. And when Viola switched the main thrust into reverse, the shuttle shook as if some giant creature had taken hold of it as a toy. Viola kept one eye on their airspeed while the other paid attention to their angle of descent. The platform was coming up quick. They'd be hitting it or passing it in ten seconds. Right now, it'd be a crash. Davin yammered about breaking this or turning that. Puck stated useless facts, like how the shuttle wasn't designed for a landing in these winds. Viola tuned them both out and focused. Nine. Viola dialed up the power to the engines, and the shuttle turned right, the corkscrew from the damaged wing. Eight. 
A swipe of the console flipped the diagram to the landing controls. 7. The platform was way to the left. Viola tapped the button for the maneuvering jets on the right side, switching the flight stick to her left hand. 6. The nose of the shuttle passed over the outskirts of the carrot, the teal air below changing into a hard, light green mass. 5. The maneuvering jets kicked in on the right side, boosting the shuttle to the left. Their airspeed was nearing the point where the shuttle would drop like a rock. 4. Viola pulled the flight stick back, pointing the nose of the shuttle up. At the same time, with her left hand, she cut the reverse thrust. 3. Swapping hands again, Viola tapped the console and started the rest of the maneuvering jets. 2. The shuttle was now sinking, the nose passing just beneath the roof of the platform. Viola cut the engines. The shuttle lurched as its mass fell into the hands of the maneuvering jets. 1. With the platform beneath them, Viola triggered one last shot of the reverse thrust, bringing the shuttle into a stall. The nose pointed too high, and the jets weren't correctly placed to catch the shuttle. They were going to hit hard. Hang on, Viola yelled. The shuttle fell and struck the platform with its aft first, the impact causing the nose to slam downward. The jets caught some of the swing, bouncing Viola out of her seat but not into the ceiling, her hands slapping at the console to kill the alarms. Won't say that's the prettiest landing I've ever seen, Davin said, releasing his straps. You all right? I'm alive, Viola said, climbing back into her seat. Good. Let's go take over a ship. Chapter 17 The Jumper Something was always breaking on a ship, or about to break. This time it was the rear left landing strut. Trina saw the readings when the jumper landed on the Amerigo, the brief flash of yellow on her status grid that displayed back near the engines, her haunt while the ship was in motion. A flash that meant, for a hot moment as the jumper settled into the bay, the strut almost broke and sent the ship crashing into the floor. Not good when you're in potentially hostile territory. The problem turned out to be a pair of bolts that during the flight out had either been hit by passing space junk, though since the struts recoiled in flight it wasn't likely, or had worn down over time. Either way, the bolts were loose and the joint connecting the strut to the jumper wouldn't handle too many more trips before snapping in half. Thankfully, bolts were something Trina always had handy. Like food, the wild nines would die without them. Trina. Eric yelled from the jumper's ramp. You're not on your comm. Trina blinked at the statement, then glanced over where her toolbox sat on the freighter bay floor. Her comm was sitting on top of it. No reason to have the device get scuffed while she took the strut apart. Should I be? Merck's flying back to the freighter. He took them all down already. No, he was outnumbered. We have to get out there and help him. Eric waved at her to come towards the ramp. Trina stayed back at the strut. One bolt still had to be swapped out. Attack or no, if the jumper lifted off now, there'd be no chance it would land again. Not nicely, anyway. That's not a good idea. One of our struts needs fixing. How long? How much time do I have? Phyla's coming. You've got till she gets here. That's an impossible calculation, but I will try. The doctor nodded and vanished back up the ramp. Trina applied her wrench to the bolt, spinning it. With the three of them, the jumper wasn't crewed for a fight. Someone had to watch the engines, had to fly, and then another two people on the guns. No amount of math would turn three of them into four. Trina gave the wrench a final turn, and the bolt popped off. The strut groaned, the weight put on the first bolt she'd switched out. Trina watched it for a second, making sure it could hold the stress. Redundancy was a serious word. Every system... Every part on the jumper needed a backup. If they could support it, Trina would have advocated the same for the human element. Turned out people were too expensive. As Trina grabbed the new bolt and slotted it in, she heard the undulating whine of the jumper's engines going through their pre-flight cycles. Sounding darn good, too. No stuttering, no unexpected clogging of the vents. Hearing a perfect sound like that, well, it was like listening to a symphony. The synchronized success of so many pieces making the machine hum. And then a loud shriek of metal grating against its own unoiled self. 
The bay doors were closing fast, shooting down from the top and bottom of the bay to meet in the middle with a crashing clang. The jumper was trapped. Chapter 18. The Halls. The traitor shut the doors from the backup bridge, Gage said through the comm. Can't you open them? Phyla asked, running through the freighter's hallways towards the jumper's bays. We don't get out there. Merc has no support. And you will have a boarding party knocking on your door. Nothing. They have the override codes, and the backup bridge is only designed for use if this one can't work. Phyla could almost hear the shrug through the comm. The captain sounded resigned, doomed to lose the game. Phyla didn't have time for that crap, though. Not when her pilot was out there. If Merc's stuck in space, he's going to die. You need a place for him to dock now. Can't he run? As she jogged, Phyla kept looking for a terminal, a console, any place that might let her into the Amerigo's computer system. She didn't believe for a minute that the bay doors could be closed and locked from some backup bridge, but the captain might not know how to handle it. Or didn't care. Gage's remark about them being paid to die played itself in Phyla's head. Lock Merc out, force him to fight, and maybe the pilot would take out one or two enemy ships before dying. Phyla's calm beeped, Merc calling. Stay tuned, Captain, Phyla said, clicking to Merc's channel. Hit me, hotshot. Why is the bay closed? Gage says it's the traitor and he doesn't have a way of opening it. Does Gage know his other bays are open? What? The cargo bays. I'm angling towards one now. I have a couple minutes lead on them. Should be able to ground this guy in a couple seconds. If Gage could close the door behind me, I'd be pretty happy. We'll send. Land safe, then find your way up to us. You got it, and Phyla. Yeah? Sorry, I wasn't able to do more out there. Save the pity party for later, Phyla said, flipping the comm back to Gage's channel. Captain, I'm going to need you to close your cargo bay doors as soon as my guy lands. Can do. Phyla clicked off and continued running. The metal floors weren't the best surface for it, her boots pounding every step into ground that didn't give a millimeter. Her boots weren't made for jogging, more for comfort and, if the situation required it, a kick to the face. Quinn's sidearm pumped with her right hand. She hadn't seen any other crew, but they were probably following whatever Eden's hostile boarding procedures dictated, sealing themselves in a room and praying. Devon, I will punch you when you get back, Phyla muttered between breaths. Hoped they were having a blast down there, saying hi to Neptune while Phyla dealt with a bunch of raiders. The hallway widened and split into a gradual ramp, with one half continuing on her level. Up that ramp were the passenger bays, one of which the jumper occupied. Phyla ran up the shallow incline, designed for any cargo that needed manual moving between the level. Almost there. Phyla calmed to Eric. How's pre-flight? Fine, but it won't mean anything if we can't get those doors open. Once I'm there, I'll be able to hack the freighter from the jumper's computer. Phyla replied. It shouldn't be hard. Phyla kept the jumper loaded with the finest in cracking weaponry. Once she networked with a ship, Phyla could, with a bit of time, get her victim to open up all its electronic secrets. Like solving puzzles, only the prize for winning was survival. This hallway, stretching by the bays, was half the width of Eden Prime's promenade, but empty. No cover, which became a concern when the hallway's alarms sounded an incoming ship. But Gage said all the passenger bays were closed, locked down. Phyla ran by the first bay, looked in, and saw space. Space that was filling with a pair of ships Phyla didn't recognize. One was an Omni. Another, an oval covered in sensor dishes and small guns. Gage? Phyla calmed. Why is Bay 1 open? I've been telling you we have someone on the inside. They must have just opened them. For the raiders. Them? All the bays, except for the one your ship is in. They're showing open. The jumper was in the last of five bays. The closest one to the bridge, but the farthest from Phyla. A long run. If she was caught out here, there'd be no chance. Nowhere to hide. Eric, Phyla calmed, backing down the ramp. Seal the ship, arm the turrets. Anyone comes in that bay, you blast them to hell. What, where are you? They've cut me off. I'm going to try to get to the bridge and get your bay open. When it does, I'm going to need you to get the jumper out of there. But I'm not a pilot. Today you are. 
Phyla clicked off as a whooshing noise came from farther along the hallway, up the ramp. The first boarders were out. Phyla cursed, turned, and ran back the way she'd come. Chapter 19. Digging. The secure comm was only as large as the palm of Quinn's hand. It wouldn't wrap around the wrist was kept out of sight. A circle made up of a screen, it awoke when Quinn pressed his thumb to the face. Blue hues outlined his thumb before collapsing into a black and white grid. Every black square a data file. The grid had room for nine, but Eden only filled four of them for this mission. This mission. Every job had these locked comms attached to them now. So paranoid about losing secrets, losing ships, losing anything. Those black squares held Eden's information on every crew member, on both ships, their purposes and potential threats. Quinn tapped the first one, the data file on key personnel, the ones who knew the full extent of the mission, the carrot's purpose in extracting the ice diamonds. Photos of Captain Gage, one of the carrot's captain, Quinn, and a few others. Quinn swiped over to the next file, one dedicated to threats, espionage from other corporations, crew members deemed risks due to unstable personal or money problems. There was a new entry here, though. A download done since Quinn checked last. Remnants of the Red Voice. Evidence and rumors indicate the terrorist organization may not be as defeated as previously thought. With all known accounts frozen, their only source of financial gain may be in black market moves. If they learn of the Carrot's mission, there is substantial risk that the Amerigo may be attacked. To account for this, we are providing additional security through a mercenary group. The file went on, giving known details on every single one of the Wild Nine's members. Last known job protecting the growing Eden Prime settlement, dismissed after charges of murder, charges that had been suspended. Quinn tried to punch up more details, but the calm came back blank. When Quinn tried to request the download, the comm reported back that their files were sealed. Who wanted to protect these mercenaries? Sounds echoed down the hallway, running boots on metal floors. The enemy was here. Quinn slipped the secured comm into his pocket, pressed the button next to his cabin door. It shunted closed as the pounding footsteps came closer. Three sets, the footfalls coming through as vibrations more than noise. The first set landed outside his door. Quinn pressed the exit button, the door shooting open as the second set stamped by. The third, belonging to a scrawny mutt with a wild look in his eyes, tripped as the man saw Quinn and his gun standing there. The stumbling momentum carried the man past Quinn's door, and Quinn reached out, grabbed the man in a headlock and pulled him tight to Quinn's body. With his left hand, Quinn grabbed the sidearm out of the man's holster and, the two leading enemies turning too slowly, shot both of them. Orange bolts. Killers, Quinn said to the scrabbling man, gurgling as he struggled to breathe in Quinn's grip. His eyes locked with Quinn's, narrowed. Funny coming from you, the man said. All you've ever done is kill us. Quinn put the man on the ground, watched as the last breath escaped from his lips. That line. Killed us. No normal pirate or random criminal would bother saying that. It would be pointless. Quinn inspected their uniforms, the bodies lying around him. Each one wore a patchwork quilt of fabrics, and even parts of boxes, furniture, other things sewn together. Quinn had seen the reports, the change when the Red Voice had done this, when they'd taken parts of their lives and wore it to generate empathy from the billions that watched their struggle on the satellite feeds throughout the solar system. What it meant was that they weren't being boarded by simple pirates, but that they were in real trouble. These people had a cause, and the ones with causes couldn't be bribed, couldn't be persuaded, couldn't be defeated unless their breath was taken away. And the best place to do that was the bridge, a bottleneck with defenses. Quinn turned to head that way when the sounds of lasers scoring off metal echoed along the hallway. More of them. Might as well clear some of these bastards out on the way. Chapter 20. Hijackers. Mox on the left, Davin on the right of the shuttle's exit door. Opal had her long rifle out spread across the seats that a few minutes ago they'd been sitting in as Viola bounced the shuttle to its landing. As for the pilot, 
She was back in the short connection between the shuttle's aft and cockpit, the best spot to keep her out of fire, though Viola held a weapon of her own. Davin checked Melody, the energy-spewing shotgun left as a gift from the jumper's previous captain. Davin looked around, caught quick nods from Mox and Opal, then opened the door. Opal fired. The near-silent expulsion of bright yellow laser light from her rifle streaked out even as the shuttle's door was receding into the top. Davin peeked around the edge in time to see one of several people fall back behind a doorway leading out of the docking bay. In that flash, Davin recognized the Eden uniform, but also the trailing end of a gun barrel. One hit, Opal announced, her face stuck to the scope. Mox dashed outside the shuttle, moving to the side to clear Opal's firing line. For the moment, the hijackers waited behind their doorway. Davin followed Mox out, turning to the right, towards the back of the shuttle. Depending on Opal to cover his back, Davin moved around the rear, keeping Melody raised and ready. Could be anyone lurking around the inside of the bay. Rounding the engines, Davin dropped into a crouch, adopting the lower profile as he left the cover of the shuttle's body. The other side of the bay looked like the first, a stretch of wall and another exit, and... What was that? Two of the hijackers were kneeling in the doorway, holding a giant tool in their hands, a long, skeletal tube with metal supports keeping it together. Smaller lines ran away from the central tube to a pair of fuel tanks strapped to the second hijacker's back, and it was pointed right at the shuttle. The front kneeler saw Davin, whipped out a sidearm and squeezed off a pair of shots before Davin could pull Melody's trigger. Both lanced over his shoulder as Davin backpedaled behind the engines. There's another exit on the back of the shuttle, Davin calmed. They're setting something up there. I've got them pinned up front. Take care of it. Mox, on three? The calm clicked affirmative. Mox carried his chest cannon, a minigun capable of lighting up the universe with hundreds of bolts per second. The man's exoskeleton held the weapon and kept it positioned right in the center of Mox's chest. Between the two of them coming from both sides, yeah, it would be a massacre. Three, two, one, Davin said, then stepped forward and raised Melody. A loud shriek sounded and the bay lit up like a supernova. The shuttle broke apart, shattered as its center turned to molten liquid. The rear, no longer supported by struts up front, fell forward away from Davin while the front did the opposite. Split fuel and coolant lines exploded into the air, a fiery fog that expanded to fill the bay burning Davin's lungs even as it singed his hair. He dropped to the ground and rolled away from the shuttle, pulling Melody with him. Mox? Viola? Opal? Davin wheezed into the comm, blinking to get the stinging smoke from his eyes. Here, pinned down in front, enemy fire. How could they even see? Davin looked towards the front of the shuttle and saw flashes through the mist. A sucking roar filled the bay, the carrot's own support system spooling up. Vents sucking away the gas. In a few seconds, it would be gone, leaving his team out in the open. Team? Viola and Opal were silent. Who knew if they were even alive? Davin pushed himself up to his feet, holding his breath, and ran towards the flashing lasers. In a few steps, he'd made it to the doorway. The giant weapon was lying on the ground. The two hijackers positioned at the front of the doorway, flinging death towards Mox not even looking Davin's way. Melody came up. Melody fired. Six green balls of fiery doom spat out of Melody's honeycomb barrel towards the two hijackers. There wasn't any sound, so the first notice the enemies had that they were being attacked was when the fire struck their backs. The superheated balls burst their sea-green Eden uniforms into flame. Both of them tried to roll, collapsed to the ground to smother the heat. Davin didn't sit and watch but closed in and kicked the sidearms away from their writhing forms, trying not to look at them. Melody's flames wrapped themselves around the pair, eating away anything remotely flammable. Clothes, accessories, hair, and on. Melody was terrible, and this called for terrible weapons. A glance at the doorway showed it to be empty, a short hallway that forked, likely to rooms meant for holding cargo. If Gage was right, Ten people went to Neptune on the carrot. That meant eight left. Melody had the ammo. Back end looks clear, 
Davin calmed. Front end is scattered, retreated. Count, I have two. One, opals. They ran when the cannon opened. Which, understandable. Mox's cannon liquefied morale as well as it did armor. The mist cleared, giving Davin his first real look at the remains of the shuttle. They weren't going home in that thing. Ignoring the gash where the laser had split the shuttle in half, ignited fuel torched the rest of it, leaving wires dangling, bent and twisted, and the engines themselves broken into shards scattered across the bay floor. If they were leaving Neptune, it was the carrot or nothing. Davin ran his eyes around the wreck looking for any sign of opal, of viola, when a whirring noise buzzed his ear. Davin whirled, swinging Melody around at chest height and saw Puck hovering in front of his face. They're in the front. My comm system is damaged, so I cannot transmit. Show me. Davin followed Puck towards the shuttle's wreckage, towards the collapsed front half, with the nose pointing up towards space. The little bot veered to the gash, then slipped inside it. Davin, moving gingerly, stepped over scattered metal plating sparking wires burning out the last of the shuttle's energy and charred bits of things he didn't recognize. Inside the shuttle, at the point where the two wrecked halves touched in a tent-like shape, the cargo section where they'd been sitting was a melted mess. The seats were no longer visible. Puck waited for Davin just inside, then moved towards the front. Between the cockpit and the back was the shuttle's only lavatory a tiny slit of a space for anyone that needed a moment on one of the shuttle's intended short jaunts. The door was open, and Puck slipped through. Davin followed, turning to look inside, and saw Opal, with Viola's arms wrapped around her, lying on the floor of the bathroom. Opal looked unconscious, stretches of her uniform black and scarred from the laser, but whole. Hey, kid, Davin said, slinging Melody over his shoulder. How hurt are you? Viola turned up to look at Davin, and he saw stains of tears through the charred grime on her face. Little lines through the dirt, and more forming every minute, like racers speeding down the girl's face. Her mouth opened, but only a chopped sob came out. Their vitals aren't critical. Opal inhaled too much gas after the fire, knocked her out. I noticed the mining laser before it fired. Opal dove into Viola, and they fell in here. The mining laser? The thing that split the shuttle. You were standing next to it a moment ago. I know. It made sense. Why wouldn't they have a mining laser on a mining ship? And why not roast invaders alive with it? Viola may need a minute, Puck said, as the girl closed her eyes and shoved her face into Opal's hair. We don't have that time. We're outnumbered and they know exactly where we are. Davin said, clicking his comm. Mox, Opal will need a hand. Swap then? Davin affirmed then turned to Viola. Listen, kid, I know this stuff is rough. You don't know how to handle it, but you're going to have to deal with that later. Right now we need you awake, alert, and not falling apart. Viola blinked, looked at Davin, and took a shuddering breath. Nodded. Davin swapped with Mox. The metal man barely fit in the shuttle even when it wasn't a wreck. Now it was a joke. Mox had to tear his way to the lavatory. Davin didn't have time to watch that, though. With Melody once more in his hands, Davin walked to front exit from the docking bay where Opal's victim lay still on the ground and peered around the corner. At the end of the hall sat a large set of elevator doors, made for handling crew and freight, gleaming silver and new. Through those doors was the rest of the carrot and seven more traders wanting to put a laser between Davin's eyes. Chapter 21 The Lost Pilot Merck landed the Viper in the cavernous ancillary bay, meant more for cargo containers than normal ships. Only the maintenance lights were on, leaving the hundreds-meter bay covered in shadows, waiting for the carrot and its ice diamonds. The Amerigo had an identical bay opposite this one, taking up most of the non-crew portion of the freighter. All that space made for easy landings, though. The Viper's cockpit popped up and Merck scrambled out, using handholds on the side of the fighter to get himself to the floor. A ladder would have been the preferred route. Could never tell how stiff those muscles would be after sitting in the cramped Viper. But Merck planted himself on the ground without falling. He tuned his comm to the Wild Nine's general frequency, but heard no noise. Which meant his teammates weren't talking, or more likely they were keeping things directed not wanting to give away anything to listeners. 
Merck twisted the frequency to Phyla's signal. Phyla, I'm on the ground in the ancillary bay. What's going on? A few seconds passed in silence. Merck glanced around the bay. The cavernous space punctuated its worn vastness with dimpled lights every few meters, white dots casting Merck and his fighter in a daybright glow. For all its size, there was only one exit, outlined in bright red paint, looked to lead back towards the freighter's bridge. He walked that way. Merck! Phyla's voice came over rushed, like she was speaking and running at the same time. Head towards the main bridge, but stay away from the jumper and the docking bays. They're taken. How do I get there? Figure it out. Can't talk. Phyla's voice cut out to the sound of something shrieking, hit by a laser and heated past the point of its endurance. The bridge it is then, Merck said as he jogged. The Viper didn't have much room for gear, so the only thing Merck had on him was a small sidearm. Close range and not very forgiving. He'd need to be precise to cause any real damage, and if he was in any firefight, running would be a better option. Still, Merck held the weapon in both hands as he left the bay. Motion lights came on in the hallway, blinking as he moved, always walking towards the dark. The first branch split the hallway with a pair of narrow signs. Straight ahead read the obvious one, bridge and bays. To the right, engineering. Gotta love a well-marked ship. Merck walked straight, heading towards the bridge, when a shout came from the other way, an angry noise, someone surprised and annoyed about it, then the shunt of a door slamming shut. Merck paused. Phyla ordered him to the bridge, but then, that might not mean much if this group took control of the Amerigo's engines. At the very least, Merck could gather intel. Backtracking towards engineering, Merck slowed his pace. The hallway split again a few meters ahead, with a double-wide door on one side. Above the door, a flat-bottomed, rounded top piece, sat the word engineering in block-white letters set against the dark green Eden color. On the right of the door was panel for badged access, its red light glowing at Merck. Merck didn't have a badge, which meant no way was he getting through that door. But beneath the panel was a small button labeled COM. Maybe... Hello? Merck said as he pushed the COM button. You guys in here yet? Waited for a breath or two. Who's asking? Came a grumbling voice, stressed, sounded like... Your boss, that's who. No reply came which meant either they were ignoring him, or the door shot open and a big man stood there, staring at Merck, holding a long, two-handed rifle in his hands, red coils tying the weapon to a strapped-on backpack power source. The man looked down at Merck and raised an eyebrow. He was wearing clothes Merck could only describe as the rejects of spacefaring fashion, a true looter's ensemble of military gear, discount trash, and knickknacks like a chain bearing the crest of the red voice. Merck took all this in, and knew the moment this gun-toting wild man realized Merck wasn't part of his group. A quick death was next. The same feeling Merck had in the Viper flooded through his bones, a cold steel that threatened to freeze out everything with possibilities lost, should he not survive. Only this time, Merck was ready for it. Treated the feeling as a warning, a sign to keep the impending disasters from exploding beyond correction. That only by acting now would he have a chance at taking those threads of the future back in his hand. Merck dove forward, pinning the man's big gun to the side and preventing its lethal nose from getting a good look. The big man grunted in surprise and pushed back while Merck pulled the trigger on his sidearm. The little gun fired, its angle also off to the side, but jammed against the assault rifle. Its laser burrowed into the larger gun, which popped and then exploded with concussive force as the gas used to create its lasers burst from its pressurized seal. Merck flew back into the wall, bouncing off and losing his air. Gasping, he looked around for the big man and saw him hunched against the opposite wall. You are so dead, said a woman, adorned in equally ridiculous fare, and pointing an old-fashioned slug-throwing shotgun at Merck. No way to win today. Merck looked at the woman and threw a half-smile. You try, you fail, and sometimes when you fail, someone's there to lay into you with a shotgun. There was a saying he'd learned back in the service. 
something the fighter jockeys muttered to themselves as a blessing against impossible situations. Give him hell, cause hell's gonna be given to you. Merck tensed his legs, ignored his burning lungs, and waited. The woman raised the gun. A strangled, high-pitched noise cried as a shape blurred into Merck's peripheral, jumping on the woman like a child looking for a ride and pushing her into the side of the room. The woman yelled, while the attacker, a short man in the dirty garb of an Eden engineer, bit at her arms and tried to throw her to the ground. Merck stood and ran at the woman's shotgun, still waving in her hand. Just as the woman tried to knock the engineer off by slamming her back into a wall, Merck reached her, grabbed the shotgun, and tore it free. Stop, Merck yelled in her face, though he wasn't sure really whether it applied to the woman or the engineer. I'll shoot either of you if you move. Merck's side exploded in pain, a rippling agony that wiped away all thoughts about what he would say to his captives next. And then, Merck was flying down the hallway, back towards the door that had opened to bring all this crap to him, and he hit the floor and bounced once before settling. The big man. That's who'd kidney-punched Merck and thrown him like a sack of potatoes. First rule of fighter flying was that you always watched your back. Remember the basics, man. Speaking of, Merck noticed his sidearm sitting there on the ground a meter away. A quick glance back towards the room showed the big man taking the engineer off the woman's back and slamming him into the ground. Fighter flying rule number two, always cover your wingman. Merck scrambled for the sidearm, feeling any second like he might vomit up all over the place. Gripping the handle, Merck rolled onto his side, aimed, and fired. The laser was true and hit the big man in the center of his back, right where the laser would do all sorts of nasty things to a man's nerves. Big and Scary collapsed in a heap while the woman traced the shot back to Merck and stared, then raised her hands. Nice shot, the woman said. I'll do the same to you if you move, Merck said, lying there. The little guy alive? The woman, keeping her hands up, looked at the engineer. Punk's still with us. A groan came from over that way, and the smell of charred flesh and clothes hit Merck's nostrils. Problem with actually being in atmosphere when shooting someone with a laser is you had to deal with the scents afterward. Hair, clothes, chemicals subjected Merck's nose to sickening waves of smell. And that was the kicker his stomach was looking for. Gross, said the woman watching. Don't, Merck said between heaves. Move. You want me to put you out of your misery? Because you look pretty terrible right now. Hostages aren't supposed to be so cocky. Merck wiped his sleeve across his face. Why not? When Backer gets here, he's going to turn you into a pile of ash. Same with this guy. The woman said, sounding bored. So if you're going to shoot me, do it now. Because you don't have much time left among the living. Chapter 22. Mechanical Offensive. The first thing Trina told Eric was to blast the doors the ones leading into the bay. Eric opened the jumper's turret and aimed it at the doors, or rather around them, and fired a few test shots. They flew into the control panels and demolished them in a shower of sparks. That at least would prevent the attackers from getting quick entry into the bay, and give Trina time to do what she needed to do. Eric, I'm going down to set up a defense. Keep me covered, said Trina. Got it. Trina ran down the jumper's ramp as soon as it opened. There wasn't going to be much time. Trina had to make it as hard as possible for the attackers to get to their ship. One nice thing about being in a giant freighter was that there's plenty of stuff to use. All around them in the bay were fuel canisters, batteries, cargo containers, both empty and full of supplies meant to be shuttled down to the carrot if the mission went longer than planned. Eric, I'm going to move some of these canisters. Let me know if they're breaking in. The doctor clicked the comm to acknowledge. Trina ran over to the first set of canisters, Old-style fuel meant for old-style ships. Ships like the shuttle that had been taken by Davin and the others down to Neptune. Hit it with enough concentrated energy and they would go boom. Lifting them wasn't possible. A hundred kilos or more apiece. So Trina leaned against the cylinders and knocked them on their sides. Rolled them over to the door and pressed them up against the wall. What are you doing, Trina? These canisters will explode. You'll shoot them when they start to come in. It should buy us some time. Eric didn't say anything else, which was fine. Trina knew what she was doing, 
Working with this kind of material was something that she handled a lot as the jumper's mechanic. Knowing what fuel would do in various situations was important when you had a lot of it stored on your ship. As Trina rolled the third canister over, a thunk sounded from the other side of the door, someone testing it. Keep those turrets trained. They're ready to fire. I'd just prefer you weren't in the way. The jumper's worth more than me. We lose her. There's no way out of here. Then we won't lose her. After a couple more trial knocks, the smell of burning electrical wires filtered into the bay. Laser cutters. Trina only had a few more seconds. Enough for one more canister. Four should be enough. She kicked it over, rolled it along the ground, the ridged surfaces making it rumble as it went along. The middle of the bay door glowed amber, heat coming through from the other side. It was going to be tight. As she got closer, a bright yellow beam burst through the skin of the doors, continuing on for a meter before petering out to nothing. Trina gave one more shove and left the canister rolling, turned back towards the jumper and its lowered ramp and ran. Get ready. Trina yelled into her calm. I am. Just get yourself on the ship. Don't shoot until they're clear of the door. The canisters will be more effective if we let them get past. We'll catch more that way. I'll handle it. Trina hit the ramp at full sprint, boots clanging against the surface. At the top of the ramp, she turned back to the door in time to see the middle section fall away, a glowing orange outline traced through the metal. On the other side, several faces look back up at her. They weren't friendly. The first two stepped through the broken door as Trina raised the ramp. She heard Eric fire. Trina paused the ramp's process, leaned out to look. A pair of the attackers were being dragged back through the door, a cloud of bluish smoke hanging over the area, no bodies on the floor. Too early. I fired when I needed to. I'm not a killer, especially an unnecessary one. Your trap has them pulling back. We bought us some time. Trina heard the words. They were logical. The attackers almost certainly wouldn't let them go, wouldn't just stop on account of kindness. But at the same time, she respected Eric's choice. The idea that he couldn't give up who he was even when dire circumstances compelled him to. Trina turned towards her cabin to grab her rifle. Just because the doctor didn't want to kill anybody didn't mean she wouldn't have to. Chapter 23. Paralyze. Phyla ducked into the bunk as lasers flashed through the corridor behind her. Naturally, the crew cabin was a one-door trap. Phyla glanced at her sidearm. The little energy left in it was enough for a couple more shots, and there were at least three attackers after her. Had been since she'd left the bays, chasing and firing with the kind of abandon Phyla saw at practice ranges. Either they didn't really care about blasting up the freighter, or had so many backup battery packs that ammunition wasn't a worry. The bunk room had the requisite cot, unmade and stained with bits of oil, grease. Someone working in the dirtier side of the ship, and not willing to keep his own quarters clean. Maybe Van, that long-haired engineer, or the surly short one. A standard Eden display built into the wall for watching movies and other entertainment on long voyages. And one side dedicated to the locker, a combination-sealed box where the guy stored his things. On the wall above the bed was a series of markings. Phyla took another second to look and realized they were days a line for every single Saul on the ship. Given the number, the engineer had been on the Amerigo for longer than just this mission, had this bunk the entire time. Now when he came back to his room, the engineer might find a burned-out corpse. Phyla gripped the sidearm and stared at it. Before, there'd always been options. Fly away, run and gun out of the situation, call in reinforcements. But all the logical next steps were gone, and here she was, thinking about using one of those last shots on herself. We know you're in there, lady, called a voice from the hallway. We're not here to kill everyone, mostly, so we'd be glad to take you alive. You prove yourself useful, and you could see yourself dropped at the next station we come to. Yeah. Give yourself up, Phyla. Just slide that sidearm out and let these fine people decide your fate for you. Phyla looked out the door, back into the hallway. Farther down, away from the chasers, were more rooms, each one spaced a meter apart from the last, alternating sides so nobody bunked directly across from someone else. That meant she only had to go a meter before dashing into cover. 
But there was nothing in that hallway. For that meter, she'd be easy killing even for the worst shot. Yes or no, we're getting impatient, the voice called. What Phyla needed was time. Time to think. To get help. She looked up next to the door and slapped the small panel. The door rushed in from the left side and Phyla hit the panel again to lock it in place. Unless they brought something strong with them, or had a master passcode for all these rooms, Phyla had bought herself a moment to breathe. Ah, oh, now that's not very polite, the voice said, coming from the other side of the door. Shutting the door on your friends like that, but that's all right. We have a way in right here, don't we? Phyla heard the crackle, the distinctive popping of a last tool switching on. The same stuff they used in their guns, only concentrated to a small, tight beam. They'd be through in a minute or two. Break the door's locking mechanism, and the whole thing would pop open. It's not like Eden had a lot of incentive to make their crew rooms durable against break-ins. I've overcharged my weapon. You break that door, I'll set it off. Friend? The last tool's crackle didn't get any closer. Hesitation. Phyla looked at her sidearm. No way she could get anything more than a loud pop out of overcharging this thing. Not anywhere close to blowing them, or herself, apart. Which meant waiting till they called her bluff. Lena, her childhood friend, would sneer at her. Calling Phyla out for being a unoriginal? Sitting and waiting to die? She'd have figured something out. The crackle got closer again. A hissing noise erupted as the laser melted into the door. Phyla gripped the sidearm in her right hand, reached over to the panel and slapped the door open. It shot up and showed the partially masked, surprised face of one very ambushed man. The guy wore what looked like a rejected costume, torn and stained from misuse, draping him in shreds of black netting. It was frightening, so Phyla blasted him in the face. The man fell back into the other two, barely starting to react to the open door. The burning last tool, still gripped in the shot man's hand, swung backward and into the body of a woman sporting an eclectic collection of exercise clothing. The fabric burst into flame the moment the last tool came near the woman's thigh, lighting up the clothes like a firework. The last of the trio stumbled away from the pyre, and Phyla emptied a second laser into him. Stepping over the first body, Phyla kicked the last tool out of his hand the automatic shutoff causing the machine to die as it skittered down the hallway. Sorry, you said you wanted in, Phyla said, looking at the trio. Steps echoed through the hallway, further along the crew quarters. Without thinking, Phyla snapped the sidearm up and pulled the trigger. The weapon sputtered for a second, then beeped, energy exhausted. Thought I was on your side, Quinn said, stepping forward with his hands raised. Don't know who's on my side right now, Phyla said but she lowered the weapon. Except my crew, and they're scattered all over this ship. Then let's get to the bridge. From there, we can find them, help them. Quinn reached behind his back and pulled out a heavy rifle half as long as he was tall, powerful enough to punch through any door on the ship or even out through the hull with enough concentrated fire. Isn't that risky? Phyla said, eyeing the rifle. I know what I'm doing. Ready? Guess that was her answer. They cut off the bays. Is there another way? Back through the crew quarters, Quinn said, turning back the way he'd come. Hey, if the bridge is that way, why did you come back here? Quinn glanced back at her. Because I'm thinking you and your crew are the only friends I have left on this freighter. Chapter 24, Aftermath When Puck told her to dive, to jump into the bathroom, Viola listened. She believed when a machine, built on cold, hard logic, told you something with absolute certainty, you listened. So she dove, and felt Opal collapse into her a second later, the sniper's head landing in her lap as the shuttle split in two. A lance of blue fire that Viola saw outside the lavatory door, shooting through with the whistling whine of materials being separated into their atomic parts. If Davin, who poked his head into the lavatory both too soon and far too late afterward, had asked Viola how she felt, there would have been no real answer. Because she didn't know how to describe being utterly powerless. Without Puck's warning, the laser would have cleaved Opal in half, would have torched Viola's face, burned away her clothes, and rendered her blind. Viola processed the thoughts, the consequences, a stream of damning data, and couldn't find any rationale for why she should continue. 
She was so, so obviously out of her league. Viola felt Opal breathing, light, but still pushing air in and out of her lungs. The fight on Eden Prime, where 4-9, an android she'd programmed to protect them, had blown itself up, taking two more of the hostile bots with it, didn't register on the same scale. It had struck Viola as comical, surreal to see machines beating each other to a pulp while she took pot shots from the sidelines. The idea of real danger never penetrated. The bots weren't after her. But here, these people, they saw her as a target and weren't afraid to shoot. Hey, we should get moving. Puck word, hovering near the remnants. I'll carry her, Mox said, the metal man breaking through the rubble and tearing off the shuttle structure that stood in his way. A moment later, he picked Opal up off of Viola, cradling the sniper in his arms. Then he spared a look at Viola, seeking any sign of injury. I'm fine, just shaken up. Mox hesitated, then nodded and moved out of the wreck. Puck hovered there, its small orb seeming to stare at her in concern. Which, yeah, the bot should worry. You take a girl out of engineering school and throw her into a death trap of lasers and explosions and expect her to take it without flinching? That's the movies. Are you? I said I'm fine. Viola interrupted the bot, stood, focused on the narrow aim, the immediate one foot in front of the other goal of getting out of the shuttle. Planting her foot, which Viola realized now was wrapped in the shreds of her boot, whose melted sole landed unevenly on the ground, she stepped around the shards of the craft that minutes ago was the only thing keeping them alive in Neptune's endless tornado of an atmosphere. Mox moved across the bay, disappearing into the exit hallway. Viola was about to follow, then glanced towards the back of the shuttle, the other ruined half. Why she looked that way, Viola wasn't sure, except wondering if both halves suffered the same terrible fate. Sitting there on top of each other were a pair of small rifles. Spray and pray shooters, Davin had called them when he'd put them in the shuttle. One was Viola's, the other, Opal's backup if the confines of the carrot weren't conducive to kilometer-long sniper shots. Viola grabbed both of the weapons, slinging their straps over her shoulders. Just putting on the weapons was a relief. Not the weapons themselves, really, but that Viola had made tangible progress. She wasn't a prone victim anymore. Rather, she was moving closer to the goal, making a difference. One second away from death, but she did not die and she was not yet done. Viola found Mox and Davin outside the door of an elevator, the call button not yet pressed. They were talking in low voices and looked up as Viola rounded the corner. It sucks, doesn't it? Davin said first. Viola nodded. My first real fight wasn't that bad. A bunch of idiots we were paid to round up in some lunar slums. They weren't supposed to be more than brawlers, and bad ones at that, but one turned out to be ex-military. Had a gun back when Luna, what with the thin shielding, wanted no one shooting. I was the second one in and watched Cadge get leveled by a laser. Miracle that he lived. Cadge was with you back then? Sure, he left the military way before Opal. Point being, I didn't take it well. Fell back into the next guy and the crew I was with had to figure out a way to disarm the bastard with me contributing a lot of panic. They finally told me to drag Cadge to a hospital and just leave them alone. What happened? Davin shrugged. We took care of them, and I got over it. Point being, it'll fade. You'll be fine. Opal needs help. Soon? That suit of yours have any bright ideas on how we get to the main deck without getting lit up by a bunch of waiting asshats? That's where the medrooms will be. Viola tried to recall the schematics of the carrot, the ones they'd had on the shuttle console and that she'd been able to look at for a few minutes before their launch from the freighter. The vessel was three levels with the bay above them. The bridge and crew quarters occupied the top. The labs and vacuum storage, to prevent any degrading of the minerals, was in the middle with general cargo, raw materials, and the engines making up the lower deck. Then let's go around. There are suits still in the shuttle, the emergency ones, two packed in the back, two in the front. The full passenger load. The free laws weren't good for much, but nobody wanted the bad press of a crew forced to let someone freeze out in space, so they'd mandated a minimum spacesuit set on every craft equal to the expected passenger count. Wait, you're saying to scale the ship, the outside? Davin said, his tone more curious than dismissive. 
I'm saying we can get in through the cargo bay, through the same tubes they get the ore from. Viola continued, both impressed with her own ingenuity and wondering if this was a really, really dumb idea. There wouldn't be anyone there, because it's a ridiculous plan. Opal. That's true, she couldn't climb, Davin muttered. But if we split... Davin and I will go. No offense, Viola, but you'll probably get in a fight eventually, and... It won't do any good if you two get down there and find a computer you can't crack. A locked shutoff on that ore intake, and you're going to have a long walk back. And I don't think Mox will fit in one of those suits. Davin glanced between Mox and Viola, then nodded. We'll go. Mox, hang out here and keep an eye on Opal. I'll calm you before we head up the elevator. It opens before then. It won't be friends on the other side. Chapter 25 Engineers. So what are you going to do with her? The short engineer asked, a look in his eyes that Merck didn't much care for. She's the enemy, right? She's a resource. Merck replied as he finished patting the woman for weapons. The scattered randomness of her outfit left all kinds of places where she could have stowed away a small gun or knife. He took off her calm, tossed it next to the body of the other attacker. You got a name, resource? The woman who'd spent this whole time swapping glares between Merck and the engineer, settled after the question, like she realized Merck would not light her up there and then, weaponless, in the hallway. Cass, the woman said. Cass. Merck chewed the name while pondering the next line. How about you let us in on what the hell's going on here? It's what it looks like. We're taking the freighter. There's a lot of us, and once some more of my group get down here, you'll be as dead as trap over there. His name was Trap. It's what he chose. And now he's dead. Guy gives himself a great name, winds up dead on the floor of a freighter looking like an ugly grizzly bear. What a life. Cass stiffened. Merck hadn't put any restraints on her. If that engineer kept talking, Merck might have to. How about we focus, Cass? Tell me, what's your goal? Mine? Cass's voice was tight, her eyes locking on the engineer even as she talked to Merck. Right now, it's to kill that man. The engineer took a breath, and Merck snapped the sidearm at him, causing the engineer to gulp down whatever dumb words were about to spew out of his mouth. That's not gonna happen, but if he keeps talking, I'll let you beat him up a little. Cass's shoulders dropped, and she took a deep breath. After a long blink, her eyes went back to Merck. We were supposed to hold the engines, keep the freighter from moving out of position. Out of position for what? Merck replied as the engineer moved towards the far wall leaning against it and giving both of them a glowering stare. Whatever ship is down there on Neptune, we're supposed to catch it when it comes up. Who told you to do that? What do you care? Why does it even matter? You're dead. Would you quit saying that? Merck said, then stepped behind her. Now here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go find my friends and you're going to help me out. I am? Yeah, because if you don't, then I'll shoot you first. Your boy trapped there can tell you what a good shot I am. The bridge... That had been Phyla's order. Time to get to it. Cass didn't put up a fight as Merck moved the two of them. He told the engineer to seal the door behind them, lock it, and not to open it for anyone. Only a moron would open this door again, the engineer replied. Just stay quiet till this is all over. You can't say you don't want to punch him too, Cass said as soon as the door shut behind them. Maybe, but here's what I really want to know. How are you so cool right now? Trap's body, lying there on the floor, was playing with Merck's senses. The idea that one day that could be him, or Opal, that the other would be left behind. It was the thing Merck, as did most of the pilots flying combat missions, thought about in abstract. Family attending their funeral, their lead saying a few nice words, the next mission without them flying on it. But it was always from a remove, an imaginary broadcast. Now, though, Merck blinked away the thought. Focus, man, or you will end up like that guy. You ever lose much in your life? Enough. I've seen so many friends burn out around me that one more barely registers. Sounds like you need a new line of work. This isn't work, it's a cause. Hijacking freighters is a cause. Cass stopped, turned to Merck, held out her right arm, wrapped in a loose gray sleeve. This cloth right here? It came from a store a place I used to go every week as a girl to see what was new, what Eden and the others sent to our town on the edge of civilization. Cass pulled the arm back, 
pointed to her shoes, which were stained, patched, and beaten, but still held together. These were her friends. She didn't need them after the first day of the war. She raised her hand and they shot her for it. Red voice, Merck said, not believing the words coming out of his mouth. You're all supposed to be dead or surrendered. One man closer, thanks to you. Wasn't my fault you attacked the ship. Keep moving. They reached the intersection where Merck had been before hearing the shouts. Cass walking in front with Merck behind, sidearm pressed to her back. Red voice. They'd started the Martian Wars, fought against the free laws, and lost. Which is what happens when you pitch a bunch of Mars townspeople against a corporate army backed by Earth's governments. You don't look like Eden, Cass said after a few minutes walking. Hired help. Don't meet many mercenaries that wouldn't split first sign of being outgunned. Guess you've been meeting the wrong ones. Maybe so. The next few minutes passed in silence until they came to the sloping ramp that carried them up to the bays. The noises coming down told Merck everything he needed to know. Stern shouts were accompanied by the bangs and shunts of supplies moving, the attackers spreading out into their new home. Going up there would mean wandering right into the middle of them. Merck pulled Cass to the side, out of sight from the top of the ramp. What's in it for you? Merck said, keeping his sidearm pressed into her side. Taking the freighter. Backer said we'd get paid. We need coin, just like everyone else. Backer. Don't worry about him. He's a problem you can't solve. Then how about this one? I need to get past these bays, past your guys. Get me by, I'll see about letting you get back to your cause. What are you going to do? Don't worry about it. It's a problem you can't solve. Cass laughed. Now run. Run up the ramp or I'll shoot you. Cass looked back at Merck, her eyebrow raised, and Merck leveled the sidearm at her face, finger on the trigger, and Merck felt he was ready to do it. He would pull that trigger and send Cass to whatever world waited for her on the other side without hesitation. Go, Merck said, and Cass went. She slipped on the ramp but recovered, stomping up. Merck belted up behind her, trying to keep the sidearm ready. The red voice started as a peaceful protest. Finished as a bloody fight with whole towns ground into the red dust of Mars. Opal told him the stories, the merciless attacks on Eden convoys where they'd find after only the smoking bodies of the innocent. There was no reason to think he'd get anything nicer. So Merck followed Cass up the ramp and shot at anything that moved. Chapter 26. Traitors. Gage stood alone on the bridge. Alarms blared around him, the freighter telling of various disasters being committed in its halls by the boarding crew. Gage could have turned them off, could have sat in silence, but his hand hovered above the button, unable to press it. This was his fault, and the alarms were his punishment. He could handle it. His wrist buzzed. Gage glanced at it, noticed it was a face he'd been waiting, wanting, fearing to see. Eventually, one had to reckon with his choices. Thank you for letting us on board your vessel, Captain Gage, said the man on the other side. Through the small screen on the comm, Gage stared at the wrapped visage. Rags. Only the man's eyes poked out, blood red and angry. He looked like that every time Gage spoke with him, as though the man's default state was harrowing. As we agreed, and you're not going to hurt my crew. So long as they don't harm us. However, there appear to be some on the ship that were not expected, some that are proving difficult. Eden saw fit to protect their investment. Then I hope none of your crew members get caught in the crossfire. I can help with that. The ones you want will try to make it here, to the bridge. We'll have a squad coming to greet them. And if that's not enough? Then I can deal with them myself. Gage swallowed. He hadn't ever seen the rapt man handle things personally, but why ask for a nightmare when you didn't have to? Part of Gage wanted those mercenaries, wanted Quinn to succeed, to drive off the attackers and retake the freighter, to arrest Gage and hold him responsible. It was only right. But the small voice was drowned out by the rest of him, the part that knew if this went as planned, Gage would have nothing to fear, nothing to want, ever again. They won't be able to get in the doors. I'll direct them toward the escape shuttles if your crew fails. Then I will make my way there. Gage, I trust you understand how much is riding on this. For me, yes. For you, I don't care. A good answer. The rapt man cut the call. 
Gage stared at the blank screen for a second. He'd never sent anyone to their death before. But then, today was a day of firsts, a day of lasts. Chapter 27 The Bridge The wide gate leading to the bridge was shut, and standing in front of it was a group of five invaders. Like the ones that had chased her earlier, Phyla saw these were all wearing their own takes on randomized fashion. Mismatched footwear, shirts sewn with different fabrics in each arm. Phyla wasn't sure of the tactic there, but if they were going for strange, then they earned it. If we hit them quick, we can have them down before they get a shot off, Quinn said. They're standing so close that our missus will hit one of the others. They're trying to blow the door. That means they might have explosives. We set one off and... It's what they're going to do anyway. Maybe. Even on a ship the size of the freighter, Phyla wasn't real happy setting off any kind of bomb. By accident or otherwise, all the electronics running between the walls and floors. What happened if the fireball knocked out the bridge's ability to control the engines or triggered a lockdown that sealed them in the hallway? Not like we have a choice, Phyla said, fighting her aversions. I'll go left, you right. Quinn nodded. Phyla hefted the weapon she'd stolen from one of the torched attackers back in the crew quarters. Stepping around the corner, Phyla pulled the trigger and blue bolts flew out at the attackers, stunning shots designed to overwhelm the nerves of whomever they hit and crumple them to the ground for hours. They were lower energy than killing blasts, and when ammo was a premium resource, Phyla was ready to settle for incapacitation. Quinn's blasts joined hers a hot second later, the dual streams catching the attacking crew unaware. They barely had a chance to turn, to raise a hand, before they were struck and piled on the ground like a bunch of passed-out revelers. Phyla and Quinn ran up to them, checking each one with a slap to the face, a kick to the side to make sure they weren't faking. Satisfied, Phyla turned to the panel next to the door and pressed the comm button. Gage, it's Phyla and Quinn. Open up. Seconds passed while the two of them waited. Quinn aimed down the hallway where the attackers would have come from, waiting for the next round. I can't do that, Phyla. You going to tell me why? Phyla said, throwing a questioning look back at Quinn, who shook his head. Opening these doors risks the bridge. You two might be hostages. You have cameras looking out here, Phyla said. That was a hunch, but even the jumper, a much smaller ship, had cameras throughout. It made sense when any breach or problem anywhere could cause all kinds of hell in space. You think all these people are taking a nap? A noise echoed up the hallway, or rather, noises. Phyla picked out the various footfalls of a squad, a bigger group than before. Reinforcements called when the first five found the door sealed. She was running out of time. Sorry, Gage said, then cut the comm. What's he doing? Phyla asked Quinn. Why wouldn't he let us through? The bodyguards stared hard at the doors, as though trying to bore holes through them. When I checked, only a few people on board this ship knew the real objective. Myself, Captain Yuan and his crew, all of whom are on the carrot. And Gage. Before Quinn could respond, with the clamber of the approaching group getting louder, Phyla slapped the comm again. The thing with sellouts, Gage, is that they always think their side's going to win. You made the wrong play. And the problem with the righteous is that they assume their enemies had a choice. Gage replied before clicking off again. Then Phyla was on the ground, Quinn tackling her as the first shots sizzled over her head. Bright orange, killing energy. Phyla rolled out from underneath Quinn and, propping her weapon on the prone body of a stunned attacker, triggered off a few retorts down the hallway. The enemies ducked back behind the corner, so her answering bolts splashed harmlessly against the wall. We have no cover here. If we run, we won't get back. I don't think that matters anymore. The freighter is lost. Lost. As in, taken over. Which meant they were way out in Neptune's orbit with only the jumper, currently nestled in the midst of enemy territory, as their only ticket home. Quinn pulled Phyla up holding his rifle in his left hand and continuing to trigger a barrage of bolts down the hallway. The attackers chose to fire blind, sticking their guns around the corner and squeezing the triggers, shots going wildly into the walls or overhead. Phyla shook off Quinn's tugging and backpedaled on her own until they were around the corner. 
What now? The bays are swarming with them. The Amerigo has several escape shuttles, small things meant to keep you alive until help arrives. The shuttles also have long-range transmitters. I can get a message to Eden from there. Which will mean what? They'll know who did this, and long after we're dead, Eden will avenge us. That's comforting. Phyla said as the two of them jogged down the hallway, taking turns back to the crew quarters. Yet again, Phyla was running away from a fight. She was getting really, really sick of it. Chapter 28. Outside. There were two men's, two women's spacesuits on the shuttle, locked away towards the back of the passenger compartment in a cabinet coated in emergency red. Snug fits, like more suits these days. They converted enough oxygen to go for hours outside, insulated well enough to allow survival on body heat in a vacuum, and, to Davin, felt like zipping himself up in a plastic bag. The suit made every interaction a little unreal. He hated not feeling what was in his hands, a wall between him and the rest of reality. The coiled tether was as big around as Davin's thumb, silver with a thick casing made to withstand direct cuts with beam knives, lasers, or space rocks. A broken tether meant someone would spin through the cosmos, counting the stars till they fell asleep as their suit gave out. You ever wear one? Davin asked Viola, who had her suit half on, her arm in the wrong sleeve. Never, Viola said. Try using the sleeves, Davin said, pressing the button to activate the helmet. From his collar, the spacesuit's neck expanded, growing over and around Davin's head. It latched back onto the suit in front, completing the seal. Then Davin released it. Always good to check that something works before he depended on it for his life. That was a joke, by the way. I don't get it. Viola replied, sticking her arms finally in the right places. We're here fighting for our lives, about to go outside into one of the most hostile environments a human can experience, after I barely survived getting immolated. And here you're trying to make me laugh. It's pathological, sorry. I just wish I could. Could what? Laugh, smile. I get it, you're stunned. But back in that hallway you came up with a good idea, one we're executing. Davin always felt, with speeches, that he was wearing his captain hat, made his scalp itch. That means you're not useless. You will not fall apart. You're still you, and damn it, you can still laugh. That's an order. Don't think I've ever heard you give an order before, Viola said, the corners of her mouth turning up as she finished donning the suit. Guess I bring out the best in you. I give orders all the time, Davin said, slipping the thick tether coil around his arm. The trick is to make people think you're just asking. Is that it? Viola replied, then noticed both of them were staring at each other, suited up and ready. So how do we get outside? Same way we came in, Davin said, walking over to a control panel near the bay's exit. The panel wasn't much more than a few large buttons. One to accept an incoming call from the bridge, one to place a call to the same. Another pair had a green UP arrow and a red down arrow. Small illustrations carved into the panel next to the two showed an open door by the green and a closed one by the red. Simple enough. Davin pressed the green one. The bay rumbled, lifts warming up to raise the bay up to disembark. A monotone voice announced a countdown from five to four, three, two, and one. Davin stepped back as the door to the exit slammed shut, sealing them in. Then the whole room rose. Davin felt the motion in his legs, but it wasn't until the black of Neptune's night broke through the sides of the bay that Davin understood what they were about to do. There's a beauty to space, where the dark is everywhere but also nowhere. Stars shine for infinity, planets looming like ornaments against the sparkling backdrop. Neptune's night was something else. Even a shut-off, blacked-out room didn't compare. Clouds filtered out most of the starlight, moonlight. The gradient gray void stretched out to an infinite horizon. The carrot kept the atmosphere from running out through the same magnetic seals used on every bay and ship. Davin and Viola walked right up to the edge and looked. The schematics had the carrot being 30 meters high, with the bay jutting up another 5 meters when it was extended. Davin had to rely on those numbers because the carrot had no running lights on. It was a sea of nothing beneath them. With the bay's backlighting, it was like the two of them and their wrecked shuttle were floating in nothing. What's our tether length? 
20 meters, pretty damn short. Almost like they weren't planning for long-distance spacewalks. Still, if I recall correctly, that's about the height of this ship. We get above that intake, and you're looking at less than 20 meters, because the openings are so high. Yeah, except we're in the middle of the ship. That intake is towards the rear. The carrot's more than 200 meters long. We'll be out of tether before you can even make the curve. So we stop and go. One moves first, anchors the tether, the other catches up. Slow, but safe. Especially if those Neptune winds picked up. The tethers themselves were designed for latches, or given the space disaster scenarios out there. Had magnets that could secure them to the sides of any modern spacecraft. I'll start. It's my idea, and I'm lighter. You calling me fat? Stop it. Viola tapped a button on her spacesuit and the helmet sealed around her head. She ran the tether through the bands around her suit's waist, keeping a meter hanging off where the magnet sat. Davin did the same. Like putting on a belt, only this one was more about saving his life than keeping up his pants. Then Davin took the magnet end, pressed it against the floor of the bay, and gave it a twist. The tether made a pleasant beep and glowed emerald along its length. They both watched the color make its way along the tube until it reached Viola's end. Any break in the connection and the tether would go red, a signal that they were not, in fact, tethered anywhere at all. Viola took her magnet and stuck it to the floor in the same fashion. This time, the tether's color changed to a bright blue. Double connection. Their way of signaling when it was time for the other to move. They'd have their comms, too. But the colors provided that moment-by-moment -moment accuracy. Ready? Davin said. Viola gave him a thumbs up, disconnected her tether. Then, with her helmet up, the girl stepped through the magnetic seal and dropped out of sight. Chapter 29. Blow the door. When someone comes charging out of nowhere, shooting lasers at your face, there are two kinds of surprised reactions. There's the prepared version, where the waiting force understands the charge is coming and meets it with its own hail of return fire. Then there's the unprepared version, the surprise Merck liked to think of in capital letters. The surprise that's so unexpected that the mind stalls out and nosedives into the planet. With Cass sprinting in front of him, yelling that Merck was an enemy, and Merck two steps behind taking wild shots with the sidearm, the raiders weren't prepared. The scattered group of people in the hallway, some still holding crates unloaded seconds ago, others looking at schematics and trying to decide where to send people, were not ready for a crazed counter-assault. If he hadn't been fighting for his life, Merck would have laughed at the diving people as his shots blew charred chunks out of the walls. One blast caught a mercenary in the shoulder and the man looked at the smoking hole as though he couldn't believe it was actually there. Past the first bay, the jumper had landed in the third. The next group of Red Voice fighters at least had their guns out. A few wide shots came Merck's way, fired from people trying to take cover. They aimed around Cass, or didn't shoot at all when they saw her coming towards them. The two of them passed the second bay, this one connected to the frigate, through a boarding tunnel. More invaders were on their way through, too many to fight. Even if all of the Nines were here, they wouldn't be able to repel these guys. Merck kept running. There was a set of five attackers outside the door to Bay 3, taking cover not from Merck, but from fire coming out of the bay. Trina and Eric playing defense for the home team. Now the attackers turned at Cass and Merck, changing their portable energy shield, a green rectangle, to block Merck's incoming pot shots, which left their flank vulnerable. Eric, let it rip through the door. Merck shouted into his comm as he triggered another shot with the sidearm. This one, instead of the deep red most had been up till now, was a lighter, pinker shade. Energy was running low. It only had to last a few more seconds. Shrieking, exploding pops poured into the corridor ahead. Cass stopped dead, and Merck ran into her, sending them both sprawling as lasers from behind zipped by. A lucky break. Merck rolled off of Cass and looked towards Bay 3. Fire and smoke blanked the corridor, the end result of Eric's blast-happy use of the jumper's turret. The path ahead was clear, but the steady stream of shots from back behind them made getting up suicidal. Clever, but not good enough. Cass muttered, pushing herself away from Merck. You can surrender now. We might not kill you right away. Tempting, but I'll pass, Merck said. He didn't have much time for a solution. To think, 
A month ago, he'd been floating free in space above Europa, waiting for a slow, sleepy death to come for him. Now here he was about to get violently shredded by hot energy. Given the two, he'd... Wait. Space. That was it. Eric, I need you to blow the doors on the bay, kill the magnetic seal, then get ready to play catch. What are you doing? Cass said, eyes opening in alarm. Got one last trick, Merck said. His comm clicked, and the pilot dove forward, rolling towards the bay three door. He couldn't tell if Cass followed or not. Shots hit the surrounding ground. Hard to hit a rolling figure in smoky haze. And then Merck's ears nearly exploded. A fizzling bang, and Merck felt like he was being pushed by the invisible hands of a huge mob, shoving him forward into Bay 3. Behind him, the freighter initiated its standard response to vacuum leaks and tried to seal off the section. The Bay 3 door was already blown apart, so it went to the next available spot and slammed down the secondary doors between Bay 3 and Bay 2, and the hallway continuing on towards the bridge. Merck registered the shutting doors out of the corner of his eye as he blew through towards the jumper. The blocky ship looked so, so lovely, though Merck wasn't sure if that was because it was the only thing standing between him and, in a minute, frozen death out in pure space, or because it was the one thing he'd seen in the last hour that wasn't trying to kill him. Cass was nowhere to be found. She must not have followed him forward. No time to dwell on that, though. Merck bounced off the floor and continued rolling towards the metal shield closed over the bay's main exit. In the middle of the door was a series of holes, punched through and glowing orange around the edges from the jumper's lasers. The air was being sucked through those holes with enough force to whip Merck across the ground like a tornado. And if he hit those holes, Merck knew the force would break his bones to pieces, or, if not that, other small objects would shoot into him like bullets. Too reckless, that's what Opal would say. Trying something this stupid. Merck continued sliding across the floor, pulled towards the door. The current towards the holes carried Merck beneath the jumper, under the nose of the cockpit and nearing the main body. The ramp was still up, and for good reason. Opening the thing would just cause everything in the jumper to get sucked out, which left one spot for him to get in, the jumper's airlock. As Merck blew by the ship, he reached out and wrapped his arms around the jumper's left rear landing strut. A thick steel leg connected every meter by joints and paralleled by an electric-powered arm that would fold the strut in during liftoff, the thing had plenty of handholds. The problem was that as Merck held on, he could feel his muscles strain, his wrists crack as the sucking force tried to yank him out. Climbing to the airlock like this would be impossible. Eric. Merck said into his comm, shoving his face into his left wrist. Docking airlock. Even shouting those words left Merck gasping the fleeting air for breath. The freighter wouldn't be pumping any more oxygen into the bay, which meant that in a few minutes there wouldn't be anything breathable left in here. If there was going to be a rescue, it had to happen soon. Trina's on her way. Eric's voice came through the comm. Stay steady. I'm on the back left strut. She'll get you. See, Opal, sometimes the ideas work out. Cocky pilots aren't always wrong. Merck shut his eyes, focused on his grip, until he felt tugging from above. Merck glanced up, and in a spacesuit, tethered to the latch in the airlock, was Trina and her bright blue hair. Hey, hotshot, need a hand? Merck tried to reply, but couldn't seem to pull in the air to do so. He settled for a nod. Spots, little black flecks, were dancing around his eyes. Same stuff that happens when he pulled high G's in atmosphere, doing loops, tight rolls. Merck didn't even notice as Trina wrapped spare tether around him, then punched the button to retract them into the jumper's airlock. By the time the ship's outer door shut, the pilot was unconscious. Chapter 30. Last Man. Mox leaned Opal up against the wall to the right of the elevator door when the button dinged and turned red. The up arrow. Davin and Viola only twenty minutes gone. Not enough time. The cannon was ready, wound up and able to spray too many bolts too fast. Mox positioned himself in front of the doors slightly to the left. They would aim, by reflex, dead center, and any quick shots should fly right by Mox. They wouldn't have time for a second chance. 
Another ding sounded as the elevator arrived. Mox heard the latches on the doors pop, the slow, grinding slide as the elevator opened. In the center was a small box, not much larger than Mox's own booted foot. It sat towards the front of the doors. Mox blinked. He'd seen this before. Open it, the sergeant told Mox, pointing at the black gem-studded box. My wife's remains, the man wailed, but didn't move from the bench. Sarge's glare was more effective than handcuffs, promised more hells in the fiery glint of his eyes than any resistance was worth. Mox picked up the box, squat and square, a few centimeters wide and tall, but it was heavy. Mox almost grabbed it with both hands, but that would be weak, not in front of Sarge. The top of the box was secured by a simple flip latch. Mox flicked it open, the man's protests going weaker. Inside, a pile of flaky dust. Relief, shame flooded Mox with equal measure. Nothing, Mox said. Sift the dust. But? If those are the remains, his wife won't care. Mox looked back at the box, pressed a finger into the dust. The grains stuck to his gloved hand, bits of another person on him now. A little deeper, and Mox hit something hard. The bottom of the box? Mox cocked his head. What is it? Sarge asked. The man on the bench was sweating now, his eyes wide and staring back Mox's way. The remains aren't the only things in here. Sarge took two steps over to Mox, grabbed the box out of his hands, jammed their standard-issue EMP device in, and pulled the trigger. Then Sarge tipped over the box. The powder fell like black snow to the floor, and through it crashed a tiny circuit. It hit the ground and shattered. First, rookie. Those weren't ashes, explosive powder. Second, the most dangerous thing on a space station is a bomb. You can blow it up, sure, but it can crack a hole and suck out your air fast. Burn up the oxygen and create a fire impossible to put out. Lunar law states any package can be searched. Use it. Trust it. So Mox dropped the cannon, detached it from the exoskeleton, and dove towards Opal. He landed and pulled the sniper to him, his back and the metal plating of the exoskeleton facing the door. A second later, the elevator blew up, a small controlled explosion that sent a wave of heat and pieces of shrapnel bouncing off Mox's back. Cuts lanced pain through his arms and legs, nothing major, meant to kill a curious man, not a cautious one. Small chance of punching a hole in the ship. Mox turned back towards the elevator. The cannon was ruined. Close enough to the blast, the barrel was bent out of shape. The nozzles, sending the gas to generate the lasers themselves, splayed on the ground like dead snakes. The elevator wasn't much better. The floor buckled, tiles opening into a hole down the shaft, with sparks spraying out from split wires. But Opal still breathed. Mox relaxed his grip, pushed Opal back against the wall, and stood. Like feeling a twinge from a strained muscle, Mox felt a drag in his legs, a resistance. Suit status, Mox said, activating the exoskeleton's internal systems check. A moment later, the suit rattled off a string of greens for Mox's upper extremities. The batteries checked out, but the left calf buzzed a red, non-functional, which meant the left foot wouldn't be able to transmit anything either. Mox moved his left leg to look at the calf, saw the piece of shrapnel jammed inside of it. The jagged piece, a set product, stuffed inside of the bomb as a nasty surprise for anyone a few feet further back from the explosion. Mox reached and yanked the piece out, pulling with it the tangled remains of wires. There wouldn't be any boosted jumps happening anytime soon. As Mox tossed the extracted piece away, a clang sounded behind and below, down the shaft. More came after, not loud enough to be explosions, metal on metal, and the sounds were coming closer. Time to move, Mox said, bending over and trying to pick up Opal. His arms handled the added weight without flinching, but as Mox straightened, the exoskeleton tried to adjust the load balance and failed, leaving Mox feeling as though his left side was being dragged down. Opal wasn't heavy enough to cause Mox real trouble, but walking became a mental exercise. His right leg moved, stepping forward without pause. The left required effort, resistance with every movement. But they had to get to cover. Mox could hear voices coming up the shaft now. Must think their bomb took care of everyone up here, which said they weren't well-trained. 
Mox shook his head. Always assume your enemy is still alive, ready to fight. Mox had his sidearms, one attached to each thigh. Not that he could grab them with Opal in his arms. The exit to the shuttle bay was closed, leaving Mox trapped in the hallway. Davin and Viola, they must have raised it. Calling it back might ruin their plan, or snap the tether and send them both flying off to surf Neptune's skies for a brief few seconds before death. The hallway itself was smooth, rectangular lights, glowing silver embedded into the walls. No cover. Mox set Opal down near the door, checked again to make sure she was still breathing. Viola's little bot said the sniper hit her head when the shuttle cracked. Could have used her here. Fast, accurate trigger fingers were handy in situations like this one. But no time to wait, now. Back at the elevator, Mox heard them cutting away the ruined floor. Chunks of tiling, broken up by the bomb, dropped away as someone armed with a last cutter made a hole. One sidearm in each hand, both set for stunning. It used less energy than the killing shots, and with the time Mox had, it'd be almost as good. Besides, his fists could always end things later. The first hand appeared, gripping the outer edge of the elevator, gloved like a mechanic, thick and gripped, probably the one with the last cutter. Mox shifted out of view. Better to let them get fully out. Surprise the group before they could react. Softer noises now as at least another two clambered out of the hole, supporting themselves in the remains of the elevator. Mox tightened his grip. A quick one, two, three. Inhale, go. Stepped around the corner, the angle widening and bringing three hijackers into view, each one sporting the same outfit. A thick working garb that looked ready to withstand temperature extremes. Full helmets with masks covering their faces. Great to keep themselves safe from cold wind. Mox pulled the triggers, the sidearms blasting blue-purple bolts into the bulky suits and doing nothing. Sorry, mate, the lead one holding a sidearm of his own said. No luck with those? Then he raised his sidearm and Mox saw a flash, then nothing. Chapter 31, Wind. Viola had never been on Earth, never seen one of the tornadoes that terrorized small towns in movies. She'd seen the Great Red Spot, the storm blowing its way for centuries across the surface of Jupiter. Storms were a concept she had, but Ganymede, a moon with only a light, human-generated atmosphere, had none. So when Viola dropped from the docking bay onto the carrot's exterior and felt the wind tug at her like an enraged vacuum, she stood for a minute and embraced nature's beating. Even with the only real light coming from her suit, a lamp embedded in her upper chest, the darkness itself grabbing at her, Viola laughed. A helpless laughter, one tinged with knowing if the tether snapped, the spacesuit failed, or Neptune decided it wanted her dead, there was nothing she could do about it. Still, here she was, in one of the most violent natural environments humanity had ever encountered. Best get to exploring it. The tether glowed green, still attached up where Davin was standing. He was probably wondering if Viola had fallen off the ship. Neptune's gravity, as strong as Earth's, helped keep Viola on the sloping side of the carrot, like walking on a hillside. Not enough to keep Viola going when things went full vertical, but for now? Viola took a step, then another. The wind pushed back against her, but at an angle, like moving through syrup or rushing water. Every motion a physics problem. I'm moving aft. Viola spoke into her calm, already set to short range and Davin's personal frequency. It's a bit breezy. Copy. Keep it safe out there. The spacesuit played Davin's voice into her ears, where Viola could hear it over Neptune's roar. Viola kept moving till the carrot started its downward slope, curving towards a drop-off, and eventually, those intakes. They were staying parallel with the bay, where the hull was as flat as possible. She went out with her right foot, then found she couldn't go any further. Time for the first tethering. The piece with the magnetic attachment flopped behind her suit. Viola grabbed it, crouched, and jammed the magnet against the carrot's hull. Designed for use in space, Viola wasn't sure how they'd perform in Neptune's harsher climate. But after a second, the tether flashed blue. Ready to go? Viola calmed. 
Getting ready to detach now. Viola gripped her end of the tether. The most dangerous part. Her linked end would give Davin a chance if a gust of wind blew him in the wrong direction. Viola wasn't sure how the magnet would hold up under Davin's body weight and the planet's wind snapping the man away from the ship. The carrot's hull was smooth, nothing to tie the tether to, so Viola held on as the tether flipped from blue to green and waited. You weren't kidding about the wind, Davin calmed a few minutes later. Remind me never to come here for a vacation. Right now, it's not bad. I'm clocking it at a little over 70 kilometers an hour. I think Neptune can get way over ten times that. Puck would have had the stats for her right away, but they'd left the bot back at the shuttle. Its little jets wouldn't have been able to keep up with the wind. Now that Viola thought about it, this was the first time she'd really been away from Puck since she'd taken her father's ship off Ganymede. Standing there, with nothing other than a splash of metal green hull visible from the suit's lamp, and all the rage of Neptune out beyond, she wished the bot were there, saying something sarcastic. You're saying I should hurry? Yes. There's no chance we're not swept away if one of those two storms comes close. Davin appeared like a ghost, a yellow-white light filtering through the black, and suddenly an arm was grabbing hers. Viola turned as Davin stamped his magnet and the tether went blue. I'm going over the side this time. Viola said as she coiled the tether. Should be able to make it to the intakes, if we're lucky. Popping off her magnet, Viola walked the sloping hull. She had to stick her feet, planting them to get whatever grip the hull could offer. A few steps after that, Viola held the tether tight in her hands, released a bit more with every footfall. How's it holding? Looks green to me. I've got a grip on it, too. Yeah, like Davin would be able to hold her on the ship if the magnet failed. But if that happened, they'd both go flying off anyway. Viola had spent her entire life dependent on technology for survival. Ganymede required scrubbers to keep oxygen in the air, radiation shielding to keep Viola's genetic material from fraying into oblivion. Here, though, with that magnet the only thing keeping her alive, Viola wished for more redundant systems, maybe a jetpack, or the shuttle, so long as she was dreaming. The edge of the hull sat before her something Viola only saw because her lamplight petered out into nothingness rather than reflecting light. Viola supposed what came next would be like mountain climbing, bracing her feet and hopping down the side. She'd done it once as a virtual reality exercise. You ever done this before? Climb the side of a ship? Sure, dozens of times. Just never one this big, at night, in a windstorm. Any tips? Don't fall. Thanks. Viola took a deep breath. Here I go. Because she'd already been supported entirely by the tether, Viola didn't feel a big change in how her weight was distributed, still very dependent on that rope. Only as she dropped, the wind pushed her back towards the ship. The tether caught on the lip of the hull, the pointed aft end of the oval, and Viola hung in space. The blowing wind treated her like a pendulum, shoving her forward until Viola's weight overpowered the wind's push and sent her rocking back. Every time this happened, Viola released a little more of the tether, dropping a few more meters down. Feels like I'm in my own world, Viola calmed. It could have just been a thought, but Viola really, really needed the sound of a voice. Her lamp caught nothing. And while Viola could feel the wind pushing, could feel the rocking of the pendulum, there was no sign of where she was. Vertigo snatched at her, causing her mind to spin and churn, unable to figure out where she was or how fast she was moving. Rock back. Inhale. Drop a few more meters as she swung forward. Exhale. Repeat. Until, on a forward swing, Viola's lamp hit something that wasn't Neptune's air. It was black, but solid, coated with dust. Viola had a second to look at it before the pendulum effect brought her back. Only this time, instead of dropping, Viola held steady until the wind shoved her forward again and took a clearer look. I'm there. The intakes? Think so. I'm going to let loose on the next swing. Brief visions of action movies. The film stars jumping from ship to ship, building to building, swinging through vast jungles. How many of them would have been able to pull this off? Let the remaining coil of the tether out at the apex of the swing and launch into the intake? If I miss this, tell everyone I tried. Just don't miss it. 
I'll keep that in mind. Here goes. The wind shoved Viola forward again, one more long arc through the black. The lamp caught the edge of the intake as Viola swung up, and she let the coil loose. For the first time, Viola felt the brief weightlessness of free flight, the release from Neptune's clutches. The question was, where would she land? Chapter 32 Escape Where were they going to escape to? Phyla kept replaying that question and not finding a good answer. There wasn't a habitable space station for millions of kilometers, the closest one she knew of being a research outpost near Uranus. The odds of other ships passing by this deep were almost nil, and that's assuming those ships wouldn't run at the first sign of a hostile force. What's your plan? Phyla said. A shuttle would be suicide. As an escape, yes, Quinn replied, continuing to jog through the hallways. As a back door into the main bays, perhaps not. You want to land on the other side of the freighter and, what, hijack one of their ships? I'm glad you're not as simple as most mercenaries. Was that a compliment? Phyla said between breaths, running behind the Eden agent. Yes. Quinn held up a hand as they reached the next corner, and Phyla stopped before rounding the wall. The shuttles are around the next side. It sounds like we're not the only ones with this idea. Oh, I think we're probably the only ones with your idea. Phyla muttered. Listening, she heard the beeps and shifts as someone prepped a shuttle for launch. Launching the small craft would require a passcode entry, followed by a short series of prep steps. In a true emergency, the ship's computer could remove the lock and warm up the engines. With Gage on the bridge, though, there was no way that was happening. If they're getting it ready to go, then they must be crew. The invaders wouldn't know the passcode. Point. I'll go first. Quinn went around the corner, rifle raised. Phyla followed, giving herself distance. Around the corner, the hallway widened into a broad rectangle with the right half facing back into the body of the freighter, covered in racks of emergency supplies, spacesuits, and other gear necessary if one wanted to make a sudden interstellar jaunt. A series of benches served as intermediaries between the right and left halves, with the left wall sporting four airlocks, each one only large enough for single-file entry. The shuttles were on the other sides. As Quinn moved into the room, he snapped his rifle up and looked about to squeeze off a shot when he paused, staring to the right, where Phyla couldn't see. So you're who Gage is working for? We all have our masters, came the reply, a lilting voice that sounded like a clarinet played through a waterfall, distorted. I would know yours. Doesn't matter. Think I can shoot you before your pals can get their arms up? Phyla didn't hear a reply, didn't see a gesture but Quinn pulled the trigger. His gun sent out a series of shots, and Phyla took the moment to swerve around the corner, ducking below Quinn's firing line and searching for a target. Arrayed against the back wall, supply lockers behind them was a trio of enemies. Quinn shot at the center figure, a larger, thin man, the target's face covered in twisting, roping scars, the two flanking him wore the same mishmash of fabric, random accessories, looking more like piles of junk than real people. Quinn shots hit the scarred one, but vanished as they homed in, dissipating as though sucked into a black hole. Portable shield, Phyla said, aiming at one of the other targets. They weren't moving, but Phyla didn't argue with a sitting duck. Her rifle went off, and once again, the laser seemed to disappear as it closed in on the guard. They're not all shielded, Quinn said, lowering the rifle slightly. That'd be too expensive. Eden, always thinking the only currency is coin, the scarred man said, then held up his right hand. The two flanking members of the trio swept open their clothes, stitched together into robes. Beneath, each one held a twin-pronged device that looked like a large fork. Before either Phyla or Quinn could move, the forks shot lightning, a white-blue spasm that flashed through the space between them and crashed with a twitching force. Phyla dropped her rifle as her arms and legs contracted and stretched at random. Quinn fell next to her, writhing on the hard floor. Phyla had been stunned before, felt the numbing loss of contact with her own nerves, as though her arms, her hands belonged to another body. This was the opposite, all her nerves on fire and activating at once. There wasn't any controlling it, her mind overwhelmed by the commands coming in from every corner of her body. 
Even her eyes blinked rapidly. Her lungs gasped for breath after breath, barely starting an inhale before forcing it back out again. Toes curled and opened while her calves tightened as though for a jump, then relaxed again. For livestock, the middleman said. So much more effective than a stunner. I trust you see why. Gradually, Phyla gripped her own body and understood. Stunners often knocked their victims out, if only through heads slamming to the floor in surprise. They were also less effective if you trained to subvert them, to know how to move without feeling your own limbs. That and stunners were obvious. The forks didn't look like sidearms, didn't look like they could cause disaster. Gage told me you're the most dangerous person on board. Eden really has become fat and careless if you're all they can afford. Who are you? Quinn asked, sitting up. Be careful, the man said, walking forward. Sudden movers have a way of finding themselves shocked. That's not answering my question. You can call me Bucker. The man, as he leaned over Phyla, staring up into his face, those dark brown eyes framed by red, angry scars. The random horror of a severe burn. An injury Phyla saw plenty growing up in Vagrant's Hollow. People playing with scrap machines, trying to turn trash into treasure and torching themselves when it went wrong. Backer's own mishmash robe was a patchwork of whites and grays, cloth fashioned from a dirty blizzard. The light colors played against the burned body to play with Phyla's eyes, so she almost didn't see the clothes, just the flayed arms, hands, and head floating on their own. And who's paying you? Ah, uh, the Eden man lacks politeness, acquires a name but does not give his own, Backer said, stepping over Phyla to Quinn. For shame. Backer kicked, his right foot swinging forward and connecting with Quinn's head. The bodyguard fell back, hitting the floor, silent. What do you want? Phyla said. She could feel the fire dying in her nerves. She could move if she had to, could reach out, grab the rifle, and maybe roll to a shooting stance before Backer could get to her. The man's two guards weren't doing anything, just standing there with those shocking tines displayed. Backer might have to command them. In which case, if she could get the drop on him... You're not Eden, are you? Backer said, moving back to her. Don't have the attitude, the look you've signed your soul away. My soul away? Who talks like that? Keep his attention on the words. On anything other than her eyes, measuring the distance to her dropped rifle. Her tensed muscles. Getting ready for the role. Someone who has spent far too many years riding the desert of space. Backer replied, the lyric tone swinging low. But if you are not Eden, then you must be one of the others. The extra security, like the pilot who tried to attack us earlier. Give the man a prize. I already have mine, and unfortunately, you are not it. As Backer's foot came forward in another kick, Phyla rolled away from it. Her left hand reached out as she completed the roll, gripping the trigger and twisting her shoulders, pulling it back across her body and pointing it right in Bakker's angry face. Too bad, Fila said and pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. The rifle clicked and no laser appeared. Bakker didn't vanish in a burst of fiery energy. Yes, too bad indeed. Do you know your weapon requires a catalyst, a burst of electricity to actually form the laser? Fila opened her mouth for a crack but Bakker's left hand shot out and gripped her throat. With far too much ease, Bakker straightened, pulling Phyla up with him. My friends here, their tools shock, trip and trigger the nerves like so many piano keys in a concerto. Bakker dragged Phyla across the floor, towards the escape shuttle doors. Your guns are no different. In front of one of the shuttle pads, hand still around Phyla's throat, Bakker tapped a series of buttons on the keypad. The door beeped, spun and then split in the middle to open the airlock to the escape shuttle. Phyla tried to talk, but with Backer's hand around her throat, she couldn't do much more than suck bits of air through her nose. Backer swung his arm forward, then released, throwing Phyla into the shuttle. She hit the cushioning with a soft thud, hand going to her neck and rubbing away the impressions dug in by Backer's bony fingers. Neptune is a harsh planet, Backer said, his hand continuing to type on the keypad. Beyond opening the door, the keypads could also set coordinates, important for sending people less versed in astronavigation off of the freighter. I hope you find it welcoming. Why? Phyla coughed. Why are you doing this? Backer paused outside the shuttle door, blinked at her. A guard handed Backer a fork, and he pointed it towards Phyla, pushed the trigger. 
Phyla ducked, and the bolts flew over her, striking the shuttle's small control console, which fizzled and went dark. The same reason as you, to survive. Backer slapped a button on the outside keypad and the airlock. The shuttle's interior lights came on, a clean white light, and a voice warned Phyla to strap in. Two seconds later, Thrust pressed Phyla into her seat as the shuttle blasted off of the freighter and towards the cold dark of Neptune. Chapter 33 Hunted Her body didn't wait till the pain vanished to wake her up. Opal blinked her eyes open to a blurry world and shut them again. Not ready yet. Only she didn't have a choice, did she? In scattered fragments, the shuttle's ambush, the mining laser, the call of Viola's bot Puck to jump. Disaster. Where? Opal breathed, eyes opening again and taking in the hallway, the shut door to the raised bay next to her. Someone had brought her here, left her, and without a weapon. In between the paralyzing moments of headache, Opal shifted to a crouch and checked her pockets. The only thing she had left was the trusty beam knife strapped to her inner thigh, still dangerous. A faint noise from the hallway. Voices followed by a clanging thud as someone, something hit the ground, heavy and metal. Opal held her breath, listened. Take him down, a voice said. How do you expect me to do that, carry him? See that suit? It'll protect him for a story. Just drop the bastard. Suit. Opal didn't recognize the voices, which meant these probably weren't friendlies. Davin and Mox wouldn't have left her alone anyway. And if they had Mox, then they'd probably come looking for her. Opal turned to the control panel and slapped the down arrow. No idea what it did, but anything was better than staying here. I'll say you told me too, he gets killed. The second voice continued. On the other side of the door, the carrot rumbled. Levers shifting a lot of weight and grinding past each other. It needed to move faster. Doesn't matter to me. But it might to Bakker. Bakker, oh. That name. That name rang a bell. The sounds grew louder, hissing, joining in as valves released pressure. The noise churned through the hallway, picking up echoes along the walls. Opal tried to forge her way past the noises, past the headaches. Bakar. The name brought with it swirling red sands. A list of targets. Someone's lowering the bay. The voice broke her concentration. It was closer now. Quick, drop him, then catch up to us. Focus, Opal. Time for memories later. Flattening herself against the door, Opal kept her eyes glued to the corner of the hallway. What she needed now was an excess of caution. You don't know what's around this corner, guys. Take it real slow. The voices stopped talking, probably realized that it was bad form to sneak up on someone while running your mouth. The door dinged behind Opal, then shot up. Opal nearly fell over, backpedaling to keep from meeting these guys on her back. Once she'd picked up her balance, Opal ran to her left, out of sight of the hallway. In front of her, the shuttle's wreckage sat in pieces. The bay. Hey, hey. Came a whirring noise. You're awake. Puck. Opal said, looking up and seeing the bot hovering above her. Quick, where's a weapon? You want Davin's shotgun, it's over here. Puck buzzed across the bay, towards the shuttle's aft, the opposite way Opal had gone. She would not risk cutting in front of that hallway again. Instead, she made her way over to the shuttle's nose, still pointed up from the imbalance caused by the mining laser. At least there was a strut here to duck behind. Opal saw the hallway's edge, the opening to the bay. A second after, she peered out from behind the strut. A body, then two, both wearing heavy welding suits, walked in. They were holding small sidearms, but holding them with both hands, each one looking a different direction. Whatever their outfits, they were armed heavy for mechanical work. The two of them weren't moving fast, taking their time in the middle of the hallway. If she'd had her rifle, they would have been easy targets. Split, one welder said. His suit lacked the spots and tears marring the second's outfit, and his voice matched the one giving the orders. Without thinking, Opal dubbed him Alpha and the other Beta, the same style of designations they gave targets on Mars. Alpha broke towards the aft of the shuttle while Beta cut to the nose. In a few seconds, Beta would either see Opal or step on her. When that happened, Opal would have a hot second of surprise to get that beam knife into Beta's face. Hey, what's that? 
Beta said, pausing in his approach to look up in the air. It's a bot. Opal tracked Beta's look and saw Puck hovering above the shuttle. You want to know who's in here? Puck buzzed. Its voice turned up so it filled the bay. Because I'll tell you if you promise not to blow me up. Hear that? Alpha said to Beta. We got ourselves a bot with a self-preservation instinct, so talk, bot. We won't torch you. Their eyes were on Puck, so Opal slipped between the strut and the body of the shuttle. Visible for a moment, Opal pressed herself against the shuttle's body and took a breath. Puck was rambling above her, talking about Davin and Viola, and some crazy story about them jumping out of the bay with suits on. Opal inched closer to the split part of the shuttle, where Aft and Bao crumpled together. But it sounded like someone just came in here. The door opened a minute ago. All me, I'm afraid. Brought the bay down to pick up my friend, the one with the exoskeleton. Opal peeked through the hole between the shuttle's sides. Nobody there. Another quick step, and she was by the aft section. There, just past the engines, laying on the floor, was Davin's favorite shotgun. Why would the captain have left it here? It made little sense. Whatever the reason, Opal mouthed a silent thank you and picked up the weapon, slipping the beam knife into a slot on her belt. Puck must have been keeping a mechanized eye on Opal's progress, because as soon as she had the shotgun in her hands, the bot floated towards the door. There was one other person, but she went with Mox, the metal man. Then maybe she's back here. But if you're trying to mess with us, you'll be scrapped before you can fly yourself away. Puck protested as Opal made her way back across the shuttle's other side, too far away for Melody. Their sidearms had more range. They'd fillet her if she went into the open. It was either through the shuttle wreck or back around the nose. I think this bot's playing us, boss, Beta said. There's nobody back down that hallway. It's a dead end. Last chance, bot. Where are they? No time. Opal stepped through the wreckage of the shuttle. Too many broken bits of metal meant she couldn't run through, finger on the trigger, blasting away. Almost there, Puck. Keep stalling. Okay, you got me. It's my programming, you know. Can't fight it. I have to protect my owners. Opal didn't see the shot, didn't hear the sidearm, but she saw Puck crash to the ground and roll, sparks popping off in all directions as its circuitry fried. You just got your own bot fried. Now come on out and I promise we won't do the same to you. Opal leaned out of the shuttle, shotgun pointed towards the pair and pulled the trigger. Six green balls of flaming energy shot out towards Beta and Alpha, who took a step out of the way before the balls rammed their suits. Opal chased after her own shots, watching as the balls burst apart on Beta and Alpha. The flames crawled around the thick armor, but the shotgun's energy didn't appear to be burning through. That didn't mean it was worthless. Sticking her left foot and, and turning her right shoulder, Opal swung the shotgun like a bat. Beta, still wreathed in the green flames and flailing, didn't even try to dodge the strike. Probably didn't see it coming. The shotgun smashed into his head, the rubber-like helmet doing nothing to soften the blow. The man crumpled to the ground, and Opal pivoted, readying the shotgun for another swing. Alpha, still burning, was ready for it. His left hand caught the shotgun as Opal pulled it back up and ripped it from her hands, throwing it across the bay floor. Alpha's right arm, holding the sidearm, came up towards Opal's chest. Opal let her legs slip out from under her, and as Alpha fired, dropped to the ground. The stunning blast flew over her head as Opal kicked her right foot up into Alpha's groin. He groaned, left hand moving to shield, and stepped back, sidearm waving for another shot. Opal curled her abdomen and somersaulted forward, left hand grabbing the beam knife out of her belt as she rolled. Alpha, still backpedaling, pointed the sidearm at Opal as she finished the move. Opal lanced out with the e-beam knife, swinging toward the sidearm as Alpha pulled the trigger. The sidearm exploded, the focused energy released as the sliced front half fell. The force blew the beam knife out of her hand, launching it across the bay. Released, stunning force washed over Opal and pushed her to the floor, numbing her left arm. Alpha stared as his ruined weapon, any facial expression hidden by that helmet, and then threw it away. Know what's funny? Alpha said to Opal, still on the ground. We were supposed to keep the body count low on this mission. Deaths put blood on the product. Then what the hell are you doing? 
You don't work for Eden, do you? Trying to back herself up, Opal's feet pushed against the smooth floor. Alpha followed, loomed over her, his hands low, arms ready to block a kick. The problem here was leverage, a chance to stand up. If Opal didn't find some soon, she was dead. Does it look like I do? It doesn't, which means nobody's going to care if I smash your face in. Opal felt the shuttle behind her, hard against her back. Nowhere to run. Alpha drew his fist back, and Opal braced herself. Chapter 34. Cargo Hold. The tether's blue line buried itself into the black void a few meters into the distance. It went forward, then the tether slanted and disappeared as it went over the carrot's aft edge. So the plan is I descend the tether to you, then we detach and reel it in? Davin said for the third time. Not that he was afraid. Definitely not. He'd been shot at, stabbed, on a ship ready to explode in space. He just didn't want to fall into Neptune's miserable sky. He'd get what? A few minutes of falling before the core melted him to pieces? Or maybe the swirling wind would pick him up and whip Davin around with such high speeds that his suit would rip and he'd freeze, a human icicle surfing Neptune's atmosphere. Right. You will adjust your latch. Loop the tether through your suit rather than hooking it on. That way you'll be able to slide along it. Viola's calm was fuzzy, punching through the carrot's hull and Neptune's cloudy air to get to Davin. Should be easy. Easy. Gunfights were easy. Talking down over confident jerks over payment was easy. Davin grabbed the tether, anchored on the hull, and popped it loose. The cable went green. Davin loosened his latch, allowing it to slide along the tether. He ran the line back and forth, confirming it moved easily. Next time this happens, it's Mox's turn. Captain, are you nervous? Thing about being the captain, Viola, is that it's your job to understand the ins and outs of every situation. But you let me go without asking anything. Thing about being the captain, Viola, is that you have to trust your crew to do their job. Viola's sigh came over the calm. No sense of humor. Sealing the tether back to the hull changed the color back to that secure, calm blue. Davin followed that light, hands touching the tether, letting the coil run through his fingers, and then gripped as his feet slipped. When the drop-off came, Davin slid over and dropped. Wind blasted harder here, dangling from the coil. The darkness hid his speed. Davin judged when to grip the tether based on his stomach dropping, depending on the suit's gloves to keep the friction from burning his hands. The coil curved back under the hull's outcropping. Davin risked a glance back that blue lifeline extending up behind him, like a mystic cable to a god. You see most of the planets in the solar system, sunsets on the outskirts of Jupiter, and a million other wonders, but that simple sapphire curl going into the blustery dark took its place high on his list. I think I'm gonna make it, Davin calmed, sliding along the more level tether. Were you worried? Definitely not. Dropping into the actual intake of the carrot was a non-event, from one level of dark to another. Feeling his feet on something real again had Davin breathing easier. Spacefaring mercenary or no, there wasn't much to compare with solid footing. Not to mention seeing Viola, another person, after the last hour walking alone through the Neptune night. The girl was already retracting the tether. The color went from blue to green to orange as Viola wound it up. Ought to get one for the jumper. Bet you could keep this one. That shuttle doesn't exactly need it anymore. Look at you, keeping your eyes out for freebies. Might make it on this crew yet. Davin walked up the intake while Viola finished coiling the tether. It felt strange walking into a hostile environment without Melody and her protection. But he'd have to grab the shotgun later. Too much risk of an untimely fire when bouncing along the tether. So here he was, dependent on his old hands and feet if a hijacker showed. But nobody did. Davin walked through the narrowing intake until he arrived at the gate. There wasn't anything Davin could see outside it. No panels, only hard metal plates. He'd seen enough ships to know that this was where the raw material would come through. It'd only open if the carrot went into mining mode. Ideas? Davin asked as Viola walked up behind him. There's no emergency access? Viola said, looking around the door. I can't imagine. 
for repairs, they ought to have a release. All of my dad's ships, the ones Galaxy Forge makes, have them. Maybe Eden's got another contractor. The implications weren't great. No way in meant they were stuck here, their oxygen dwindling. And if hijackers decided to bring the carrot out of orbit, then the two of them would be so, so very cooked. They needed help. Davin looked at his comm, scanned for frequencies. Mox and Opal didn't pop. The carrot's hull too thick. Then a static burst filled his suit, the same cascade of sounds from before when they were landing. Opal had said it wasn't just noise, though. Viola, that message? The one we intercepted when we got close? The one telling us to run? Where'd it come from? What spot? I don't know. It was a wide-range broadcast. I wasn't exactly focused on tracing it. Viola said, continuing to poke at the door. I'd try the bridge. It'd be the most secure spot. Davin nodded. One guy in a choke point could hold out for a long time. Davin tapped on his comm, trying to find the message's source. Neptune's atmosphere had little in the way of satellites to guide the comm in its choice, so Davin's comm could only give a general direction. A dot in a three-dimensional sphere appeared on the comm's small screen, with green colors shading likely sources for the broadcast. Using the spacesuit's gloves, Davin traced the path he wanted to send the transmission. Hello? Is anyone receiving this? Who are you talking to? Don't know yet. Davin replied and listened. Yeah, came back a minute later, probably debating whether it was a good idea to talk. It was scratchy, the signal losing definition as it cascaded back through the carrot's hull. Who is this? Your rescue team, who is, uh, in need of rescuing, Davin said. Sure, there was a chance it was a hijacker, but what did Davin have to lose? Gage sent you? This time the reply was instantaneous. Sort of, more like Gage's boss sent us. Good, because Gage is a traitor. Interesting, Davin said while doing all kinds of mental gymnastics. Traitor to who? Could be either the hijackers, Eden, or something outside either one. Better to keep the guy on the line by being agreeable. I'd love to chat about that more in person. Where are you? Actually, and this might sound weird, but stick with me. We're in your cargo intake, and by that I mean we're locked out of your hold. Seems like you have an infestation of the armed and dangerous kind, and we didn't want to walk right into them. So you want in the hold? That's the idea, yes. Once you get in, there's not many options for getting here. They all lead through the cafeteria where the traitors have set themselves. Find another way. Send another communication when you reach the bridge, and we will talk again. A second later, the intake's door shunted open, the body tilting outward forcing Viola to step back. On the other side sat a small tunnel. They'd have to crawl. Deep inside, Davin could make out a glow. Blue-white. Diffuse. Great. Something else he didn't understand. Chapter 35. To the Rescue. The shuttle turned and tumbled, twisting Phyla in her straps as she tried to restart, tried to get anything out of the shuttle's console. Nothing responded. The flight stick stuck. The screen stayed blank, and out the front viewport, Neptune loomed larger and larger. There was only one tool left. Gage? Phyla said into her comm, flipping the transmitter to the captain's signal. She'd only have a minute until they were too far apart for the comms to work, but there was a chance that Gage could capture the shuttle. Either through a remote takeover or salvaging equipment meant to latch on and pull metals in from distance. Your signal is light. Are you calling from that shuttle? Yes, bring me back. Why would I want to do that? Last I recall, you're my enemy. The man had a point. Phyla definitely had a punch waiting for Gage the next time she saw his face. But there were conditions that superseded her anger, like imminent death. I met Backer, in the freighter. He doesn't want to keep you around. He's insane. Come on, Gage. Let's hope you haven't met the guy. That you're pliable. Backer has a strong reputation. The terms we agreed to are favorable to him. Besides, even if I wanted to, this freighter has nothing that could pull you back. Enjoy your flight. Phyla almost screamed as Gage cut the communication, turned back to the console. Think, Phyla. Backer's weapon would have sent a high charge through the component, probably tripped a fuse, broke the circuit. Where would that fuse be? 
In an emergency shuttle, there weren't many places to hide things. In the center of the floor, a meter away from her, sat a panel labeled with the universal sign of mechanics, a yellow wrench wrapped in a circle. Two small hinges sat on either side, easy to open, if the shuttle wasn't tumbling in circles. Undoing the straps here wasn't a good idea, but that panel looked like her only shot. Fila took a breath, finger on the release for the straps, and pressed the button. There was no gravity, but the panel moved with the rotation. The outside of the shuttle turned faster than Phyla was in the middle, so she had to increase her own spin to match the panel's speed. The straps! Phyla's lower straps were hanging there in the shuttle's air. Phyla grabbed them as they blew by and tugged. As soon as the spin caught up, the straps pulled Phyla forward, sped her up to match the shuttle's turn. It was dizzying, but Phyla kept her eyes focused on the panel until it felt like she wasn't moving anymore. Adjusting her grip, Fila pulled again on the straps, propelling her forward towards the panel. Hello out there. Phyla's calm crackled. That you on that shuttle, Phyla? The sudden noise made Phyla twitch, her eyes looking at her calm and nearly missing her contact with the panel, but her hands caught on the raised outside, then getting a grip on the hinges, which were built into notches on the floor. Phyla finally focused on her calm. It is. Who's this? Your favorite fighter jockey. Merck's voice coming through clear. Flying this hulking boat of a ship. Tell me, Phyla, how can you stand it? The jumper controls like mushy. Shut up. Are you coming? Fast as this thing can go. We got a problem, though. Looks like you'll hit atmosphere in one minute. We won't reach you for five. By then you'll be too deep for us to follow. Get Trina. Trina? Do it. You got it. Merck said, clicking off. Phyla looked at the hinges, pulled on the top one. The panel swung out. Phyla pulled on the other handle and released her grip. The cover floated out from under Phyla, helped along by a push from her hands. Beneath was a big collection of wires and a small panel blinking that a fuse popped. Problem was, where was the fuse? Trina here. Where's the fuses on an emergency shuttle? Depends on the model. You have a few different variances based on the year. Don't care, I opened the mechanical panel looking at a bunch of wires and a box telling me the fuse is blown. Oh, that's easy. Just pull back on the screen. Phyla reached towards the blinking screen. It pulled up, showing a rack of fuses. One labeled Flight was popped out. Phyla pressed it back in, shut the box, looked to her right and saw the shuttle's flight console glowing with life. Trina, you're a genius. Helps when you're right there, but, uh, Phyla, you'll want to change your trajectory or you're going to slam into Neptune and explode all over the place. Thanks for the warning, Phyla said, swinging herself back to the flight stick. Plenty of fuel in the tank, seeing as the shuttle had just been using Neptune's gravity up till this point. Phyla tapped on the burners and, first things first, stopped the maddening spin. She felt a slight tug on her legs now, the touch of Neptune's gravity, meant she was getting to where Neptune's atmosphere would roast the shuttle where doing any big move would cause friction far above what the shuttle could stand and send the whole thing towards Neptune's core in a meteor shower. Pulling up on the stick, Phyla swung the shuttle's viewport towards the stars. Triggering the rockets, Phyla watched the fuel drain as she pushed every ounce of power the shuttle could generate from its engines, had to stop the descent, then pick up enough speed to bounce off the atmosphere. Looking good, Phyla. Merck's voice came from the comm. Keep doing what you're doing and you'll be back our way for an easy pickup. The shuttle shook. It was still descending into Neptune's gravity. And right now it would belly flop into the atmosphere. Not good. Fuel was at 20%. Not going to make it. Phyla said, continuing to press the burn. Need you here faster. Can you evacuate? No suit. No suit? The hell you doing, Phyla, getting into an evac shuttle without a suit? Long story. Ten percent. Trina's telling me there's another way. Keep burning. Save two percent of what you got. That wouldn't be hard. Five percent left and the shuttle was still falling too fast. Phyla let the burn go for another couple of seconds and then cut the engines. The console still had her dropping towards Neptune. Even if out of the window, the only thing Phyla saw was space. Trapped between two environments that would wipe her from existence in a few seconds. Out of fuel. 
Depending on a fighter pilot trying to get a freighter in atmosphere it wasn't meant to handle, Davin would definitely freak out right now. What's the plan? Phyla said after a few seconds of silence. Or did you forget about me? Phyla. Trina's voice came over the comm. I need you to do exactly what I say. In your hands. Tap the red box on the right side of the console screen. The one labeled emergency? That one. Okay, I've got a few options here. Is there one for fuel dump? Trina's voice said she knew there was, and more, exactly where it was on the screen. I don't have much fuel to dump. It'll be enough. On three, you're going to hit the button. It'll open your fuel tanks, we'll shoot them, and you'll blow up. Say again? Upwards, away from Neptune, sorry. The shuttles can handle a lot of violence before they'll leak. It should kick you up far enough for us to grab you. Trina said, as though describing to Phyla the principles of simple math. Three. Not a fan of this one, Trina. Two. Phyla steadied her finger over the button, stared straight ahead out at those twinkling stars. If she would be incinerated, then damn it she would appreciate the view one last time. One. The shuttle made a shunting noise, a clunk as the fuel tanks opened, and then Phyla flew back, crashed against the back wall of the shuttle as everything flew forward with too much force. Some part of her, several parts, cracked on impact. Phyla tried to yell, scream anything, but the air would not come through her lungs. Her mouth stretched back, vision blurred, everything in various states of pain or numb shock. She was going to die. Only the shuttle's viewport didn't show the stars anymore or at least not all of them, a large shape blotted out the view, getting closer by the second. The pressure dropped as the acceleration fell away, and Phyla floated off of the wall again in near zero gravity. The shuttle's console was flashing and beeping at her, declaring all sorts of impending hell if Phyla didn't get herself out soon. You still alive in there? Merck asked over the comm. Because that looked rough. Here. Phyla whispered, lungs still grabbing at any air they could hold. There we go. Get ready, because you're coming home. The jumper filled the viewport, and Phyla saw the ship turn, angle its docking bay towards her shuttle. Phyla did not know how fast the shuttle was moving, but if it hit too hard, it would thrash the jumper, ruin the ship. Phyla crawled, moving her sore arms and legs to grind her way to the front. Merc, you have to deploy the webbing. I'm going too fast. Yeah, that was the plan. Only now that I'm looking around, I don't know how to do it from here. The only trigger is in the bay, and if someone doesn't pull it, we're all dead. Phyla said, the jumper blotting out the last of the stars in the shuttle's sky. Chapter 36. Dodge Kick. Alpha's first hit caught Opal on her left arm as she moved it in front of the punch. The second one was a low left. Trapped against the shuttle, Opal took the shot to her stomach. Another right to her face, and again Opal caught it with her arm. Pain blossomed along her wrist, up towards her elbow. One or two more, and she wouldn't be able to get her arm up in time. You know, I don't feel bad about this, Alpha said, then switched tactics and delivered a kick to Opal's right side. The blow pushed her over near the crack in the shuttle, her back half against the opening. Hitting a woman? See, that's it. You're not a woman. You're just an enemy. Alpha replied, then leaned in with another right. Opal didn't raise her arm this time, instead jerking her head to the side. Alpha's swing carried through the space where Opal's arm would have been, carried through the space where her head had been, and flew on into the empty space splitting the shuttle halves. Following his punch, Alpha overbalanced, leaning forward and reaching out with his left hand to catch himself. Opal rolled onto her side and kicked with her right leg, hitting Alpha in the knee. Without his hand supporting him on that side, Alpha's leg bent and the man fell over. Opal jumped on him. You're right. I'm just an enemy. Pressing Alpha's back into the floor, Opal used the leverage to pop herself back upright. Again with her right leg, Opal delivered a quick kick to Alpha's head. The man grunted and fell limp. Two unconscious hijackers. Opal glanced around. Not a lot of options here. She could raise the bay again, shove them out through the magnetic shield. Opal looked at the prone bodies and shook her head. Even if she could move them in their outfits the whole way. No. There were enough bodies in her past. Didn't need to add any more. Beta, 
still out from the shotgun beating, had a sidearm. Opal grabbed the gun, noted it was already on the stun setting. Taking off their helmets, which felt more like full cloth masks, Opal shot both of them. Should keep them out for hours, long enough to either take the carrot back or die trying. Puck was a fried mess. Opal picked up the dented bot and saw nothing. No spark, no sound of any activity. The bot's body didn't look entirely worthless, though. Viola probably had a backup, could restore Puck once they got back to the jumper. But there wasn't any room to carry the body with her now, so Opal dropped Puck's shell near the hallway door. Shotgun in one hand, sidearm slotted into a waist holster, Opal wandered down the hallway. Using the comm might have been a good idea, but that would have meant talking. Would have meant giving herself away, just like Beta and Alpha did earlier. So Opal stayed silent, slipping around the corner and looking at the broken-up elevator. Aside from the carrot's running noise, a steady hum punctuated by occasional clanks and shudders whenever the ship executed a shift, there wasn't a sound. Opal crept closer to the elevator, setting her feet heel to toe to kill the noise of a normal footfall. Nobody jumped out. Nobody fired a gun. Nobody threatened. Looking down in the elevator, Opal saw a ladder, circular rungs clinging to the side of the shaft, which was lit by the same pattern of in-wall lights illuminating the hallway behind her. It wouldn't be hard to drop through the hole, climb down the ladder and see what was waiting for her. Doing that would make her vulnerable, though. The shotgun would have to go over the shoulder, while the sidearm, in a holster on her waist, would be difficult to draw with her arms on the rungs. A smart ambush would wait until she was on the ladder, an easy target. Only, what choice did she have? Opal swung the shotgun over her shoulder and slipped her feet through the hole. Angling them over, her feet found the rungs. Then, left hand gripping the base of the elevator, Opal dropped through. Immediately her arm pulsed in pain, Alpha's punches causing Opal's grip to slip. She stepped one leg to the next rung, then the other. Just one more, and Opal would be able to grab on with her right. Come on. Left leg down another rung. Right leg. Opal leaned to grab a rung, left arm holding the base of the elevator and aching like it was going to pull itself apart. The shotgun, looped over her shoulder, slid as she leaned. Unbalanced. The strap caught on her right wrist. Opal's left hand slipped, her right not yet gripped. Had to lose the weight. Opal moved her right hand as she slipped off of the ladder, and the shotgun and strap fell. Snapping her lightened hand back, Opal steadied herself on the ladder. The shotgun bounced from rung to rung, landing on the lower floor with a ringing bang that ran up the shaft. Who needed surprise anyway? Opal jumped her way down the ladder, holding the outside of the frame and moving multiple rungs at a time. Had to move fast because if someone came to investigate, there wasn't going to be any chance of her fighting back. The elevator shaft wasn't large, the carrot not being a huge ship, and the main point of this elevator being to move people up to the bay loading area. Opal hit the base of the shaft a few moments later, still alone. It would have made more sense to ambush her on the ladder, so she probably had a few moments to breathe. If they weren't covering the only route deeper into the ship, these people were either very trusting in their comrades or not well-versed in common-sense tactics. Down the hallway from the shaft, Opal passed a series of crew rooms. Decked out in plain beds with smatterings of personal stuff here and there, barely enough space to lie down. One small locker for belongings. The carrot wasn't built for long journeys then. You'd have a bunch of people going crazy with this little room to themselves for so long. After the crew chambers, the hallway angled towards a wider space. Conversation came filtering up out of there, so Opal slowed, listened. So what do you want us to do with the guy? Someone up ahead said, sounding tired. He's got no value, you sure? A pause. Opal creeped on, sticking to the side of the hallway, up to a doorway. The cafeteria blew out into a space with a pair of long tables, chairs, and a back wall full of storage for the standard bland meal packets small ships held for flights. Along one wall, an altered reality screen flickered between scenes of Earth. Opal could see the edge of a mountain vista, but her eyes were drawn to the center. Tied to a chair was Mox, 
head up and glaring. One of the hijackers stood near him, a small assault rifle pointed at their captive. The other one, the speaker, stood staring at Mox with his back turned to Opal. Nobody saw her yet. Consider it done. We'll hold the ship until you're ready for us to come up. The speaker lowered the comm and turned to the other one. Shoot him. Chapter 37 Blue Gold The ice diamonds were azure waves crashing together in single stones, blue and white flowing around each other in mesmerizing tangles, pressurized deep in Neptune's core, miniature worlds all their own. Viola stared at the piles of them, grouped in large bins in the otherwise gray and featureless carrot cargo hold. Beyond the blue glow of the diamonds, scattered halo lights illuminated the hold with pale, frosty light. Now it makes sense. There's what, a few thousand in here? For all of humanity? These things are going to be so expensive. I want one. I'm sure Eden will give you a discount if we get their shipment back intact. You think so? Stay focused, Viola. True. They didn't have control of the ship just yet. Viola tore her eyes away from the diamonds and moved to the cargo hold exit. Behind her, the intakes poured out into a pair of empty bins with narrow walkways running between them. Just enough to squeeze by, shift the deposit around, and move the next bin along. It looked like when the carrot was ready to unload, the crew could reverse the intakes, suck the diamonds out, and spit them into a waiting buyer's hands. The exit opened into another corridor, the same slate gray with embedded lamps that Viola was becoming too familiar with. After this, she'd go back to her father at Galaxy Forge and demand they never make another ship with the bland hallways again. Paint them a different color. Shift the lights around. Add artwork or etched design. Anything to keep the soul-crushing sense of industrial efficiency at bay. The two of them made their way out, stopping when the corridor dead-ended in front of an elevator. So we went all the way around the ship to wind up at another elevator? I didn't promise it would work, but I bet they won't be expecting us to pop out of this one. Not like we have a choice anyway. Davin pressed the button and twenty seconds later the doors popped open. Viola had been tensed, ready to dive forward or run if there was a mess of gunmen hanging out behind those doors, but an empty elevator sat in front of them. Shall we? Davin said, waving Viola forward. The elevator had one option, main level. Davin gave Viola a glance, then pushed the button. Only sidearms, and they were going right towards a group of people who didn't hesitate to use a giant mining laser to disintegrate them. Viola breathed faster, her arms and legs tightening up, outgunned, again. Don't think about it. When the doors open, stick to one side. Only shoot if you have a clear target. Let me work the room first. Viola nodded. Let Davin work the room. Shoot, if there's a clear shot. What did that mean, exactly? Did that mean any opening? Only if the enemy was going to shoot Davin if she didn't? Kill or stun? Stun. Lower energy. More shots. We can always do the other one later if we have to. The elevator dinged. They'd arrived. Viola took a breath as the doors opened, and she saw Opal running into the wide room yelling. The scene planted itself in Viola's mind. Mox, tied to a chair in the middle of the room. A hijacker behind the metal man, gun pointed at his head. Another pacing the room, turning towards Opal. And a third, there in the back, getting water from the reclamation machine. Opal had run right past that one, maybe hidden from view from Opal's vantage point. Davin reacted first, pulling the trigger on his sidearm and sending a blue bolt straight into the side of the man, one twitch away from blowing Mox into oblivion. Opal popped the big shotgun next, sending the green bolts at the pacing man, knocking him to the ground. Viola felt her hand on the trigger of her sidearm as she aimed across the room at the third man, who was pulling his own rifle up to shoot Opal in the back. The trigger felt hard, tight, a pulse down her hand. The gun shook as chemicals mixed, energy ionized and sent forth, an orange beam lancing in front of Davin, behind Opal, and catching the third man in the chest. Viola saw the burst of flame, the charred moment bursting out as the laser burned through the man's uniform and sent him crumpling to the ground. Viola lowered the weapon as Davin ran out of the elevator towards his target. 
Opal moved to Mox, ignoring the burning man on the ground beside her, covered in dying green fire. Come on, move! Viola kept her eyes glued on the man she'd shot. Twitch, roll over, something. She moved out of the elevator. In the side of her eye, she saw Mox stand, put a hand on Opal to steady himself. Davin busy taking the cords they'd used to tie Mox and already tying up his man. Viola's target still hadn't moved. No sign of life. Viola put the sidearm in her holster, her fingers slow to let go of the handle. If he was dead, then she'd been the one to kill him. Kill him. Part of her blasted rationalization after rationalization. He would shoot Opal. He'd already chosen when he'd hijacked the carrot, but behind every reverberating excuse was Davin's voice saying stun, saying stun. And then the elevator dinged, and Viola hadn't flipped the setting, had reacted. Had done precisely what trained soldiers, professional mercenaries, aren't supposed to do. The man's mask was pulled down, showing his wrinkled face, matted gray hair, eyes shut, cheek pressed into the ground where he'd fallen forward. No blood, the wound cauterized by the heat of the laser. Viola reached down, pulled the man's gun away. None of the hardness of death had settled in, and his fingers slipped out of the rifle's grip, fell to the floor with the tiniest of thuds. Who was he? Where had he come from? And had he expected to die today? Viola suspected the answer was no, but he had. Because of her. Viola? Opal asked coming up behind the girl and putting a hand on her shoulder. You all right? He's dead, Viola said. It's possible she was missing a sign. Viola worked with machines more than men, after all. Opal leaned down, put a pair of fingers inside the man's shirt, and pressed them against his neck. Gone, Opal said. The word hit like a hammer, Viola's lungs squeezing. She closed her eyes. Viola, he wasn't your first? Viola only nodded. There had to be some protocol here, something she was missing. Was Viola responsible for contacting his family now? Was she a lawbreaker? Was Viola still herself? Opal wrapped her in a hug, gripped her tight. Hold on to what you're feeling. Never let it go. You lose it, and you'll lose who you are. I don't understand. I was protecting you. And you did, Viola. Hell of a job. He would have had me. There's nothing worse than taking a life for no reason. And you saved mine. Thank you. Viola heard the words, internalized what Opal was trying to say. The man's body laid there, and looking at it, Viola could only think of one word. It ballooned in her mind, knocking every other piece of her aside. Killer. Chapter 38. Crash Landing. The shuttle hit the webbing with more force than Trina expected, but the webbing held. It was designed for the Viper, a much heavier craft. Simple math, really. Merck, of course, would have been better served telling Trina ahead of time that the plan called for the webbing. As it was, the bay was still full of containers and tools for maintaining the Viper, and the shuttle barged through them. A charging container spilled its batteries across the floor, black bars looking like bugs scurrying to freedom. A severed fuel cable spewed rainbow sparks until Trina, running over to the source, cut the power. Forewarned is forearmed, Merck. Trina said into her calm. The shuttle sat, smoke pouring from its engines as their hot temps came into contact with the whiskey jumper's atmosphere. Scraps jagged their way along the shuttle walls, and Trina noticed, along the previously pristine bay floor. Davin wouldn't be liking the cost to fix this one. I hear you. Is Phyla alive? Ah, good point. The shuttle had both fore and aft exits to allow for a crash landing of the pilot's choice. Trina went for the nose exit, pressing the release and stepping back as the windshield detached and rose away. No pressurization safety here. The minimum for survival, these shuttles. Peeking in, Trina noticed Phyla sprawled out on the shuttle's floor, breathing. Alive, but Eric, I believe you have a patient. And to think here I was wondering if a doctor even had a place aboard this ship, Eric replied. Please try not to move her, I'm already on my way. Trina stepped into the shuttle glanced at the console. A newer model, with that quality screen there. Eden, taking care to outfit its ships with good gear. Who'd have thought? Phyla, Trina said, for once not holding her wrist up and speaking into it. 
the feeling was strange. You became so used to speaking to those that aren't there that interacting with a physical, live person was disconcerting. Here. Fila muttered. I don't want to get up. Eric wouldn't want you to anyway. Given your incoming velocity, the tardiness of the webbing deployment, I'm still putting it as lucky you survived. Thanks. Then Eric was pushing past Trina, talking to Phyla and checking to see which muscles hurt the worst. The problem with bodies is that it's all relative, no exact degrees. Trina climbed out of the shuttle, moving towards the aft. The shuttle would not fly again, but that didn't mean she couldn't find some useful parts in those engines. Chapter 39. To the bridge. So I think we've solved your mutiny problem, Davin said into his comm, standing outside the sealed door to the carrot's bridge. They're all literally tied up or unconscious back there. Opal and Mock stood behind Davin and Viola behind them, keeping a watch down the hallway towards the cafeteria in case they'd miscounted, or one of Opal's victims had returned to the world of the conscious. Not a bad count, all told. Neutralizing six mercenaries without a single real casualty? Viola hadn't even batted an eye when Opal said Puck had been shot, said she could have the little bot back up and running in an hour once they got back to the jumper. Hello? Davin said, and the door slid open, vanishing into the carrot's walls. On the other side stood a shorter man, all black hair and beard seeming to glisten in the artificial light, like the guy doused himself with grease every morning. It keeps me young, the man stated, noticing Davin's stare. I am Captain Yuan San Ye, and as is custom, I give you permission to board my ship. Davin Masters, Davin replied, catching Yuan's offered hand with his own. Sorry we didn't get here earlier. Things were, uh, hectic. It's nothing. However, I would appreciate it if all of you remained outside of the bridge, unless one of you is a pilot. What? If you had recently been betrayed by your crew, including several whom you considered friends, perhaps you too would feel cautious before letting them into your home? He's got weapons on us, Opal blurted. Behind him in the corners, a pair of... Yes, the carrot keeps its bridge safe, for exactly our circumstances. Greed, it seems, is a universal problem one that Eden saw fit to prepare for. And you're going to what? Shoot us with those? On either side of the large command console sat thin, reed-like rods. On the top of each was a dome with a tiny point sticking out. Those points aimed at Davin and Mox. They are concentrated beams, tiny yet potent. They will lance your heart with enough heat to make you burst into flame from the inside out. Please, time is pressing. Do you have a pilot? Are you one? I can fly, Viola said. But why can't you, if the carrot is supposed to be so secure? Davin asked Yuen. Yuen gave Davin a slight nod. Levels of skill. I can glide carrot along the roads of space, but leaving Neptune requires more talent than I possess. You think you can fly this thing? Davin said to Viola. The girl looked at nobody for a moment, thinking. Davin felt she'd done well with the shuttle. Done a fine job putting the cargo hauler on Europa during their comeback assault, but the carrot was larger than both. Neptune, a more complicated atmosphere. But that was how you grew, right? Put yourself in new situations? I can try. Doesn't sound like we have a choice anyway. We do not. The rest of you should leave. Secure yourself in the cafeteria. You will know when we rise. Viola, you comfortable being alone with this guy? He tries anything. I've still got this. Viola said tapping the sidearm clip to her waist. Then Yuen was shooing them off the bridge, the door sliding shut a moment after Davin stepped into the hallway. Not what I expected, Davin said as Opal and Mox stared at him. Stupid, growled Mox. Agreed. Didn't hear either of you two saying anything in there. Now let's go make sure none of our friends want to play again. Chapter 40. Reunited. The carrot's console was digital. No buttons, no stick for piloting. Instead, virtual sliders appeared on the screen as Viola hovered her hands over them. A killer, maybe, but the ship didn't seem to care. Surrounded by a pair of storms, the carrot was still in a precarious position. It didn't have much choice if it wanted to get out intact. Viola expanded the fingers on her left hand, and the left screen shifted from a close view of the carrot to the atmosphere surrounding the ship. Viola brought her hand away, closed it, then reached in and expanded it again. 
Now the screen was pushing out past the edge of Neptune's atmosphere, the fuzzy limit of the carrot sensors. A blot out past the atmosphere shaded a slight yellow, an indicator that the carrot's computer believed the shape was a ship. To the Amerigo. While you are new to Neptune's atmosphere, I have been here for some time, Yuan said, nodding. Trust me, a little goes a long way here. Tapping the blot on the screen, the console drew out a path for the carrot to execute. Much faster than the shuttle, the carrot's calculations came back with the precise speed, tilt, and fuel burn to make a rendezvous with the freighter. When the calculations wrapped, a green oval appeared towards the bottom of the screen, imploring Viola to tap it and start the course. Why did you need a pilot? Viola said, looking at the circle. The computer did it all for me. Then perhaps I did not, but there are chances I choose not to take. Please, start. Is that why Eden chose you for this? Because you're cautious? Because I don't let my ego get in the way of my crew. That didn't work out so well. I was prepared to counteract bribes of coin, but not of cause. Cause. Yuan looked at her. You don't have the eyes of the others, hardened and wary. Yours are still wet around the edges, still being formed. I'm new to this, Viola said. Wet around the edges. Who was this guy? One day, you will find something to believe in, something to fight for, and then you will understand the ones you hurt today. Viola nodded, tapped the button. No time for this mystical talk right now. A countdown appeared, and various system checks spat their output to the console. If any of the carrots bits and pieces weren't ready for the rigors of the journey, the computer would cancel the course. Viola figured the trashing of the docking bay wouldn't interfere with any critical pieces of the ship, but when everything came back green, she felt relieved. She wasn't sure what they would have done if the carrot had some sort of failure. Can you tell me what happened? Viola said as the carrot shuddered, its orbital engines warming up for the first time in days. How they took the ship? Yuan, who'd been staring out the front viewport into the nothing of the Neptune night, nodded without turning around. It started, Yuan began, when my friends died. Chapter 41, Mutiny It was easy work, done in shifts, supervising machines, fixing broken parts, monitoring Neptune's storms and making adjustments as necessary. Ten of them trading turns. Only Yuan and Silwa, the pilot, stayed out of the cargo hold and the intake valves. Juan, the lead engineer, supervised the other seven and kept them rotating through food, mining, and maintenance duties. The mining itself was a series of short excavations, plunge the carrot into hot, pressurized depths of Neptune's inner core, and suck up the solid diamonds, then move to the next area after an hour. They repeated the process for a week without problems, a week of watching more coin than any of them expected roll into the carrot's cargo hold. And it was towards the end of that week when Juan first cornered Yuan, there on the bridge. Silwa was sleeping, her next navigation shift not due for several hours yet. I am seeing a change, Juan said. The crew are quieter, fewer smiles. You count their smiles? Their morale is a resource like anything else. It is my job to manage the resources. And morale is low? We are almost full. We'll be returning to orbit in a day. They'll be back with their friends and families in a few weeks. Yet morale is low. Yuan accepted the statement. Common sense said to wait it out. So little time until circumstances changed. The flight back to space would keep everyone too busy to think about morale. At dinner that night, a shared experience with the whole crew, Yuan reminded everyone that they were nearly done. That it was an amazing feat they had accomplished. That they should be proud. Silwa raised her glass a poured bottle of fizzing wine saved for an evening like this one. Juan joined the toast, as did the others. What do you think? Yuan asked Silwa later, back on the bridge. He'd told Silwa what Juan had mentioned, told the pilot to keep her eyes on the others at dinner. They had no joy in them tonight, Silwa replied. As though instead of toasting our success, they were watching their own souls die. You are always so dramatic. Raise the ship tonight, away from the core to the halfway point. They will have tomorrow off to look and see the sun again. That night, Yuan fell asleep listening to the rumble of the carrot's engines. There were no nightmares, 
no sounds of struggle, yet the carrot's computer triggered an alarm. Hours before the scheduled time, an indication that the bridge's defense mechanisms had been armed. An error, Yuan muttered to himself, pulling clothes on and stepping out from his quarters. Adjacent to the bridge, part of Eden's devotion to security, Yuan walked the short private hallway to a second door. Yuan's hand went on the scanner and after a short beep, the door opened. Silwa lied on the console, a small line of smoke rising from her chest. Over by the bridge's main door, the body of one of the miners, weapon in hand, sat against the wall. The main door, according to the security measures, had sealed itself. Yuan first went to Silwa, her stomach a black mess of torched flesh. But perhaps it was not fatal. A cauterizing laser wound is often more survivable than the hard, tearing pellets of older weapons. Silwa's breath still came lightly, in and out as Yuan picked her off the console, carried her back down the short hallway to his bed. Then he ran back to the bridge, checked the miner's body to confirm the bridge's defense systems had done their job, and tried the comm. Juan? Yuan sent a tight-beamed message to the engineer's direct frequency. Are you awake? Real sorry, Captain, came a voice that was not Juan's. Juan didn't see things from our point of view. No point in asking for more information. The dead miner's sidearm, set to kill, was more than enough evidence. And what is your point of view? Yuan said into the comm. That Eden and its partners have been running the show for too long. The carrot has no weapons and we aren't close to a war zone. Turns out causes need coin, Captain. Yuan cut the communication. The miner had told Yuan everything that they'd done, why they did it, and what they wanted next. In the isolated vacuum of the bridge, Yuan felt his adrenaline draining away, leaving only exhausting failure. Back down the hallway, back to Silwa lying on the mattress. She'd coughed up blood, the spatters on her face, shirt, the floor. Yuan wiped them away with the blanket, listened to the shallow breathing. He grabbed the lone, strict necessities aid kit, sitting on the top shelf of Yuan's locker. Painkillers, a roll of gauze, and some stitches and scissors. Not what he would need to tend to the hole in Silwa's stomach. But a captain must use the tools at hand to carry out their mission, or at least try. It took five hours for Silwa to give up. She never regained consciousness, at least not while Yuan was in the room. He'd come back in, found her eyes open and glassy, the weak breathing stopped, closed her eyes. Death in space was not a rare thing, but that didn't make it any less wrenching. He had duties, protocols to follow in case of a mutiny. Only the carrot's communications gear had difficulty getting out of the storm. Or, at least, Gage never acknowledged Yuan's calls. There was no place to put the miner's body, no place to put Silwa's, so Yuan gave them his room, took his gear out and left them both sealed there. And then he waited to die. Chapter 42. Interrogation. They'd stuffed the hijackers, including Beta, into an airlock and sealed it. They'd have enough oxygen in there, provided Mox didn't get bored and open the outside door. Davin figured the treatment was more than they deserved, but chalked it up to, you know, being a captain and therefore being more sensitive to his crew deciding Davin wasn't worth keeping alive. He had Opal making a run back up to the ruined shuttle to collect her rifle and scrounge up any other hijacker arms that had been left behind. All this while, the carrot accelerated out of Neptune's atmosphere at a steady velocity. The size of the ship and the slow climb meant Davin didn't have to strap himself down, but he was bouncing from chair to chair in the cafeteria. It made the interrogation of the one hijacker, Alpha, a farce. The guy was wrapped into his chair, so he just watched Davin brace himself on a table, then a chair, then finally the captain leaned against the beverage machine. Not inspiring much fear. The mutiny leader, stripped of his helmet, was a grimy soul. Soaked through with his own sweat, Alpha's damp hair greased onto his face, made up of a pointed nose and a wide, monstrous mouth, slit eyes that stared at nothing. Alpha's head was a project in extremes. I don't really care, Davin said, hands gripping the sides of the machine behind him. Not interested in fear. Then what are you keeping me here for? Aren't you mad I tried to kill you? I thought I was supposed to be asking the questions. 
Davin said. Mad? Yeah. Davin was mad. If Alpha and his dumb crew hadn't tried to hijack the carrot, then Davin wouldn't be here at all. Wouldn't be in this storm while Phyla was stuck up there, probably bored out of her mind. Then ask him. Who's your boss? Don't got one. Really? Look! Alpha said, his straps moving slightly as though he'd tried to shrug his shoulders. You saw what was there in the hold. The ice diamonds. You're seeing us, thinking that it's all about them. It's all a cash grab. You're saying it's not. I'm saying you don't have a clue what's going on. Alpha shook his head. And it doesn't even matter, because you'll be dead long before this whole thing plays out. If there's a thing I love, it's vague threats and conspiracy theories. Keep them coming. We tried to warn you, Alpha said, a small smile creeping on his lips. Warn us? The message, the only signal we could get out. Didn't even have a mic. Run, that was you? Alpha nodded. Why? The carrot stopped shaking. Davin felt the pull on his legs let up, his stomach do a quick flop as Neptune's gravity disappeared and the carrot's own generators kicked in. Finally, that awful blue planet was behind him. Give the freighter a call. See if any of your friends are still alive. Chapter 43. New Orders. Piloting the jumper with a killer headache and a body built on pain wasn't what Phyla would call enjoyable, but compared to that shuttle, she'd take it. Gladly. Merck sat in the captain's chair next to her, manning the comm while Phyla angled the jumper towards the new ship coming out of Neptune's atmosphere. That what I think it is? Phyla said. It's her. Looks like your boy did something right for a change. My boy? Phyla glanced at Merck, eyebrow raised. Phyla, you and the captain gotta get off your hiding mighty horses one of these days and have a little fun. As funny as you two are, it's been going on too damn long. But Lena... Stop. Take it from a fighter pilot trained that every day is probably gonna be your last. Don't make excuses. Phyla laughed her bruised ribs blossoming pain through her chest so that the chuckle turned into a cough and a grimace. Merck wasn't wrong. The evidence was there. If they made it away from this planet alive, she'd have to have a long talk with the captain. Thanks, Phyla said after a minute. Merck nodded, then turned back to the comm. Yo, Carrot, this is the jumper. You reading? Professional as always, Merck. This is the Carrot said a stately voice, not one Phyla recognized. We read you, Jumper. My pilot says you're one of the good ones. That'd be correct. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I think you've got a few of our friends on board. Mind letting us in? During the docking process, which had the Jumper pulling alongside the Carrot's emergency hatch, what with the wrecked shuttle dominating the only actual docking bay, Phyla kept an eye on the scanners. Backer and his crew hadn't launched off of the freighter, hadn't hailed them. Quinn was still on there somewhere. Maybe he'd freed himself and was leading some sort of counterattack? It wasn't long after the two ships docked that Davin walked into the cockpit, kicked Merck out, and took his rightful seat. The next few minutes were spent catching each other up on what had happened. Davin's adventure walking the side of the carrot. Phyla's shuttle rescue. One of these times we're not going to make it, Phyla said when Davin finished. Nobody does, Phyla. Difference is, at least we'll be choosing it. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when Backer shot me into space. Felt much better than waiting till old age, dying in my sleep. The calm buzzed. Only the incoming message wasn't coming from somewhere close. It was long range. A bounce from the satellites scattered throughout the solar system. Davin looked at the blinking alert for a second as though deciding whether to continue the conversation with Phyla or play the message. Then the captain tapped the console and the recording started. Phyla exhaled. She'd talked herself into a corner there. Davin wasn't keying into the empathy, wasn't providing the right answers. Here, then, was an escape. Davin, it's been hours without a reply on the mission status. Eden is saying they've lost contact with the freighter. If I don't hear back from you or your crew within the next couple of hours, I will assume the mission has failed. Bosser's voice sounded too formal. We would prefer not to take emergency action, so please communicate your status. The communication blipped. Something had changed with the source. I know you're alive. Bosser's voice was different, 
less like he was reading from a script. I have eyes out there. I know you're rescuing the carrot and its cargo. Once you have it, Davin, leave the system. Do not attempt to engage the raiders. They are stronger than you realize, and the ice diamonds are far more valuable than that freighter or its crew. Communicate when you've left Neptune's space and we will go from there. The recording cut off. Who's left on the Amerigo? Davin said to Phyla. None of ours. Only the Viper, Phyla said. Only that wasn't accurate, was it? The Ice Diamonds can buy us a new fighter, and if Gage is a traitor, then I don't care leaving him. Davin said, nodding. Let's get out of here. Wait, Phyla said, as Davin reached to touch the reply button on the console. It's true. There's none of us on there. There's an Eden guy, though. Their agent. So, don't feel like risking the crew for one guy. They'll ransom him anyway if he's not dead, once they've lost the diamonds. Phyla couldn't discount Davin's logic, except she'd seen Backer, and she didn't think he gave one iota about ransom. Davin, he saved my life. Back there, on the freighter. The captain sat back in the chair, covered his eyes with his hands, and sighed, glanced at Phyla with a slight smile. We have to rescue him, don't we? Phyla nodded. And piss off Bosser at the same time. Phyla nodded again. I need to get a more cowardly crew. Davin muttered, then tapped the reply button. Bosser, Gage is a traitor and tried to set us up. I'm not a fan of getting played and walking away. I'll let you know when we're on our way to Saturn. Davin sent the transmission. Better tell everyone they're not done getting shot at. Phyla said, putting a hand on Davin's arm. And thank you. Suppose I owe this guy for keeping my pilot alive, Davin said, standing. I have an idea, but I need to clear it with Yuan first. As Davin stood, the jumper's scanner beeped once, twice, and then a third time. Three new contacts, coming out of the freighter. They're fighters. They must have realized what we were docking with. Undock now. We won't have a chance if we're stuck to the carrot. Davin said then used the intercom to radio Mox and Eric to the turrets. A minute later, Opal confirmed the airlocks were clear, and Phyla disengaged the bridge. Pumping power to the thrusters, the jumper flew away from the carrot, and straight towards the large white knife of the freighter. The whiskey jumper against the raider's trio of fighters? Phyla had seen worse odds. Chapter 44 Perspective They are trying to protect us. Yuan said, watching the scanner as the jumper set itself between the carrot and the oncoming fighters. For mercenaries, your friends are very noble. You should tell Davin that. There was something comforting about normal conversation after Yuan's story, that they could go back to reality, compliments and replies without disappearing into silence. How do you get over it? How do you get over killing somebody else? The wrong question, I think, Yuan replied after a few seconds. On the console, the Whiskey Jumper and the three fighters moved closer together. Another few minutes, and they'd be within range of the first fires. All of the other nines were aboard the Jumper, the hijackers safely locked into one of the Carrot's airlocks. Viola wondered why it didn't feel stranger to be apart from the rest of them. Then again, Viola knew what else she felt here on the Carrot's bridge, not under fire. Relief. I would ask yourself who you are and does this act change that? Because if you are confident in your idea of yourself, then an action taken to save the lives of your comrades should be an affirmation of that idea, not a condemnation. Viola studied the captain, who seemed captivated by the console and the converging blips. A few windy professors in the classes she'd had growing up had given Viola a certain skepticism towards the more philosophical statements. Here, though, from a person who'd just gone through a total mutiny, the loss of most of his crew, and learned that his co-officer on another ship had sold Yuan out, if Yuan could keep himself together after going through that, he might be on to something. Now watch! Your friends are fighting for our lives! Chapter 45 Turret Game The problem with being the captain was that you didn't get to have any fun. Davin watched the blips approach on the console, then on the glass as the ships came closer. The flight computer projected the raider ships in their approximate positions in front of them, so even though Davin couldn't see the fighters against the dark backdrop of space, he knew where they were. Status, Davin calmed. 
Ready to go, Trina said by the engines. In position, Opal said from the top turret. Davin thought he caught a hint of exhaustion at the end of that, a little sigh. They'd been running a full day without real sleep, and Opal had been beaten up, knocked unconscious, and nearly incinerated. She'd earned a bonus after this one. On, Mox said from the bottom gun. The twin turrets were standard on medium ships like the Jumper. Maximum field of fire, and with the Jumper's upfront cannon, the only vulnerable spot they had was straight aft, and Phyla wouldn't let anybody sit back there. Line me up, Davin said to Phyla. Two straight fighters and they've got that one scout ship. Preference? I like bigger targets. Phyla shifted the jumper, moving so the square on the far right, a larger one, was dead center. In a few seconds, that square would flip from yellow to green, and Davin would spit lasers. The two smaller squares, the fighters, were drifting higher as they adjusted their approach. Mox, you're on primary with me. Opal, keep us clear. Comms clicked affirmative. It must kill Merc to be locked in here, sitting out a fight. His own fault, what pilot leaves his own ship behind. The square flipped green with a beep, and Davin pressed the trigger in front of him. Out in front of the jumper, bright white light lanced out faster than Davin could register. Flashes as each pulse of the front cannon blasted out into the dark. A moment later, secondary flashes, lower but angled, came out of Mox's turret. Then the glass in front of Davin crackled in blue-gray waves, the scout ship's fire hitting their front shields. The console showed more shots from the fighters hitting the jumper's topside. Trina? Davin calmed, continuing to spray laser light towards the square. We're holding, came the response. But you might try dodging. The scout ship cut up as they drew close, the other two fighters keeping themselves on top of the jumper. Minimizing the effectiveness of the two turrets by keeping their entire force in one firing zone. As the scout ship shot past, Phyla rolled the jumper and curled after it, putting the scout ship in Mox's sights while bringing fresh shields to take the fighter's fire. Boost it. Davin calmed to Trina, who shunted some of the energy dedicated to the rear shields, now out of danger to the jumper's engines. The added jump kicked the ship through its roll faster and Phyla nudged the jumper up so that the scout ship's big aft was sitting right in Davin's sweet spot. Triggers pulled, lights flashed, and between Davin and Mox, the scout ship's shields broke apart, followed by charring, shattering pieces of metal. Keep us on him a second longer and we'll punch through. Aft, Opal calmed. Davin glanced at the console as Phyla yanked the jumper hard to starboard, swinging the scout ship out of Davin's arc. One fighter had taken its disc-shaped self through Mox's distracted position and hovered right behind the jumper. Phyla tried to shake it, but the nimbler craft was keeping pace, blowing through the light rear shields. Hold on, Phyla said, then pulled back on the flight stick. The jumper tilted straight up, swinging the fighter into Opal's zone, right where she was already aiming. As Opal lit into the fighter, it boosted forward pushing energy into its engines to get itself out of the way of Opal's turret. As the fighter shot beneath the jumper, Phyla pressed the stick forward, leveling the jumper out and putting the fighter in Mox's sights. After a couple shots, the fighter's shields went out. Another couple in its cockpit shattered, venting atmosphere and sending the fighter into an uncontrolled plummet towards Neptune. One down, two to go, Davin said, glancing at the console. The scout ship limped back to the freighter, only there was a new blip on the scene. A larger ship. Their big one, Phyla said. She wasn't wrong. It was larger than the jumper, and based on the rate at which it was closing, it wasn't made for cargo. Merc didn't even try to engage it. What are you saying? I was hoping maybe, with the freighter, they wouldn't have enough to crew all their ships. Phyla said, angling the jumper after the remaining fighter, who was dodging frantically, not even bothering to attack. Davin had to admit, the little bastard was good at it too. Its thrusters let it stop, start, and juke without the curves most ships dealt with. Mox and Opal hit a few times, but not enough. Not concentrated on the same parts, and the fighter's shields held. Need a plan, Davin? You met their leader, much of a conversationalist. We didn't get to know each other, 
The whole shock and throw me into space thing ruined the atmosphere. Ah, uh, Davin said, then adjusted the comm to beam a message straight towards the oncoming raider ship. Hey, we're all mercenaries here. How about we arrange something that makes us all rich? That's what you say? I'm appealing to his greed, and we might want to stop shooting at his fighter. Phyla caught the message and angled the jumper away, alerted Opal and Mox to the plan. The fighter caught on too, seizing the opportunity to sprint towards the larger ship, which was finally close enough for the scanners to pick up more detail. The jumper was a modular ship, designed to have pieces plugged into standard joints to allow for tweaking as needs arose. Most of the spaceship industry was like that. Plug and play parts. Buy the pieces that you needed, jack them into a fitting, and you'd be ready to fly. The frigate in front of them resembled a wing, with the cockpit at one pointed end and a large bank of engines at the other. Sections sprouted from the central core like feathers, each one crawling with turrets. Feel like we've seen this one before, Davin said, looking at the enemy ship's waved exterior. It looked like a painter's brush stroke in reverse, a blot at the front followed by a thin midsection and a frilled massive aft. It was the end that was coated with weapons, at least four turrets on top and bottom each. Near Europa, I thought it was Eden's. We can't win this one. Not without help. But they can't catch us, or the carrot. You want to run? And Quinn? There's a difference between taking a risk and suicide. You'll have to order me, Phyla said, giving Davin a level stare. Take us back towards the carrot and get ready to head towards Saturn. I'm sorry, Phyla. Me too. Phyla swung the jumper around as the frigate approached firing range. Then their freighter's engines kicked in, and the distance between the jumper and a quick, fiery death started increasing. The comm beeped at him. Incoming transmission. Guess they wanted to talk. Davin tapped the connect button. What do you want? To save lives, the voice said. Davin turned to Phyla, who nodded. That was Backer talking. We're already leaving. A cowardly choice. Let me give you a chance to redeem your honor. I will offer you the following exchange. The remaining crew of the freighter and your lives, in exchange for the carrot and everything on board her. Davin muted the calm, looked at Phyla. That's a crap deal. I thought you wanted your guy back. He's not my guy. Phyla said, but she didn't say anything else. Davin remembered Phyla's hand on his arm, the conversation before he left for Neptune. Now there was this guy, Quinn. Davin blinked. Stop it. That didn't matter. If this Quinn saved Phyla's life, then he deserved a rescue of his own. And if Backer was going to let them land without firing a shot, then there was a chance. We'll take it, Davin sent back, then turned to Phyla. He better be worth it. Chapter 46. Guarded. The woman stared at him, mouth tight and arms crossed. It would have been unnerving, but Quinn didn't care anymore. His life was already forfeit. He'd be put up for a token ransom or maybe just launched out of an airlock and left to drift through the stars till he froze and died. Nothing she could say would make things worse than that. They said you were helping those mercenaries, the woman said, feeling her way through the question as she asked it. Do you know them at all? No, only met one. Brave, though, for someone with a loyalty to coin. Getting the feeling back into his arms, legs, mind was slow. They juiced him hard. It had taken an hour to even speak a sentence. That's what I thought, too. Now Quinn looked up. What do you mean? The one I ran into, the pilot. I thought he'd ask to join when he saw how outnumbered he was. The woman sighed. Backer would have taken him, too. We don't have many people left. That's what'll happen. You decide to fight the ones with all the power. The ones you work for. Yeah, because they have all the power. Quinn shot back. Seems like a smart idea. But Eden hurts so many people. And you're saints, I get it. The woman shut up at that, glared at him, till her calm beeped. She glanced at it, then her face blank, looked back at Quinn. I'm supposed to bring you to the docking bay. Quinn tried to stand, but as he moved off the bed, his legs failed to work, and he fell onto the ground. Didn't realize you were still so weak, the woman said, then leaned back and pulled Quinn up. You can lean on me while we walk, because I'm a saint. 
There were a lot of steps between the bunk room and the docking bay, and Quinn leaned on the woman for every single one of them. Chapter 47 Bridges Are you ready? Viola asked Yuan, who stood behind her, rifle in hand. The airlock in front of Viola held the hijackers they'd neutralized on the carrot. They'd tried to kill her and her friends, and now she was letting them free. Viola pressed the release button on the keypad next to the airlock, and the door cycled open. The hijackers stared at her, and Viola wondered if, even unarmed, they would charge her anyway. About time, the one called Alpha said. Are the bridges set up? Viola shook her head. The carrot was near the freighter, in position to offload its cargo of ice diamonds. The transfer would take place using bridges that could extend from the Amerigo to its target. With the zero gravity of space, all the bridges had to do was act as a guardrail to send cargo from one ship to another. The ice diamonds would float along those chutes and get caught by bots or people in the freighter's cargo bay. There's nobody to rig them up, except you. Where's all your friends, the guy that tried interrogating me? Getting your old crew away from you. Hear that, guys? Alpha said, turning to the four others. They're doing the cleanup for us. We have to shift some rock, and then it's payday time. A minute later, they were shuffling to the cargo bay, Yuan and his rifle keeping an eye on them. Viola went back to the bridge, looked at the console. The jumper was just sliding into one of the freighter's docking bays. The rocks are about to move. Be careful. Be ready. For what? Chapter 48. Legacy. A sniper's scope made everyone a target. Even if her finger wasn't near the trigger, Opal still felt the person standing in the crosshairs was a moment away from dying. From the top of the jumper's loading ramp, Opal looked out at the ten Amerigo crew members surrounded by backers mercenaries. The crew looked stunned, except a short engineer who seemed to relish throwing glares at anyone who looked at him. Suppose she would feel that way too if a bunch of bandits and a traitorous captain had taken Opal's ship. Davin stood at the bottom of the ramp, Mox and Merc armed and next to him. As soon as word came that the ice diamonds were making their way through the chutes, the crew would come up. Then they'd pull out of here and hopefully never see the freighter again. Leaving with the crew instead of the valuable diamonds meant the pay for this one might not be spectacular. But then, Eden was a fantastically rich company. They might give them a nice bonus for bringing their members back alive. The scope settled on Merc for a moment. How close had Opal come to dying just a few hours ago on the carrot? While she was lying unconscious, Merc was up here trying not to get blown to space dust by the raider fighters, both of them on the edge, a laser away from never seeing each other again, from never feeling each other again. They're moving the diamonds. Viola's voice came through their comms. The commanding raider, a burly man trailing waves of fabric flowing from his jacket, glanced at his comm and whistled. The crew lined up and walked forward. None of them cuffed, restrained at all. There were another ten raiders in the bay, so maybe the invaders didn't feel scared about their prisoners. From their slow, dejected walk up the boarding ramp, Opal wouldn't have been scared of the crew either. He's not with them. Phyla calmed. Quinn. Hey, Davin said to the burly man. You're missing one. I'm told the last is a special case, the man replied. Our arrangement didn't have any special cases. The man flashed a bearded grin at Davin, then brought his calm to his mouth and said a few words that Opal couldn't catch. There was movement by the docking bay door. Opal shifted the scope to cover the space and rested her finger on the trigger. The first one through was another raider, her hair scattered across a patchwork shirt, colored fabrics tightly wound around her arms. Walking behind the raider with an arm on her shoulder was the Eden man Opal recognized from their tour of the freighter a lifetime ago. The raider woman paused for a second, staring at Merc. The fighter pilot gazed back. Opal noted the recognition. Something to ask Merc about later. That's him, with his arm on that raider. Figured. Opal ignored the chatter. Focused on the person coming in next, gaunt, tall, and with a masked face, Backer strode in behind Quinn, brushed past the Eden guard, and walked right up to Davin. Opal kept the scope deadlocked on Backer's head, fighting past a barrage of memories to stay in the moment. Mars. 
the red voice. That's where she knew the name from. A hit list, and Bakker was near the top. If he was here, then these weren't simple mercenaries. The ice diamonds weren't being stolen for a group of greedy killers. The red voice had been silenced, according to the media. Eden and the other corporations, along with Earth's military, had claimed victory. A premature boast, apparently. Suddenly her calm brought in ambient noise, projecting a conversation. It took a second to realize that Davin was broadcasting what Backer was saying. And so you realize that you, asking for this one, are forcing me to give up my leverage with Eden? Backer was saying. Yeah. Thing is, we need the same. They won't be too thrilled we left their man with a bunch of raiders. Then one of us must make a sacrifice. Don't know that I'd call it that, but fine. I vote you, because you're getting the damn ice diamonds and a big freighter to carry them in. Backer, through Opal's scope, gave no hint of expression behind the mask. There wasn't a smile, a frown, barely a blink of the eyes. Opal tried to remember what had carried Backer to his position in the red voice. Pieces of recollection flitted by. The man had been a knife in Eden's back, twisting in the shadows to turn people against their friends, slipping sabotage into the daily lives of Martian citizens. Tell me, Davin Masters, why is it that you want to save the crew? Backer asked. You are a mercenary. You live and die by the coin that you earn. What use do these lives have to you? Opal watched Davin think for a second. It was a strange question, just like Bakker's slow speech cadence, the raiders nearby standing bored, like they were waiting for something. The ice diamonds. They were being moved from the carrot to the freighter. Bakker couldn't risk anything until the transfer was complete, until the bridges disconnected. Viola could yank the carrot away or even use the bridges to damage the Amerigo's cargo hold. But once the bridges were clear, there wouldn't be any reason to let the crew transfer continue. Backer could roast them all, trapped here in the bay. Davin, gotta get the guy and go. He's stalling. Opal said into the calm. Her voice came out of Davin's calm loud enough to hear. Davin glanced up the ramp towards where Opal was sitting. Backer followed the look stared right at Opal. Without understanding why, drawn by the chance to meet those shadowed eyes, Opal raised her head from the rifle and looked straight at Bakker. I believe, Davin, Bakor said, not looking away from Opal, that you are about to argue that life is worth more than coin. Yet you travel with that one. Bakker's fists clenched. Opal ducked back behind her scope, aimed it right at Bakker's face. Good men do not harbor monsters, Bakker finished. Before Opal could pull the trigger, Backer yanked Davin in front of him, grabbed the sidearm holstered on Davin's belt, and held it up to the captain's head. New deal. The Eden man for the sniper. Or all of you burn here now. Chapter 49. Frantic. Calling Opal a monster? Is that what he heard? Merck grabbed his pair of stunning discs. Pucks that would, a few seconds after being armed, send arcs of paralyzing electricity out around them. His thumbs moved to the triggers. Even if Merck stunned Davin, that'd be better than letting Backer shoot him, because there was no way they were going to... Done, Opal said loudly from the top of the ramp. It's a deal. You're not the captain, Davin said, eyes on the sidearm Backer held to his temple. Not your say. It's my life, and I'm saying make the swap. At least you are brave, Backer said. He didn't move the sidearm away. Any pretense the guy had of being diplomatic was gone. The raiders sensed the same change, their hands moving to their weapons, drawing them. There were six raiders in the bay, plus Bakker, with four of the nines. Of course, Phyla could use the jumper's turret too. Bakker had to know his odds here weren't real good. Cass shoved Quinn forward towards the ramp. The guy looked like he couldn't walk, and Mox caught Quinn as he fell and, at a look from Davin, carried the man towards the jumper. They passed by Opal on the ramp, the sniper slinging her long rifle over her back. It didn't make any sense. Why would Opal offer up herself for a guy none of them knew? Why wasn't Davin fighting? As she walked down the ramp, Opal looked over at Merck and gave him a slight nod. Merck wanted to call this whole thing insane, but there had to be a plan. She wouldn't be doing this without an ace, so Merck nodded back and hoped. As Opal came within a meter of Backer, the raider captain shoved Davin away hard and turned his aim on Opal. 
Davin hit the floor, rolling back up to a crouch, that shotgun of his swinging over his shoulder and into his hands. Our deal is done, Bakker announced, then reached for Opal's arm. Merc waited for the flip, the kick. A surprise shot from Phyla that would incinerate Bakker where he stood, only nothing happened. Bakker took Opal's arm and walked towards the bay's exit. The sniper didn't even resist. The hell is wrong with you people, Merc said. We're just letting him take Opal? Like she said, it's her decision. Davin looked like he didn't believe his own words. Yeah, but not hers alone, Merc said, and threw both discs. The first skittered across the ground and exploded at the feet of three raiders. The second flew towards Backer and Opal. Opal flinched away, and Backer dove with her as the discs exploded with electricity. The three raiders collapsed, twitching to the floor. After throwing the discs, Merc flipped the rifle over his shoulder and into his palms, aiming at Backer. Cass and the other raider were still in the bay, but Merc hoped Mox or Davin could handle them. Like hell, Backer was taking Opal away. The sniper had found her spirit, though, and grappled with Backer on the ground, too close for a clean shot. Merc moved closer, hearing shouts behind him. Cass was telling someone not to shoot. Some movement by the doorway that Merc couldn't trace. Not that he wanted to. He could see Opal moving her legs into position to... There it was. Opal brought her legs up, then smashed her booted heels into Backer's ankles, causing the raider to let go of her. A clear shot. Then Merc flew and landed on the bay floor, air rushing from his lungs in a coughing fit. His ribs ached. The hell was that? Bending up, Merc saw a shorter robed man staring at him. Where was Opal? Merc blinked and found her, running towards him, backer behind her, aiming the sidearm. Twist him. Merc tried to yell, but he didn't have the breath. Backer fired. The orange bolt lanced out and struck Opal in the back. She fell forward, smoke and flame rising from the back of her jacket and landed next to Merc. Her face right there. So close. Her eyes staring right into his, tears lacing the edges. I'm sorry, Opal whispered. Merc wasn't sure how he heard the words over the noise in the bay, the laser fire, the yelling, but... They were there. Don't talk, Merck said, his own voice barely functioning, lungs grasping for air. I love you. You'll be okay, Merck said, sitting up, raising his calm. He glanced at Opal's back, at the frothy burning pit that had been her jacket a second before. Facts flew through his head, statistics on the power of Davin's sidearm, the likelihood of fatalities when shot in certain areas of the body and the robed man stood between them. This close, Merc could see metal eyes, their unblinking cameras staring at him, could see the arms reaching to crush Merc's throat. No, growled a deep voice. Then the bot lifted in the air, Mox's metal-laced arm holding the enemy like a toy. Like he was playing a game, Mox threw the bot hard into the bay wall. At impact, the bot blew into pieces, Robes scattering to the ground as the its arms and legs sparked themselves out. Davin, closer to the bay door, triggered a shot towards Backer, but a second robed figure darted out and pulled the raider boss out of the way. Melody's green fire splashed around the exit, framing the door in flame. Eric, casualty. Merc calmed. Opal's been shot in the back. He's already getting ready. Bring her in. Hey, you. Merc said, leaning down to pick Opal up. Hang in there. She didn't answer. Chapter 50. Reversal. Mox stunned the shocked raiders one by one, not thrilling, but necessary. After zapping the last one, he looked towards the jumper's boarding ramp and saw Merc coming down. No opal. Davin and the raider woman, holding up her hands, were waiting. As soon as Merc hits the ground, go. Davin's calm went to all of them. Will do. No risking their ship while they chased the burned man around the Amerigo. Mox walked towards the bay exit, stepping over the wrecked pieces of the strange bot soldier the burned man had with him. Not a full android, not so tough as that, but still capable of hitting hard. Is she okay? Mox asked Merc as the pilot joined them. We'll find out, Merc said, eyes rimmed with red. She's not going to be happy she wakes up and we haven't taken care of this guy. Then let us make Opal happy. Davin noticed the raider woman still standing in the room. Who are you? Cass, the woman said. Tell me why I shouldn't shoot you. 
Cass looked at Merck. The pilot returned the stare, not saying a word. What are you looking at him for? Look, Cass replied, turning back to Davin, palms up. I'm just trying not to die, all right? Not helping? Your boss might have killed my sniper. Tell me why I shouldn't take you hostage, use you as leverage. Because I'm worth nothing to him, and because I want to help you. You've helped plenty bringing Quinn here. Davin, she's not our enemy. Cass flashed the fighter pilot a quick smile. Convince me. Prove that the moment I turn around, you're not going to blast me in the back with that sidearm. I can't, Cass said, reaching for her holster and pulling out the weapon. Mox tensed, ready to jump and tackle the woman if she raised the sidearm. But she dropped it, the sidearm clanging to the floor. All I can say is that I've lost my faith. Faith? Look at my friends. Cass pointed at the unconscious raiders on the floor, the three stunned from Merck's shock grenade. They're here because of a cause, because they believe that what they were doing was helping some great crusade. We were supposed to free Mars, but now we're not even on it. We used to be fighting for cities. Now we're dying trying to take one freighter from people that had nothing to do with the war. Convenient that you're realizing this now, Davin said, not moving his hands from Melody. It wasn't really clear until you came back here. Until we were trading innocent lives for those ice diamonds, for a shot at some coin. Cass said, then looked at a piece of crimson ribbon wrapped on her right wrist. I didn't join the Red Voice to be a thief. That's not what my family died for. Cass met Davin's stare. I don't know your name, Captain, but if you're willing, I'd like to help you clean up this mess. Then you can drop me at the next station. The woman looked set. Mox believed her. No quaver in the voice, no glances off to the side, and with Opal out of the game, they could use a fourth on the ground. I trust her. Davin nodded a second later. Merck, you seem to know her, so you've got responsibility. Otherwise, Mox and I up front, you two covering our backs. Trina, when you get a minute, bind up our trio out here so they don't wake up and get excited. The hallway outside the bay was quiet. Mox noticed marks on the walls, tearing from a vacuum exposure. Wires, containers, equipment cluttered the ground. Really made a mess out here, Merck. Davin said as they walked through. Wasn't thinking about it. Hey, Captain. Go. Opal doesn't talk much about her past. You know why that guy would have called her a monster? Mox heard the claim. Had similar names leveled at him. By any reasonable measure, Mox had wounded, killed, or destroyed more people and things than he had any right to. Was he a monster? Did he deserve to die for it? Better question. Did Mox feel he was evil? No. Therefore, he was no monster. Neither was Opal, at least in his own eyes. You're going to have to ask her that, Davin replied after a minute. A few more empty stretches of hallway put them near the bridge. No resistance so far. Cass thought the burned man had pulled his remaining forces, sent them to protect the ice diamonds, to prep his ship, that the bridge would make an ideal ambush. Merc? Phyla's comm call came through. The fighter and that scout ship are still out there. Eric's working with Opal. Trina's making magic with the shields, and we're going to need cover. What do you want me to do about it? Didn't you put the Viper down in the freighter? Can you get to it? Merck was nodding before he was even done talking. I can, provided the raiders haven't torched it. Cass, go with him. Prove what you said back there. The two of them went running back the way they'd come. Mox and Davin stood alone outside the bridge doors. You ready for this, big man? Mox nodded. Davin tapped the intercom. Hey, Gage, open these doors. Can't do that, Captain. You know how I feel about security. Sorry to hear that, Davin said, glanced at Mox. Eric had asked Mox once, after taping up the metal man's hands yet again, whether Mox ever got tired of hitting things. The answer to that question, as Mox charged the exoskeleton and slammed his braced hand into the door, was no. Another swing and the door shook designed to handle high one-time stress but not repetitive impact because how many spacecraft had battering rams on them, the door bent away from Mox's fist. Several punches later, Mox alternating lefts and rights, the big man paused. He'd felt the door slip on that last swing. One more. Can't wait, Davin replied, leveling his shotgun at the door. Mox loaded up the punch and let it fly. 
The door held for a split second before crumpling around Mox's fist and launching through into the bridge. The door hit the floor and skidded to a stop a meter in front of the burned man and his other bot guard. Behind those two, at the freighter's console, was Gage. The burned man, while Mox was still pulling back from the punch, fired from his sidearm. Mox saw the shot coming, though, and was already kicking away. The exoskeleton boosted Mox's jump, and he flew over to the side of the orange beam. Mox saw the flash of green that meant Davin had pulsed his shotgun. Then Mox hit the floor and rolled. Came up, and the bot was swinging at Mox's head with a short twin-tined fork, made for law enforcement. Mox had seen them before, on Luna. No guns there, so other methods were used. Mox curled up, letting the bot's first swing fly over the top of his head. Tried to grab the robed creature, but the bot danced away, aimed the fork at Mox, and fired. The lightning arced forward and threw Mox's exoskeleton, which absorbed the current and shorted. Mox collapsed to the floor, the full weight of the suit holding him down. A defense mechanism, but not a great one. Mox triggered the restart, but the exoskeleton didn't respond. It would take time, which Davin did not have. Mox could see the captain dueling with the longer, lankier, burned man. Davin triggered a second blast of the shotgun, but the burned man was already rolling out of the way, trying to get closer. They had reversed positions, with Davin closer to Gage and the burned man near the door out. The bot was moving too, getting ready to hit Davin from behind. Davin had no chance. The exoskeleton still not restarting. One way. Mox reached behind his head, pressed in on a hidden button beneath the nape of his neck. All along his arms and legs, Mox felt popping sensations, pinches as nerves released, the exoskeleton prying itself off. Mox stood and dove as the bot took aim with the fork. Without the exoskeleton, with Mox's nerves shaky from operating without the metal suit support for years, the dive fell short. Instead of a tackle, Mox landed at the bot's left foot, reached out and swiped at it. Mox's hand blew up in pain as it hit the bot's metal ankle, no longer shielded by the exoskeleton's glove. But Mox was still strong enough to sweep the bot off its aim, the fork's arc shooting up and spattering against the ceiling. The bot fell on its back and rolled away from Mox, but the big man grabbed the bot's arm, grabbed the fork. The bot stopped its roll, tried to pull back. Minutes before, Mox would have been able to yank the fork free without a thought. Now, with both hands wrapped around it, straining, Mox could feel the bot winning the fight. So Mox reversed, pushed instead of pulled, shoved the fork's back end with the force of the bot's own strength into the bot's chest. The fork pounded through the bot's chest plate, punching by the shell and into the bot's central circuitry. It twitched once, then collapsed. Mox jarred the fork loose, looked up just in time to see Davin take a jab from the burned man, saw his captain crumple to the floor. Chapter 51. Release. Man, that last one really popped Davin's jaw. Not happy with that. Even less happy looking up into the muzzle of Backer's sidearm. The man could fight. Backer's wiry arms were like trying to get a grip on oil-slicked rope. And that same lankiness meant Davin's blocks weren't in the right places. Like trying to fight an octopus. Yield, you have talent. Talent we could use. Yeah, Davin said, rubbing his chin on the floor of the bridge. Seems like everybody is offering me jobs these days. What's the pay like? You know what's in the hold of this ship. That's been a question for me. How are you planning on selling those, considering everyone in existence will come from a known hijacking? It won't matter, Backer said, and for the first time, Davin saw the man's straight face turn into something resembling pleasure. Bakker's white and red scars stretching was not a fun thing to witness, like jam and cream cheese dancing. There's the detail I look for before I take a job, Davin said, looking over to Mox. Hey Mox, what do you say? Bakker here says it won't matter that their payment will be stolen goods. Take the deal, Mox replied, resting on the fork. Davin noticed the big man had popped the exoskeleton didn't look so hot either. Last-minute rescue seemed unlikely. Listen to your friend Davin. Eh, he takes more on faith than me. Why should I believe you that Eden won't come hunting their stolen diamonds? Because Eden and all its ilk will be in too much turmoil to care. 
Backer snarled, the calm expression fading from his face. Now join or die. Backer shoved the sidearm closer to Davin's face. Thing was, even if the deal was a good one, there was no way Davin would work for someone as crazy as Backer. All the coin in the world didn't matter if your boss was likely to shoot you on any day. Davin took a breath, tasted that bland, recycled air, and started to end his own life. Only Davin's words were drowned out by the sudden alarms ringing through the bridge. A robotic voice announced the cargo bay was breached to vacuum. Backer whirled, swinging the sidearm to Gage, who stood and looked back at the burned man from the console. Sorry, Backer. I signed up for some coin, not for some mad revolution. Your ice diamonds are shooting out to space right now, along with I bet most of the rest of your crew. Davin didn't see Backer pull the trigger. The orange flash, though, was plenty visible. A gaping burning hole opened up in Gage's chest and the captain collapsed. In the same motion, without sparing even a second for Davin, Backer sprinted from the bridge. Davin and Mox went over to Gage, but the old captain was already gone. Seal the bay, Mox said. Good call, with Merc heading down there. Davin went over to the console, shifted the seal from red to green. The alarms died. Anything not tied, weighted down in those bays would have already been sucked away, though. Davin flipped through the exterior cameras until he came across one that showed the diamonds. A huge cloud of them, glittering like small stars against the backdrop of Neptune. Left out there, the diamonds would slowly fall back to their mother. Merc, Davin calmed, please tell me you're still on the ship. Chapter 52, Flight Plan you Could have warned me you would dump the cargo hold. Merc said to Davin over the comm. Merc and Cass were holed up down the hall from the entrance to the cargo bay. They'd been exchanging fire with the raiders inside when those raiders suddenly disappeared. The doors shut, claiming vacuum breach, and all Merc had to do was think about how lucky he was. No time. See if the Viper's still there. Roger. And Merc, we didn't get him. Good. I've got something I want to say to Big Ugly. Then get to it. Davin clicked off and Merc looked over at Cass. You mind me going for your boss? He's not my boss anymore. Davin's a better one, trust me. The freighter's alarms ceased, the sudden quiet seeming loud in its own way. The security door to the cargo bay shot open as atmosphere came back. Cass nodded in that direction and they went. The only thing left in the bay was the Viper, its mass and locked struts keeping it glued to the cargo bay floor. Outside the magnetic seal, Merc could see thousands of spinning lights, like stars but meters away instead of light years. When I take off, I want you to head back to the bridge. Davin and Mox will have something for you to do. I'm coming with you. What? That's a Viper-class fighter. There's room for a passenger. Room is stretching it. But Cass wasn't wrong. A small passenger could fit behind the pilot. Designed more for food and drink on longer flights, it wasn't uncommon to see Vipers leave that empty and squeeze someone in for short runs. Popping the hatch, the space was as empty as Merc remembered it. If Cass wanted to come, wanted to bend herself like a pretzel, she could. They settled into the seats, Merc starting the pre-flight checks, and Cass grumbling about how her blood flow was already cutting off. No sympathy for you. You wanted to come. I'm merely commenting on the poor design of this space. So now you're insulting my ship? Yes. Merc laughed and immediately stopped. Opal was out there on the jumper, maybe dying, maybe dead. He had to get out there and protect her. Had to find and take out Backer. Glancing at the pre-flight checks coming in green, Merc lit the jets and glided out of the cargo bay. And into a swarm of ice diamonds. The damn things were everywhere, swirling at different speeds based on how much momentum they'd had leaving the bay. The Viper bounced through them, the ship's armor deflecting the rocks away. From the cockpit, it looked as though reality was breaking apart. The diamonds reflected sunlight, the light from Neptune, and the freighter's own pearl paint to make it seem like lines were appearing and vanishing in space. Merc couldn't think of a way to describe it, so he sat there and watched as the Viper warmed itself up for full flight. Beautiful. Cass muttered from the back. This life isn't all bad. The Viper beeped, showing the main engines set to fire. The ship's sensors were confused by the diamonds, but Merc could still get reeds on the jumper, and near it, near the freighter now, the carrot. 
What's that girl doing? Merck said, ramping up the acceleration and blowing out of the ice diamond swarm. What girl? Viola. She reprogrammed an android once. Merck said, angling the viper towards the jumper. We stay alive. You'll get to meet her. And will we? Will we what? Stay alive. Cass, you're flying with one of the hottest sticks in the solar system. You want to stay alive. You stay right where you are. The jumper was coming closer, visible now in front of the viper. The sensors showed it was being chased by the damaged scout ship and the fighter that had done such a tight job keeping its ass unfried earlier. Speaking of asses, the jumpers was eating a lot of laser. Merck could see the flashes and the occasional attempt at countering fire. Looked like the shields were still holding, but how much longer was anyone's guess? Phyla, on my mark, you're going to pull back on that stick, got it? Merck calmed. Merck, that you on my board? Phyla, sounding harried, answered, Oh yeah, it's me. Merck tilted the viper slightly, so it slid just beneath the jumper's vector, flipped the shield strength entirely to the front, shunted the batteries from the engines to the lasers. Beautiful thing about space was that Merck's velocity kept right on going until something pushed him the other way, so might as well use that energy for what counted. The viper's collision alarms blared, his cue. Mark! Merck calmed. The jumper curled up like a running dog suddenly caught by the end of its leash. The viper zipped underneath and right into the path of the scout ship, which was already trying to match the jumper's maneuver. Not paying attention to the little viper that lit it up, the scout ship's already damaged shields didn't hold more than a couple hits before collapsing. Bright blooms of orange appeared in the scout ship's hull, the vessel bleeding metal as Merck unloaded fire. One down, Merck said as he flew beneath the ruined ship. Where's the other one? Probably running. The Viper shuddered. Then an alarm went off. A different one. The left rear engine hit and non-functional. Merck slapped a slider that evened out the shields and glanced at the sensors. The fighter and its annoying disc shape was tailing the Viper. It must have swung around the scout ship and used its damn omnidirectional engines to put itself behind the Viper. Fine. Merck could use a challenge. I thought you... Cass started. Hang on, Merck said, then pulled the stick back as he rerouted power from the lasers to the engines. The rapid thrust, coupled with the pull of the stick, flipped the Viper up. Merck cut the engines entirely and punched the front docking jets, kicking the front of the Viper back towards where, a second ago, its aft had been. But the disc fighter was already moving away, attempting to go beneath the Viper, stay behind it. Merck squeezed off two shots, but they missed high, way off, then he boosted the throttle. Cass was saying something, but Merck tuned her out, maybe just screaming as the Viper blitzed through space. Even with one of his engines missing, Merck was pretty sure that Omni couldn't keep up. Had to make this a longer-range game, where that thing's ability to dash around like a dragonfly wasn't an advantage. His sensor board showed the disc following, taking the occasional pot shot, But with Merck juking the Viper at random, the Omni wasn't landing much. The freighter loomed back in front again, big and white. The jumper was off to the side, closer to Neptune, and out of the fight. Even with experienced gunners rocking the turrets, they hadn't been able to hit the disc. No sense risking the prisoners. One on one, Merck said, without realizing it. His right hand gripped the stick tight, sweat beating. Merck's left hovered over the sliders for engines, lasers, and shields, all even at the moment. In a second, they'd be flying over the freighter. In a second, the Omni would lose half its options. Everything below would mean slamming into the freighter's surface. Ever done a front flip, Merck said, and didn't listen for Cass's reply. He cut the power to the engines, pushed the stick forward, and kicked the maneuvering jets, swinging the Viper around in the opposite direction of the first time. Only he didn't fire any thrust, so the Viper kept speeding across the freighter and away from the Omni. Merck couldn't see the Omni, and he had to bet that the Omni couldn't see the Viper either, except on its sensors. And sensors did a crap job of showing where someone was pointed, where they were going. But now Merck's lasers were firing where he'd come from. Flashes as the beams struck out into the distance, and Merck saw a few crash against a shield, but when he looked at the sensor, the Omni was still there, coming at him from a different vector. Get him? How do you know it's a he? Merck said, pushing the engines back up, pushing back towards the freighter, towards the Omni. 
sending streaming lasers forth and watching every one of them miss as the Omni blipped around at irregular angles. Then the splashes came against the Viper's shields, the Omni sending a shot and veering out of the way of Merc's counter. This wasn't the way to win the fight. Cutting off half the Omni's options wasn't enough. Merc had to pin the fighter, cut the opportunity. The Viper shuddered as another shot hit it on the side, the console flashing red as the shields fell to minimal strength. If I die here, I'm haunting the hell out of you. I'll be dead too. Doesn't matter. Merc shook his head. The sensors blipped. A new icon coming around the freighter. The frigate. Must be Backer's ship. Trying to grab those ice diamonds. Merc blinked. Pushed the power from the Viper's lasers to the engines, and the fighter shot across the freighter's surface, building distance between it and the disc. What next, Hotshot? It's a secret. I just hope it's better than your last trick. Me too. Merc thought. The Viper shot over the edge of the freighter. Merc cut the engines, shoved the power to shields, and let the disc catch up. Wouldn't work if the enemy was paying too much attention. Had to get them greedy. A moment later, the Viper was back in the cloud of ice diamonds, zooming through space in Neptune's orbit. Merc angled around clumps of them, twisting the Viper through and watching the sensors as the disc followed suit. Closing. Any second now, the disc would shoot fire into the Viper's engines. Any second now, they would both be entirely surrounded by the diamonds. The Viper shrieked as it took another hit to the engines, the disc's lasers punching through the shields and causing Merck's middle engine to wink out on the console. Perfect. Merck shunted power to the right engine, the only one left, and spun the Viper around again. The disc was ready, reacting to the Viper's spin. Merc saw it, saw the disc move as he pulled the trigger and sent lasers firing into the vacated space. Watched as the disc flew directly to the side, an impossible angle for most ships, an angle that took it right into the path of a cluster of ice diamonds. The ice diamonds weren't energy, solid, forged mass. They cut right through the disc's shields at high velocity, powered by Neptune's lingering gravity and the ejection from the freighter. They sliced the disc to ribbons, shattering the engines, laser cannons, breaking the fighter into dozens of shards that spun right along with the cluster. See what I tell you, Merck said, using the maneuvering jets to guide the Viper clear of the diamonds. You're fine. Are we? Merck glanced at the sensor board, then tilted the Viper to the left. Bearing down on them, filling most of the Viper's cockpit, was the frigate, bristling with turrets. And Merc only had one functioning engine. Chapter 53 saw shooters passed. The target was surrounded by other targets. The collection that the ECA, Earth Corporate Alliance, had been hunting for months was here, all here nestled in the side of Olympus Mons, a mountain so large that the side filled Opal's entire horizon and kept on going. But the mountain's shadow had a purpose. Olympus Mon's sheer size restricted the view of satellites, disrupted communications, and made it difficult to get any sizable force nearby without being observed. Which was why Opal lay next to a mini rover and looked through a scope at people over three kilometers away. Peace. That was the topic under discussion. The reason the Red Voice had gathered its ranking members here to find the conditions that the ECA would have to accept if they wanted to keep their Mars investments producing, if they wanted to keep them at all. Opal? A voice. From the comm? Opal glanced at her wrist. No message. Can you hear me? Aside from the giant mountain, the only things around Opal were mounds of reddish rock and sand. Locked in a narrow crevice between a pair of rises, her rover out of sight behind them, Opal wasn't sure where the voice was coming from. A few moments breathing, nothing more. Maybe just a daydream. Focus, Opal muttered to herself, looking through the scope again. The primary target, Alyssa Reinhardt still moving, welcoming associates into the large room. A design flaw, putting that many windows in a high-profile meeting space. But then, who'd have predicted the luxury resort being commandeered by hostile forces? Opal took a breath. So many of them. Alyssa was the ECA's primary goal, but if they were all here, the entire leadership of the rebellion, maybe if she could get a comm signal out, 
the ECA could try something more. But did all of these people deserve to die? Opal didn't recognize most of them, minor players, specialists, non-combatants. They weren't in her mission protocol, so the comm stayed off. Opal zoomed out, looked at the exterior of the building. Like half an oval, the resort was built into Olympus Mons, with part of it literally inside the mountain. The conference room fit along the oval's outer edge, providing what was probably a spectacular view. Only glass worked both ways. Opal noticed motion in the scope. Doors were opening into the room, waiters bringing in celebratory toasts. No more time to think about strikes. The targets, Alyssa included, were grabbing glasses and circling up around a table. Opal didn't have the angle to see what was on it, but she could guess. The document, the terms. A deal struck to get the rebellion to the table, a deal the ECA had no desire to keep. One way to get out of a promise was to get rid of who it was made to. Alyssa was in the scope now, walking over to the table, grinning, laughing. Come on, Opal, I need a sign that you're there. The voice again. Opal blinked. What was that? Who was trying to talk to her? Come back. No, the target. Opal centered Alyssa in the scope as she leaned over the table, pulled the trigger. In Mars's thin atmosphere, the rifle cracked lightly, the kickback strong from the weak gravity, but Opal was ready. Kept the rifle dialed in, eyes down the scope. The shot was dead on, hit the glass, and bounced off. Not even a scratch. Nobody inside even looked up. That didn't make sense. The statistics on the resort said the glass was standard. Her shot should have pierced. Gone right through. Through the scope, Opal could see the other members of the party taking turns with the table, adding their names. She had to act. I need a negative strike at the following coordinates ASAP. Opal calmed, stating the precise position of the resort's conference room. The ECA had several orbiting satellites around Mars, a few of them capable of performing so-called negative strikes. She'd been assured there'd be one overhead if needed, if the situation called for it, if Opal felt it necessary to achieve the objective. What are you saying? The voice, confused, answered. The comm on her wrist clicked once. Affirmative? The voice hadn't come from the comm. Strange. Opal settled back into her position, watched. The negative strike was invisible, but it started quickly. Opal saw when the conference center's first alarms went off. That would be the vacuum breach as the satellite's weapon burrowed through the glass shell. The members looked confused for a moment, then filtered towards the exit. Alyssa surrounded by a pair of what looked like bodyguards. A moment later, people took off their coats, and the first expressions of panic showed on their faces. Smoke rose from table clothes, from evaporating champagne, and then the oval burst into flame as the oxygen began to burn. Opal knew what would happen next. The literal lighting of the air would expand too quickly for the resort to cope. It would burn through the underground, through the rooms and restaurants, the docking bays and pools. Only when the last bit of oxygen had burned away would the flames die out and all anyone would find when they came to see would be ash. This is going to sting a bit, but I need you to wake up. Who are you? Opal asked the Martian air. Only it wasn't the Martian air anymore. The red vistas, Opal's rifle and mini rover fell away, and for a moment Opal was nowhere at all. Then she felt the bed, the blanket, saw the light beaming down at her and Eric's frowning face. You don't know who I am. I... I do. The doctor split his face into a wide smile. Opal, I think you're going to be okay. But all Opal could think about was that look on Alyssa Reinhardt's face as she realized what was happening. That extinguishing spark as she realized everything was lost. Chapter 54. Improvising. With a swipe on the console's screen, Viola turned on the carrot's ore intake. Meant to be used in conjunction with mining lasers, the intake acted as a focused gravity well, sucking up ice diamonds and setting them into the cargo hold. Now, there wasn't anyone aiming a mining laser, but they had nothing to cut. The ice diamonds, floating through the vacuum, were picked up by the intake and sucked into the carrot's hold. You need to get closer. The intakes don't have the draw from here. He'll blow us up if we get within range of those guns. 
The shields will hold. For long enough anyway. Viola swallowed, tapped in a new heading on the console, and told the carrot's flight computer to execute. The ship drifted. The churning intakes were sucking away most of the engine power. But in a vacuum, even a small amount of thrust was enough. The sensors showed a pair of blips. The frigate the larger one, Merck's Viper, the smaller one. In a few seconds, the frigate would eclipse Merck and wipe him from existence. You're sure there's no weapons on this thing? Viola asked for the fiftieth time. It's an experimental ship. Eden will probably add defenses on future models based on this experience. Doesn't help us now. Don't focus on what you don't have. Whatever you say, Captain Zen. Sorry, it's a bad habit. If you shift our shield energy to the intake, I'll forgive you. Viola said, eyes glued to the sensor scan. That will leave us vulnerable. Just do it, trust me. There was something absurd in Viola. A newly minted mercenary telling an experienced corporate captain what to do. But damn it, it was Viola's friend in danger here, so normal protocol need not apply. Yuan, for his part, seemed to understand. He nodded, then routed the power. As the carrot's computer adjusted the pull, Viola felt the ship shake as it suddenly engulfed more cargo than it was designed to handle. Ice diamonds, random space debris, and anything else that happened by the carrot was getting caught in the suction and yanked into the cargo hold. On the sensor console, the blip representing the frigate was still closing with the Viper. Only the rate was slowing. Then it stopped, the two icons barely separate. And then the frigate went backward, towards the carrot. We've got it, Viola yelled, then turned to Yuen. Now what? Chapter 55, Vacuum. Merck felt the Viper lurch forward towards the frigate. Only the larger craft didn't come any closer. Merck watched out the cockpit window waiting for his brain to lock back into reality and tell him that the Viper and its damaged engines were going to either slam into the bigger ship or be blown to pieces by its lasers. Shouldn't we be dead by now? Cass asked. Because I'm cramping up back here, so if we're going to die, can we get on with it? Trying, Merck said, his voice trailing off. The Viper's console showed they were moving, despite having no engines. What was going on? He glanced at the sensor board. A third blip was nearby, larger still than the frigate. Too big to be the jumper, not nearly large enough to be the Amerigo, which meant... I think we're being mined. Mined? The carrot has entered the game, and she's sucking us up. Is that a bad thing? Still gotta figure that out. If the Viper shot into the carrot's cargo bay, he might get the maneuvering jets up in time to keep the fighter from crashing. But the frigate sat between them and the mining ship, as soon as they decided to light Merc up, they were toast. The thing with Backer is that he will kill you if it means helping the cause. You bring this up because? Your friends aren't as ruthless. It's dangerous not to match a fanatic on his own terms. Yeah, well, your fanatic's not doing too hot, Merc replied, then adjusted the levels. Power to the shields and the maneuvering jets. So how does the best pilot in the solar system get caught up with a group of mercenaries? You're asking now when we're a trigger finger away from being space dust? When Eden torched my town in the name of keeping the peace, I lost everyone. I don't want to die that way, too. I get it, Merck said, opal flitting through his mind. Since you ask, the best pilot in the solar system has a problem with authority. Shocking. The frigate's nose, just out of firing range, tilted away from the Viper, turning towards the oval behind them. Merck hoped the carrot had some strong shields, because otherwise it was about to be ash. Does that satisfy your death wish? It'll do. Still would rather not die if you can arrange it. Working on it. Before Cass could reply, Merck flipped on the comm and opened a wide channel. Hey there, carrot. This is your friendly fighter pilot you're about to suck into that nasty vacuum of yours. I get you're trying to grab the big boy, but how about letting us loose? How do you know they're friends? Because everybody likes me. Merck? The question came from the comm, with the clarity of a tight beam communication. Can you hear me? Viola, girl, I can hear you like a song. Now please tell me you're not going to grind my ship into dust. Outside the front window, the carrot's oval spawned out of the dark like a smaller, distorted version of the planet they orbited. The frigate sat between them and the carrot, nearly through its slow turn. Big ships made their moves in long arcs, Hard to do when they're getting yanked from behind. 
I'm trying to save you. You're small enough. Turn on your engines. Get out of there. Viola, my engines are burnt. Just when you catch that big prize there, turn off your intakes and we'll be good. In front of them, Backer's frigate completed its turn. The ship's wings, bristling with turrets, spat fire at the carrot as soon as the mining vessel was in range. Merck watched as the first few winked out against the shields, but soon the flashes slipped through and orange flares erupted in the carrot's side. Backer's ship fired at random, trying to find a point that would disarm the vacuum. Outside the cockpit, sparkling ice diamonds swirled, pulled towards the carrot as well. They reflected the laser light of the frigate, flashing crimson, gold, and occasionally white when a particular piece of electric innards blew off the carrot. You got any more shields on that thing, because you might want to turn them on? The only reply was static. Given the progressive destruction engulfing the carrot, it wasn't surprising that the comms were out. The frigate had firepower when it wanted to deliver it. Only the intakes were still going, still pulling everything towards their dark insides. And Bakker's ship was getting awfully close. In a few moments, they were going to collide. And when they did, everything around the Viper was going to be a cluster of debris. Things are about to get real crazy. Like they aren't already. The frigate, almost as large as the two carat intakes together, swept in close, lasers firing freely. The front end vanished into the intake, glowed as the frigate's shields absorbed the initial impact, and then everything blew to hell. A chained orange explosion rippled along the frigate, broke up through the carat, and splashed over the viper's shields. Merck could only see orange for a moment, licking flames blocking out the universe. And then they were gone replaced by a cloud of shards, smaller fires that winked out as fast as they formed, and the silent disintegration of the carrot as the impact shattered its way through the ship's decks. Hey, you going to move? Oh yeah. Merck brought up the maneuvering jets, coasted the Viper up, down, and to the side of metal chunks, ice diamonds, and the pieces of humanity that had been on those ships, but were now permanent residents of Neptune's outer orbit. In between every juke, Merck flicked his eyes down to the scanner, hoping to see something, anything that would show Viola was still alive. Chapter 56. Falling Apart. The console blew up in her face as Yuan pulled Viola back. The screen shattered into a thousand jagged edges that cut slits into Viola's turning head. Alarms blared in different frequencies, cadences, each one sounding another critical system on the verge of collapse. It was overwhelming, maddening. But Viola held on to the last thing she'd seen on the scanner. That blip, the frigate merging with the carrot and vanishing. They're gone, Viola said as Yuan pulled her towards the bridge exit. We will be too if we don't hurry. As if agreeing with Yuan, the carrot shuddered, a snapping sound crackling up the inside of the ship and sending the two of them to the floor. Viola pushed herself up, brushed hair out of her face, and felt her hand come away bloody. A cut, or maybe hitting her head. The reason didn't matter. The rush of destroying the frigate was siphoning into panic. She didn't know where the escape shuttles were, if the carrot even had any that were still operational, and how long did they have? Focus, Yuan said, standing up beside her. And run! The captain took off, dashing towards and through the door out of the bridge. Viola followed. Calculations ran through her head. Problems she'd done for her engineering classes. Fail-safe ships like the Carrot would have built in. The kind Galaxy Forge, her father's company, would require. The frigate came at the Carrot towards the intakes, from beneath. The cargo hold would have plenty of barriers between it and the rest of the ship. A necessity for the section that opened to vacuum and dangerous materials most often. Down! Yuan shouted in the hallway ahead as a series of pops shot through the ceiling. Viola dropped, and a moment later the ceiling panels fell a meter. Struts snapping, residual failure from elsewhere tracking its way up here. Viola pulled up to a squat and kept moving. After the cargo hold, the most damaged area would have been the crew quarters, the side facing the frigate as it came in spewing laser. Viola tried to remember the carrot's layout. The opposite the crew quarters would have been the sampling area, where cargo taken on was analyzed, cleaned, and readied for sale. 
Yuan made it out from underneath the collapsed panels and looked back as Viola continued her half-run, half-crawl. There's a pair of shuttles just up here next to the cafeteria, Yuan called back. Viola made it out from under the panels and ran after Yuan. Most ship designs put the cafeteria near the crew quarters. Made sense from a logistics perspective. Fewer steps to that late-night snack. A wave of heat, source unknown, washed across her face. The tingling smell of burning circuits filled the air as they approached the ruined space that had once held the meals for the crew. Parts of the floor had collapsed, leaving sections that looked like islands in a metal ocean. The elevator doors were locked half open, looking into an empty shaft. Which way? Straight across, Yuan replied, taking a running jump to get across a collapsed section. Viola looked at the meter of floor in front of her, then at the gap Yuan had just leapt. Longer than she was tall, but to her left was the hard wall. To her right was the burning ruin of the carrot's kitchen. A likely victim of a power surge as the carrot's own regulators burnt, letting energy run free throughout the ship. The same thing would have torched the console on the bridge. She took a deep breath, Yuan looking at her with a mix of expectation and worry on his face, and took a couple running steps and jumped. As Viola went into the air, she felt the pull on her boots slacken, the carrot's internal gravity failing and sending the ship into near-zero G. Viola careened forward, over the gap but still moving, shooting straight for the far wall. Turn! Viola swung her body around and struck the wall with her feet. Viola tried not to push, to sink as much as possible into a squat so she didn't rebound. Then she pushed off towards the near exit, the one Yuan pointed out. Her hands, outstretched, wrapped around the corner and swung Viola around. As she moved, Viola caught a glance of lettering pasted onto the wall. Crew quarters. Yuan shot past her, rocketing along the hallway towards a shuttle likely already destroyed. Housed in a section of the carrot demolished by the frigate's fire. The lights that way were flickering, impossible to tell what waited for them around the next bend. Only... If Viola's hunch was right, that entire side of the ship was about to fall apart. Yuan, turn around. The captain caught himself on a broken part of the hallway side, looking back. The shuttle is just ahead. But... The hallway behind Yuan illuminated in a yellow sparkle. A great wrenching went through the carrot, and suddenly, the stars were visible behind Yuan, part of Neptune's teal disk showing. Viola was looking into outer space. The carrot's defense mechanisms struggled into action and slammed a door shut, nearly bisecting Yuan as he launched himself back towards Viola. Is there another way? Viola said when Yuan reached her, both of them taking a second to breathe. The other shuttle is on the opposite side, through there. Yuan pointed to the elevator shaft. It's next to the cargo hold. It was an impossibility that the cargo hold was still there. No, Viola shook her head slightly. The intakes bore the impact. The cargo hold might be breached, but something on the other side of its large, empty space might still be there. We'll need suits, Viola said, and Yuan nodded. There's an emergency set near the entrance to the hold, in case something goes wrong. I think this qualifies, Viola said, as they launched themselves towards the elevator shaft. They flipped down the black inside of the elevator shaft, the only light coming from sporadic flickers along the sides. Cracks, rumbles, groans, and the occasional roar of vacuums created and cut off echoed in Viola's ears as they floated down. Yuan hit the top of the elevator first, pressing an emergency release that popped the lid off the top of the elevator. The force sent Yuan flying back up the shaft, but Viola caught the captain as he went by, using her momentum to push them both into the elevator and through the doors into another hallway. The cargo hold to the right, Yuan's emergency lockers to the left, where the hallway ended in a manual release door. Most of the carrot's portals opened and closed through electronic panels. Yuan opened this one the old-fashioned way, turning a handle. Inside the locker were four suits and accompanying oxygen packs along with a bunch of other first aid gear. After a couple minutes squeezing themselves into the suits, something Viola wasn't the most experienced with, they stepped back out of the locker and went towards the cargo hold. The suit fit snug, wrapping Viola in technology that shot her temperature 
oxygen rate, and a full diagram of the suit itself in front of her eyes. A smaller diagram appeared a few seconds later, showing Yuan's suit. They'd instantly see if something happened to one another. These are really good, Viola said as they walked along. Galaxy Forge doesn't have anything like these. The carrot is, Yuan paused, was Eden's showcase, a test of new technology. You'll get to tell them how well it worked. Then the lights went out. The entire hallway dashed into dark as a shaking crack, louder and larger than the others came from Viola's left, towards the intakes. Sensing the lack of light, the suits powered on their headlamps and Viola saw a different world. Formerly, the bright-lit hallways were boring, safe walks of metal. Now, with shadows playing between the arcs of the lamps and those walls buckling, breaking, Viola found her eyes scanning everywhere, her hands sweaty, breathing fast. They would make it. Viola whispered the words to herself as they went. And then the hallway tilted, twisting as though grabbed by a child, and turned on its side. She's broken. There's open space ahead. Can we make it to the shuttle? I don't know. Depends on what's left. Yuan steadied himself on the wall that was now the floor, then launched himself forward. Viola followed. They passed through what had been one of the carrot's vacuum doors, meant to seal off the cargo hold, but the floor it connected with had blown away. Instead, the door hung there, sideways, like a stiff flag in no wind. Behind the door, bleeding through the splintered edges, Viola saw the bluish hues of space. The cargo hold wasn't a hold anymore. Instead, it was a skeleton frame. The carrot's supporting structure now a series of long, battered beams connected only by space. Ice diamonds, shrapnel, and junk whirled around, propelled by Neptune's pull and the force of the carrot's breakup. Gripping the door, Viola looked out beyond the junk at the pure, endless nothing that lay beyond. She'd never spacewalked before, never been out here. Despite the suit regulating her temperature, Viola felt cold. The shuttle is this way. Yuan's voice came over the suit's short-range comms now, the captain nodding to his right. On the outer edge of the cargo hold, but separated. Yuan went first, pushing off the door and following the cargo hold's inner wall to the right. Viola followed, using the captain's headlamp as much as her own to grab handholds as they drifted. Behind her, Viola felt the carrot continuing to break apart, but only when she touched the wall felt it shudder. Sound didn't carry in the vacuum, and after the endless cacophony of alarms, the silence was surreal. A little peaceful, if Viola was being honest. Around the curve of the wall, where the cargo hold petered out of room, was a mostly intact module. It would have been underneath the bridge if the carrot was still in one piece. Yuan paused, his head tilted. The door, it's already open, the captain said. Viola caught up and looked over the captain's shoulder. The black backdrop of space mashed into the steely gray of the carrot's interior as the wall they were on connected to the room and shot out to the hull, forming an L from their location. In the middle of that jog out, there was a doorway, haloed in Neptune blue, open and beckoning. It might have opened from the damage, or the power going off. Possibly. Anyway, we have no choice. Either it is there and we live, or it is gone and we die. I'm hoping for the first one. Yuan vaulted towards the room, the open door. The captain moved fast, launching himself and heading towards the room like a missile. If he missed that door, he'd squash himself on the wall. Crazy. Viola continued to pick her way along. Yuan, arms and legs tight to his torso, shot through the doorway and disappeared. We're not alone. What? Viola said, but the only reply was static. Not alone? There was someone in there? Viola bunched her legs and launched off the wall, aiming for the door. Viola pressed her arms and legs in, forming as much of a needle as she could as she went through the door. Inside the room it was dark, except for a sliver that bled in from the door, and Viola's headlamp, casting around as she tried to find somewhere to stop her momentum. She bounced off a wall, then what would have been the floor before catching herself. Yuan? Nothing. Viola turned her head around the room, racks with several more spacesuits, a stack of emergency supplies. But there was only one light, hers, flitting around the room. Yuan's headlamp should have been there, too.
Turning away from the door, Viola saw the room continued. Made sense. The shuttle at the bow, as far away from the engines and the likely rupture as they could shove it, down here. Captain, hello? There was always a chance of interference, a signal interrupted. Viola went further, her headlamp picking up the far end of the room. An airlock, open to the interior of the shuttle. They'd be keeping the suits on then, as the shuttle wouldn't have any air for them. Viola floated towards the shuttle, then stopped as something grabbed her. Viola turned to the right, her headlamp illuminating another spacesuit, not Eden branded, and in it, a scarred face, mouth set in a firm line and eyes staring at her. It was only an instant looking at those eyes, but Viola felt that the burned man wasn't looking at her at all. Didn't see her except as an object, something in his way. Then she was flying forward. He'd thrown her. Viola glanced back, saw that by throwing her, he'd pushed himself back towards the doorway. Viola reached out her hands, caught herself against the outer edge of the airlock. Where was Yuen? She scanned the room and found the captain down in the corner, cracks splintering across his helmet, his hands trying to spread thick tape along the lines, fixing a leak. But the attacker was coming back. Viola caught him in her headlamp, streaking towards her, flipping so his feet would impact first. Without a weapon, rupturing a suit would be hard, but a flying kick from across the room might be enough. Only if it hit her, though. Viola gripped the inside of the airlock with her left hand and pulled, swinging herself into the airlock and through, down into the shuttle. The console was on, the shuttle warming up. Yuan must have found this guy just about ready to trigger the launch. Viola turned back towards the shuttle's entrance. She'd be trapped if he came in here, but... At least it would be close. A battle of rips and tears. Whomever sprung the first good leak would win. The burned man slid over the entrance, looked down at her. Viola floated backward till she could touch the console. The screen reflected on the plate of her helmet, showing Viola where the burned man planned to go. Who are you? The voice coming over the comm surprised her. Just a pilot. Who are you? Just a refugee the burned man said. Was it you who destroyed my ship? You're the one who let me. The burned man was larger than her, probably stronger. Viola didn't know the first thing about fighting up close, much less in spacesuits. When he struck, she didn't like her odds. Now if you knew what depended on those diamonds, you would have chosen differently. The man pushed forward, sending himself towards Viola. Pressing her feet to the console, Viola kicked off and flew towards the burned man. Just before they hit, Viola twisted her body to the side, reaching out with her arms and pulling the burned man past her. The move shot her up by the airlock, and as she went by, Viola slapped the small panel, still glowing through its hardwired independent battery. Shuttles had to be launched no matter what the condition, and the launch mechanisms were always linked to their own power. A second later, the airlock snapped shut, and while Viola couldn't hear it, she felt the container shift as the shuttle blasted free. Chapter 57. An Escape. A smooth gambit, if a foolish one. Backer looked at the closed hatch of the shuttle, blasting its way from the carrot. They would be trapped there, die quickly if the whole thing collapsed, or slowly when their air ran out. Meanwhile, he had the shuttle. Not a great outcome. But if the path Backer had plotted would work, the shuttle should carry him close enough to Uranus to radio for help. The engines kicked in briefly, turning the shuttle. The viewport behind Backer filled with blue light. Not what he would have expected. The course would have him slingshot Neptune, use the momentum to send the shuttle back towards the sun. Backer twisted around, looked at the console as the engines fired again, full thrust this time. The path was different. It wasn't his. Arrows traced from the shuttle's current position towards Neptune, ending directly at the planet's center. A simple path, a doomed one. The girl, Backer said, even though nobody could hear him. The girl had changed the vector, her back to the console. The path was crude, but it would accomplish its purpose. A glance at the fuel reserves told Backer all he needed to know. The shuttle was moving too fast, was already too deep in Neptune's gravity well to go anywhere but into it. Alyssa, Backer said, looking at the growing ball of blue that filled the viewport. I'm sorry. 
The burned man leaned forward, gripping the console and looking out at Neptune growing larger and larger. Backer felt the pull on his feet first, then his fingers, the increasing tug of Neptune's gravity. The interior of the shuttle heated up. An alarm sounded pitifully that their descent was too steep. Not that there was any fuel left to correct it. The edges of the window glowed white as Neptune's thick atmosphere overwhelmed the shuttle's meager shields. Backer closed his eyes as the universe melted away. Chapter 58. Seek and Find Guiding the jumper through a thousand tons of space junk wasn't Phyla's favorite activity, but it beat dodging lasers. A few minutes ago, they docked the damaged Viper with Merc and that raider Cass coming on board. The fighter pilot insisted Viola could be somewhere in here, and Phyla felt they owed the girl enough to take a look. The shuttle didn't reply. Trina calmed from the engines. Phyla had tried to hail the streaking escape shuttle they'd seen launch from the Carrot's wreckage while picking up Merc, but there hadn't been a response. The trajectory wasn't a good one either, and by now, the tiny ship had disappeared. Not just from the jumper's sensors, but from existence. Nothing. It didn't look like there was even an attempt to course correct either. That can't have been Viola. Accidental launches happen. With the irregular power, maybe a small explosion. I got it. Going to swing over that way to check it out. She tried to focus on finding Viola, on scanning the debris, but she kept waiting for the comm to crackle. For Davin to announce they were fine on the freighter, that they could be picked up. There'd been nothing. Stop. Not now. The freighter wasn't a pile of floating debris. Davin would be fine. I hear I have you to thank, Quinn said, coming into the cockpit. So thank you. Repaying a debt, Phyla said, keeping her eyes on the mess of twisting metal and ice diamonds ahead of her. Doesn't mean I can't thank you. You really want to thank me. Then get down to the airlock, get a suit on, and get ready. Ready for what? You see that? Phyla pointed. After so many years staring at starlight, it was easy to see the glint of a man-made glow. Couldn't tell where it was coming from, but the reflection, with its duller, non-twinkling matte light, wasn't from nature. Quinn followed her point, nodded, stood up, and left. That wasn't much of a conversation. Phyla could have said more. Could have been nicer. Except, right now, there wasn't time. Phyla sent the jumper beneath the large chunk of wreckage, turning the ship on its side so that the airlock faced the floating room where she'd seen the reflection. She sent two comm bursts towards the section but didn't get a reply. Countless possible reasons for that. From broken systems to suits not equipped with longer-range comms. Merc, can you go with Quinn? Phyla calmed through the ship. I don't know who's in there. Yeah, I got you. Merc calmed a minute later. Phyla noted the reply came from Opal's room, winced. It wasn't nice to pull the pilot away from Opal, but who else would do it? Stay there. A voice Phyla didn't recognize. I'll go with Quinn. You've done enough, stick jockey. Who's that? Phyla asked. Your new stowaway wants to earn her passage. The voice calmed again. Cass. Then go get him. I'll have you in position in 60 seconds. A minute later, Quinn triggered the airlock open and Phyla, using the jumper's cameras, watched the pair float, tethered, out towards the wreck. Establishing vidlink, Quinn calmed, and Phyla's console lit up with a grainy feed from Quinn's suit. As the pair of them entered the wreck, the available light dipped, and the video became a smear of grays and spots of light. Any sign? Definitely picking up the light. Looks like a headlamp, moving slowly. There's a lot of crap floating in here. Silence for a bit. Quinn seemed to be moving further into the room, then turned to the right, following the light from the headlamp. There, in the corner, were two bodies, almost meshed together. I see them. The larger one in the back is Captain Yuan, Quinn said, moving forward quickly. His helmet's cracked, likely bleeding oxygen. It looks like the girl patched her suit into his, sharing the same air. We've got to get them out of here. Cass broke in. Now, while they're still alive. The raider took the lead, wrapping arms beneath the captain and lifting the two bodies up. Quinn took the other side, both of them carrying the bodies back through the room. Eric, going to need some oxygen ready to go. Just what do you think I'm doing down here? Sitting in the dark waiting to be ordered around? Yes. 
No, no, I'm not. I've been listening to the whole thing. The med bay is ready to receive. Good. Phyla switched back to the outgoing transmission. We're ready for you. Cycle the airlock in three, two, one. And then it was time to get Davin. Chapter 59. The Metal Man. Every single segment felt like a deep stab, Mox's nerves once again filtering through the exoskeleton's net. A gag filled his mouth to prevent Mox from biting through his tongue in shock as he laid on the bed in the jumper's med bay. How many of those are there? The raider woman, Cass, asked. She was helping Eric place each of the connections. She asked a lot of questions. Nearly a hundred different connections, Eric replied, linking the next one down Mox's left leg. They have to respond to every muscle, to every twitch and amplify the power. The stab. Mox sucked in breath and closed his eyes. Remember the reasons. How much does something like this cost? Cass asked. Too much, Mox wanted to say. Worth every coin. The type of penance that literally strengthens you. I don't know. It was a choice Mox made. Do you know why? You'll have to ask him. Thank you. The doctor knew. Understood some things need to stay behind closed doors. A sharper sting. Mox set his jaw. That would be the knee. How you doing, big guy? Cass leaned over his face. Need anything? Mox shook his head slightly. Drugs might numb the pain. A drink might dull the sting. But that was not the point. Cass saw the shake, glanced over at the doctor. How much longer is this going to take? Another hour. You think it's worth it? Cass asked Mox. The big man nodded. When the next segment went in, Mox clamped down on the gag. Was it worth it? All the pain? Yes. Chapter 60. One of them. So what will you do now? Viola asked Yuan as the captain walked down the jumper's ramp into the freighter. Some of the freighter's crew had already left the bay, heading back to their quarters, their stations, to see what remained of their old lives. You mean after I return the freighter to Eden, a glorious failure? Yuan said, but killed the seriousness with a smile. A large ship like this one takes a long time to get anywhere. Eden may have forgiven me by the time we get back to Jupiter. Perhaps another assignment. If not, maybe I'll find your captain and see if there's an opening. Join us? Viola laughed. Unless you enjoyed all those near-death experiences, probably want to rethink that. How about you? Are you set to continue on this path? I don't know, Viola said, and was a little surprised to realize that was true. She didn't know whether she wanted to stay with Davin and the crew. Viola was exhausted. Her only real sleep in the last two days had come from oxygen deprivation in the wreckage of the carrot. But she feared that behind closed eyes, all she would see was the face of the raider as he realized he was shot, as he realized he would die. There is room here, if you choose. A pilot would be welcome. Her father would yell at her to take that offer. Get in on a lucrative role with one of humanity's top companies? Quinn! Viola heard Phyla yell. From the top of the ramp, to the Eden security guard, who was watching the disseminating crew like a parent might watch a group of unruly children. Come back here and say goodbye like a real person. Phyla continued, then brushed by Viola on her way down. Excuse me, Vi. Phyla took another couple steps, then paused, looked back at Viola. By the way, as soon as you head back in, can you plot out a track to get us back to Minor Prime? Thanks. Phyla hadn't ever asked Viola to do that, to actually pilot the jumper, plot their course. Sorry. Viola said to Yuen. I'm not done here yet. Yuen nodded, his grin growing wider, sadder. Perhaps we will see each other again on the other side of the sun. Yuen said, then turned and walked away. The other side of the sun. No idea where that came from, but it sounded nice. Viola would look the phrase up later, or after she put Puck back together, she'd ask it. The little guy would know. As Viola walked back up the ramp, she took one more look down. Saw Quinn extend a hand for Phyla to shake. Saw Phyla grab it. Saw Phyla pull Quinn in for a quick, tight hug. Too personal. Viola turned away, went back into the jumper's boxy metal confines, and turned her mind to matters mathematical. Chapter 61. Eden's Orders. The jumper left Neptune behind, picking up speed for a long shot towards Minor Prime. 
Davin double-checked the course plotting Viola had done earlier, though he knew Phyla had already reviewed it, and the girl had put it together perfectly the first time around. It would take weeks to get to the space station, and most of the crew was doing what he should be, sleeping. She's good, Phyla said, knowing what Davin was doing. That move with the carrot, that was gutsy stuff. Would we have done that, you think? You? Never. Too paralyzed with fear. You would have been sitting there trying to think of better ways to do it until everyone was already dead. Maybe it's good to have a reckless pilot on board. I thought that's why Merck's here. I'm never trusting him with this chair. Phyla shook her head. He'd have the jumper flipping over so much we'd all get sick. You did a hell of a job back there, with the fighters. Don't know if I say this enough, but I'm pretty damn happy to have you. Have me? Phyla cocked an eyebrow. I'm here because I want to be. You don't have anything. That mean I don't have to pay you. Want, Davin. Want. This woman needs a cut or she'll want to be somewhere else real fast. The blinking light on the comm threatened to interrupt their conversation. Davin ignored it. The jumper would file the message and they could get back to it later. Davin sat back in his seat, stared out at space, at the sun glowing in the far distance, barely brighter than the surrounding stars reached out with his hand and felt Phyla take it, grip it. Silence for a minute, just breathing and taking in the fact that they were both there. They'd survived again. The tips of Phyla's fingers pressed into the back of Davin's hand, warm, so simple. But Davin hadn't felt that touch since Lena's place way back on Minor Prime. And before that, Davin could barely remember. Space travel wasn't as romantic as the movies made it out to be. So what was Bosser going to pay us? Was. No idea. Betting the number now is going to be a whopping zero. Nothing? We wrecked Eden's prize ship, ignored Bosser's own orders to run, and, oh yeah, shot the super valuable ice diamonds into space. Davin said, stretching out his arms. He wasn't sure why it didn't bother him to say they failed their mission. Then he tugged on Phyla's hand and remembered. Not all of them, Phyla said and Davin looked over to see a smirk on her face. What? When we were floating through the wreck, picking up Viola and Yuan, we grabbed a few that were close. Trina's storing them in the back, near the engines, so the freighter's crew wouldn't get any ideas. So you're saying we're not broke? I'm saying that I'm going to be getting my cut, Davin, and so will you. Relief. Which surprised Davin. Nothing more than relief filtering through him that they would be able to pay for the jumper's next flight, that Opal, Eric, Trina, and the others would get some coin in their accounts, that somehow they'd survived a trip to the heart of Neptune and back out. Davin laughed. Couldn't help it. It's good to see you happy. Hasn't been enough of that lately. Tell me about it. Davin sighed, but the cynical weight that had been there earlier was gone. Then his eyes caught the still-blinking message light. Davin reached towards it. Don't press it. Right now we're good. You play that message. Probably just boss are asking for a status update, Davin said, tapping the console. Davin. Bosser's voice came out of the speakers. You idiot. Assuming you're still alive, of course, which you shouldn't be, but like Earth's cockroaches, you and your crew appear to have a tendency to escape death. Not that it matters anymore. Eden informed me that the carrot is gone along with the ice diamonds. Apparently you saved one of their officers who dutifully reported how you screwed this up and how you saved their crew. You're going to fly your ship straight to Minor Prime. Eden's going to employ you. Give you a chance to clear your debt, so to speak. You're getting another lease on life. Don't run. Don't think you can live a hermit life on an outer planet. Because we will find you and you know it. Contact me when you arrive. Bosser ended the message. Don't say I didn't warn you. Phyla said in the silence. Davin tapped the console, pushed the display of their route onto the glass, tracing a yellow arrow straight into the stars. The console prompted Davin for any adjustments, a new target. You think they could find us anywhere? I don't think you could do it anyway. You'd go crazy living on some tiny station around Pluto. Davin's hand hovered over the console. With a swipe, he could send them to Saturn, or put them on course for Mars, even Earth take their chances. After this, it's done, Davin said, moving his hand away. Phyla grabbed it, 
held it as the jumper left the black-blue Neptune and the white bar of the Amerigo behind. This is the end of Dark Ice, The Wild Nines, Book One, by A. R. Knight. Listen on for an excerpt from One Shot, The Wild Nines, Book Three. Text copyright 2017, all rights reserved. To find more of our books, check out blackkeybooks.com. Thanks for listening. An excerpt from One Shot, The Wild Nines, Book Three. A minor setback. Losing the Ice Diamonds was a blow to their bottom line, but all it meant was that Bosser's partners would have to step up their contributions. Reaching their goal would provide such profits as to make the diamonds a footnote and nothing more. Bosser said all of this to the screen in his dark apartment aboard the space station Minor Prime. Situated in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, the station functioned as an intermediary for communications between civilized space and more adventurous outposts in the farther reaches of the solar system. Those outposts and missions around them had been giving Bosser more headaches than usual lately. The two-meter-wide monitor in front of Bosser held the faces of his various business partners. All of them were labeled with astrological pseudonyms, zodiac signs in no particular order, hovering beneath their heads in gold-weighted capital letters as though they were wearing jewelry. The faces themselves were static, would remain so for minutes as the message filtered its way through dozens of satellites to their respective offices. Of the nine members on that screen, Bosser had a good idea who all of them were. Despite the entire group coming together through a string of anonymous messages suggesting places and times, despite a promise not to attempt to learn the identities of each other, Bosser gone digging, as had all the others. Bosser took a sip from the water glass beside him, the cool liquid tasting indistinguishable from the filtered natural springs on Earth. So long as he didn't think about the fact that it was recycled from the station's thousands of citizens, Bosser enjoyed the sensation, water and wine. Anything else was a waste of time. This is the second instance that this group disrupted your plans. Gemini, the top middle head of a large asteroid mining company, said. To keep the council from talking over each other, an order had been established at the first meeting. Bosser, with Minor Prime as the central communication hub for the group, would dictate who should respond next. If nobody was specified, the order rotated, progressing through the group one person at a time. Lately, though, Bosser felt all of these sessions were interrogation games, searching for ways to pin misfortunes on him. The Wild Nine served their purpose, Bosser replied. That the Red Voice still had any ships capable of mounting an assault was information we did not have, that Eden did not have, as the Red Voice needed those diamonds far more than ourselves and we prevented that acquisition, I still consider the mission a success. Another period of pauses. Bosser went over to the record player set up against the wall of the apartment. Easily the most valuable item he owned, the player and his collection of several dozen records had been a gift, the acknowledgement of a life saved. Now Bosser started the player and positioned the needle. The long, slow swing of a saxophone bled out of the player and mingled with the constant shuffling of technobabble that made up Minor Prime's background noise, the shutters of systems turning on and off, of lifts sliding people up and down, the overhead announcements requesting this or that person to be somewhere else. Speaking of the red voice remnants, do you know where they are? The next head in line, Leo asked. If they are the only remaining threat, I don't know why we haven't eliminated them. It is much harder to find and swat one fly in a house than it is to shoot a man in the same space, Bosser said. After being torched off the face of Mars, the rebels had scattered, had vanished so well that Bosser had forgotten about them. Until now. Bosser sat on a crimson couch, a large one arranged in a half circle facing the monitor. In the center sat a glass table supported by faux pearl legs, both were gifts, like the record player. The couch, its fabric grown specifically for comfort in an earth laboratory, came after Bosser had rooted out and destroyed the reputation of a rival to Eden's top executive. The table for expunging a scion's record of bad decisions. That same scion would likely be one of those faces on the screen in a few years. Always better to have people in your debt than the other way around. Excuses aren't necessary. Just take care of them, said Cancer who then leaned a little closer to his camera. 
How are the preparations for the Guardian project proceeding? The highlight of the conversation. Bosser spent the next hours feeding them encouraging details, answering questions between pauses. The project was proceeding on schedule, was deploying. After that, the puppet masters would truly hold the strings. As the meeting hit its sixth hour, members started to drop off. Until only one, Virgo, remained on the screen. You sent my daughter into that mess on Neptune, the head said. Your daughter went of her own accord, Bosser replied, standing. The transmission time to Virgo was only minutes, a relatively snappy conversation for a change. I met her when the Wild Nines were here on the station. She hacked an android. An amazing woman. But if you ever send her into a situation like that again, Bosser, I won't forget it. It sounds like you don't trust your daughter to make her own decisions. The reason you are so useful, Bosser, is that you don't care who you have to sacrifice to achieve your ends. The rest of us prefer to keep those we love safe, even if that means restricting their independence. As a clever, self-interested man, I'm sure you can find a way to keep her out of things. As you say, Bosser nodded slowly for the camera. I will do whatever I can to keep your daughter alive. See that you do, Virgo said, then cut the communication. Bosser turned off the monitor, exhausted. No time for sleep yet, though. The board was set, the pieces were in motion, and it was Bosser's turn to play. This concludes the excerpt from One Shot, The Wild Nines Book 3, available now in ebook print and audio at your favorite retailer. For more adventures, check out blackkeybooks.com. Thanks for listening.